Okay, good morning, committee. We'll begin our agenda. Um, for those of you in the audience, uh, we have one item before we hit fluoride. It should be a relatively quick item. Um, on that note, we do have a speaker's list. Um, we'd like you to sign up if you wish to speak on fluoride so we can go from the list. Uh, you don't all have to rush at once. Okay, you can all rush at once. <laughs> So our first item of, of uh, business is the confirmation of the agenda. It's moved by Alderman Stevenson. Are you agreed? Yes. Opposed? That's carried. Next item of uh, business is confirmation of the minutes. Moved by Alderman McLeod. Any errors, omissions, deletions? Are you agreed? Yes. Opposed? That's carried. And items of new business. First item of new business is UNE 2011-01, the Glenmore Bears Plow Water Treatment Plan upgrades. Is there a request for a presentation? Nobody requires a presentation. Is there any questions for administration? Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to UNE 2011-01? Anybody from the public that wishes to speak to this? Seeing none, Alderman Collier-Eckhart. Thank you, good morning. I wonder if you could just speak to the uh, risk category uh, in your report. Uh, it says that uh, the management team was successful in managing risks related to the plant shutdowns and tie-in activities. Uh, any learnings that came out of that process uh, would be one question I have. Um, anyway, if you that's where usually we like to focus on, so if you could just uh, Cover off that. Yeah, Mr. Dold, who is the program manager and instrumental in the whole program, will speak to that. Thank you, sir. Yeah, during the course of the of the program, uh, it, uh, over seven years, we required uh, shutdowns at both plants, both at Bear's Paw and at Glenmore, to uh, tie in the new processes and the new piping. Uh, this this work was coordinated with operations, and we uh, we developed plans uh, to ensure that water service was not interrupted. Um, some of the learnings that that uh, came out of that was we we did learn that um, there are some challenges in uh, transmitting water from one plant to the other. There were occasions where uh, the city was being supplied by one plant only, and we performed six plant shutdowns and they uh, they all went very well and uh, we learned and got better at doing them mm. each time that uh, each time that we we had to do them excellent okay uh, keep going on the report do you have it in front of you there the risk um, yes okay so we indicated that um, uh, using a construction manager um, was a was a an advantage in uh, uh, going through these plant shutdowns, we had a partnership with our engineering consultant and the uh, and the construction manager, and because we were in a long-term partnership, the um, the the learnings um, and the team, uh, the core team, was uh, uh, continuous throughout the program, and it allowed the whole construction team to really understand how those plants worked because we're operating and 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 constructing uh, at the same time. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Chair, just declaring an interest. I just turned somebody off, who was it? Been moved, Do any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Next item of business is fluoride. UNE 2011 and 02. Uh, there is no presentation on this by administration for the reason being is it's not an administration recommendation. It's a recommendation made by council. And I'd like to tell the or ask the people in the audience, uh, because of the length of the day that we're anticipating, we do take a break from noon to 1.15 and we do take a break at 3.45, or 3.15 to 3.45. And if need be, we'll take a dinner break from 6 o'clock till 7.15. And I'm hoping that we don't get to the dinner break, but we may. 
you're allotted five minutes to speak. When you come forward, we would ask you to give your name. Um, one of the things I would like to mention, if, if somebody's already said what you plan to say, we don't need to hear it over and over again because it becomes like a form letter then. So if you've got something new to add, we appreciate the fact that everybody has the right to speak and we encourage you to speak if you have something new to say. Based on that, Madam Clerk, could you give, give me the first page of the speakers list so that I can start? Alderman Farrell. Maybe. So to open the uh, open this, I'll go to Alderman Farrell, seeing as how it's her notice of motion. Alderman Farrell, you can remain <coughs> seated. Thank you. Well, I, um, of course, brought the motion forward to council with um, with nine of my colleagues co-signing the motion. But um, it was expressed by some new members of council, particularly, um, for their desire to, um, to hear from the public on this matter. So although I have a, um, an opinion, I, um, on, for the courtesy of my, of my colleagues, I thought that it was important that they hear from the public. So my recommendation was to refer this to council to provide that opportunity. And that's what we're doing here today. There's two parts to the motion. It um, includes removal of fluoride, and I imagine that will be the topic of the majority of the presentations, but also um, the question of if we do remove fluoride from our drinking water, what would be the responsibility of the city in providing some access to uh, to dental care or fluoride treatments for people of low income. And, and so that would also be a topic of uh, presentation, I'm hoping. It would, what would that go for would look like? And I would, it, the motion's fairly specific that we ask for establishing a committee to look at that further. So uh, I guess we'll get started then. To members of committee, the administration here is to answer any questions for clarification. If you have no questions of clarification, I'm going to let them go. Um, and uh, they'll come back later on in the meeting. Mr. Pritchard will stay here. So if you, uh, before I do that though, I see Alderman Stevenson has a presentation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have uh, with us today um, a group from the Agape Language Center and uh, the teacher is Karen uh, Kajornin and that she also has Marie Nelson and Claire Gates with her. If we could get that group to stand, uh, all the people that are involved in that. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming and we hope you enjoy your time here at City Hall. Thank you. Welcome to City Hall. Uh, yes, Alderman Farrell. Thank you, and I'm not sure if it would be helpful for members of the public and for members of council to get um, an opinion from from the administration on the legalities of moving forward, what our choices would be. That's something that could certainly come after the, after the public have had the opportunity to speak. But I'm, I'm assuming that we'll want that information. I've met with them, but I, I'm not sure if um, all members of council understand the options in going forward. Are you directing that to Mr. Inlow? No, I, I'm just suggesting that if members of council want to do that, that will okay. be a likely outcome anyway. Alderman DeMong. Just some questions for clarification from administration with regards to costs involved. Oh, you don't need to stand, we're in committee. I'm new. <laughs> Mr. Saluski or? Is that on your light? Your microphone. Put, yeah, put your microphone on. How's that? There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Much better. Okay. Uh, currently, our operating costs are about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Of that, seven hundred and fifty thousand, uh, 
It's about um, in the range of 600 to 625 for the actual chemical itself. Um, the remainder of the cost are our operating costs and uh, administering the fluoride uh, at our two treatment plants. Uh, currently, we also have uh, an engineering consultant which is doing an assessment of our uh, facilities at both plants uh, to see where they are in their life cycle and what upgrade is necessary to be done to the equipment at the plants. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, assessment will be done uh, probably in the, the first quarter of this year. Okay. Um, I, I've been told that we are looking at needing to upgrade these facilities and we don't have an estimate as to what those costs may well be yet? We have a rough idea right now. Uh, we will be relying on our consultant to come back with a more accurate cost estimate. Uh, currently, we're estimating it could be in the order of three to four million dollars for the two plants. Is there a priority in having these done? Uh, like, what is the time frame that we may or may not need to do with this, with, with these upgrades? That's one of the recommendations that'll be coming through the consultant report as to the timing of uh, the upgrade, and that's based on his condition assessment of the existing facilities and what's required to be upgraded. Uh, these were installed a number of years ago and we're also looking at have there been any uh, you know, improvements in the installations at other treatment plants. Okay. Well, in the same way that you gave us a rough estimate of what the costs are expecting to be, is there any way you can give us a rough estimate as to a time frame required or where these, where these repairs may be required to be done? When, mm -hmm. rather? Not right at this time. Uh, I'd be estimating uh, we'd probably be uh, looking at something next year or um, in a time frame shortly thereafter, probably in the 2012 to 14 uh, business cycle. Thank you. No more questions. Alderman McLeod. I just following up on uh, Alderman Demong's questions. Are, um, are there reserve funds in place to cover those costs or where would the costs of the upgrade come from? The costs would be uh, covered through our current capital program. Um, so we do have sufficient funds in our cap capital program to cover that. So these are anticipated costs? I beg your pardon? These are, these are anticipated costs? These are anticipated costs right now. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, our consultant will be coming back with a, a more uh, accurate estimate and then uh, we would take a look at where it falls with the prior priorities of other capital initiatives uh, that we have. I guess my, my question was more in relation to, um, I'm not sure how long you've had the equipment, but we anticipated that this equipment would eventually need to be replaced or enhanced or something like that. So there's reserve funds for that and that's built in to the budgets and the capital costs. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Seeing none, you're free to step down. Thank you. You can stay if you want. <laughs> no, you can't ask questions from there. We'll call people up. First on my list is Dan Meads. on now it's on hello is that better hi there my name is Dan Meads I'm the director of vibrant communities Calgary vibrant communities Calgary is a nonprofit that works across sectors to try to try to address the root causes of poverty in our community I know absolutely nothing about fluoride I know absolutely nothing about what's good or bad for my teeth, and I know that if I stayed for the day, I would be more confused afterwards than I am now knowing nothing at the beginning. And so it's not my place to recommend whether fluoride is a good idea or a bad idea in drinking water from a medical point of view. I, I tend to trust doctors as much as I can, and if we could get them to agree, I'd, I'd advise that. What I do know, though, is about poverty in our city. It might be the only thing 
I know about. And it's because I spend my time talking to people that live in poverty in Calgary and asking them what they need, asking them what our city can do to make our communities stronger, to make their lives easier, to ease the pressures on their families. And you know the answer I've never heard? Gosh, thank goodness for that fluoride. The answer I've never heard is I'm so glad we have fluoride in our drinking water. And so if it is truly an issue of health, and we can get the doctors and the dentists in the room to suggest that fluoride is absolutely the best way to prevent or, or to, to maintain dental and oral health for people living in poverty, that would be great. I know that they can't say that, and the reason I know that is because even with fluoride in the water, they tell us all to go to the dentist. And so if fluoride was doing this preventative health work, I wouldn't need to go to the dentist. And I assure you, if there's one person in this room that would get out of going to the dentist, if he could, it's me. And so here's what I would like to say. If we want to care for the oral health of low-income Calgarians, let's do that. I mean, let's really do that. And myself and the other members of Vibrant Communities Calgary would be happy, eager to help do that. When we look at three quarters of a million dollars a year and three or four million dollars to upgrade facilities, I can tell you that there are some amazing uses for that money. We could change the nature of this city for people living in poverty with that amount of money. We could fundamentally improve people's lives with that amount of money. And I'm not certain that fluoride is doing that as it is today. And so the motion before us is an interesting one. The amendment, the second bit of that motion from Alderman Farrell and her colleagues is the bit I'd like to speak to. And that's that if we really do think that this, it's the will of this council to look after the oral health of people living in poverty, there are many, many ways to do that. And some of those ways don't involve flushing money or anything else down toilets. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I'm to summarize the aspect of what you said, it, it may be more directly beneficial if we actually had a program that specifically directed funds to those that need the fluoride in dental or hygiene through other methods rather than water? Sure, and, and thank you for the question, Alderman. It's, it's, a, it's a good one. Um, I'm not certain if fluoride is the best way to provide dental care to people living in poverty. I, I, would, I would be remiss to try to comment on the medical aspects of that question. What I do know is that if fluoride in drinking water was doing the job, none of us would need to go to the dentist. And that if we really want to care for people living in poverty, on the list of things that people living in poverty tell us are very, very, very important to them, fluoride's not on that list. And so, and so I think, I think if, if oral health for people living in poverty is something this council wants to do, let's do that. But let's do that in the highest and best use of our time and money. I'm not saying I know what that answer is. <clears throat> but I'd be happy to work through the process of exploring it with this council. Alderman Farrell. Thank you for being here today, Mr. Meath, and thank you for all your work on, uh, on poverty issues. That's often the reason that we, um, uh, the proponents of fluoride, uh, the reason behind their support of the substance is, is uh, it helps people in poverty situations, specifically children. And that was the purpose of bringing forward the amendment um, along with Mr. Keating, Alderman Keating. But um, what I, I, I don't propose to know what the best use of that fund would be. And who would sit at the table? I, I talk about establishing a committee. Who would be the best, I mean, it's, it's about dental health, it's about, it's about um, nutrition, hygiene, all those things. So how would you see us going forward if the motion passes today as I've pr presented it? Certainly, thank you for the question, Alderman. When we think about poverty, the first word that needs to come to our mind is complexity. 
If that's not the first word we think of when we think about how we address poverty in Calgary, we're going to get it wrong every time. And so how do I suggest that we think through people living in poverty and helping their lives? I think we do so by honoring the complexity of the situation and recognizing that health care is a major piece of that puzzle. But so is education, and so is transit, and so is income. And if we just spend our time thinking about one of them and not the rest of them, we're going to get it wrong every time because we're not thinking about the complexity. And so do I think there's room for this conversation in a broader municipal poverty reduction strategy or, or poverty plan? Absolutely. And I think the municipality has a responsibility to do that, as does the province, as does the country. And so I do think that there's a piece of this conversation that can start here. And I think this, this bit of money that may be saved by a decision that's made here is a wonderful bit of money to start that process of thinking through what it means to be poor in Calgary and what it means to help people living in poverty in Calgary. Okay, thank you. So you're willing to work with us on this? Oh my goodness, of course. Eager to, not just willing. Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you. Alderman McLeod. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it. Um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, part of what you're saying is that the money um, could be um, redirected and perhaps better spent on uh, dental care for low-income families. Is that correct? That's, that's my understanding, certainly. So how, do you have any sense or a vision of how, what that would look like? Are you thinking um, dental programs, um, what would, free dental clinics? Like how, how do you propose to? Certainly. Thank you for the question, Alderman. I'm, a, as you know, a fairly simple guy, and I try to make answers as simple as I can. And so when we think about uh, how we can provide dental care to people living in poverty, I would suggest that we bring them to the dentist. I mean, it's really that simple. And so we have free dental clinics in low-income neighborhoods in Calgary. We make sure that every client of the drop-in center and the Salvation Army Center of Hope and the Mustard Seed, every client of Calgary Housing has the opportunity to go to the dentist, but not just the dentist, to the doctor and to school and ideally to a place where they can work for a civilized living. And so when we think directly just about dental care, yes, the answer is free dental care to people living in poverty. No question. If there was a replacement for free dental care, we wouldn't have as many dentists in the room as we have because they'd all be out of business. And you think a million dollars a year or whatever the cost would cover? Well, I, I, I would be remiss to, to, to not recognize the complexity of that problem. I don't know how much a million dollars is going to cover in dental care. I have no idea. Uh, I do know that it would be a wonderful place to start. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Mead. Thank you all. Our next speaker is Gary Johnson. Yeah, good morning. Um, We'll start off with congratulations to the councillor, the mayor, and our new people who are running our city here. I ran as for the mayor's job last time, and I'm appreciated who we have in place. And I'd like to thank the audience for being here also, shows interest. And I'm going to start off with saying to you people, I did my own survey. I called four cities in this fine Canada of ours. Can I, can I interrupt you just for one second? Even though I've said your name, you have to for I can't hear you. Could you please state who you are? I'm, my name's Gary Johnson. Thank you. Sorry about that. And I phoned four cities, one out of the four. I didn't get all the cities here because it takes time. Th one out of the four, Vancouver, does not use fluoride because we have a different type of water, folks. I phoned the Dentist Association in Toronto. They told me they're in favor of fluoride because it prevents cavities and all the sugars and things our children are getting for our parents not guarding what they're eating, which you can never do all the time. I have grandchildren. I have two great-grandchildren. I'm proud of them. If they come to live in this, this city, I want everything that's accessible to give them good health, like you all do. My children are my pride, okay? And I, I feel Mrs. Farrell has stepped out of her bounds because she is not qualified to have a... I don't think she has a health certificate, has a dentist background, has nothing. Mr. Johnson, we don't take personal attacks. Okay, I'm very apologetic. 
But we have to ha deal with this issue and we have to deal with it soon. Okay? It's important to everybody. If it's got to go to a referendum, so be it. This is people's health we're dealing with. I've been on fluoride all my life. My teeth are exceptionally well. I'm 64 years old. The proof is in the pudding, they say. Now, if one rotten apple spoils the barrel, let's get the rotten apple out of there. But I'm in favor of fluoride for my generations to come because I believe it is a prevented way to save people's teeth, which we don't have teeth, we're all in trouble. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Our next speaker is, I believe it's Patricia Brownlee. Um, do you want any copies of this for filing? And sure. some of the things sure. would That'd help. Be great. Madam Clerk. Councilors, thank you. I'm all already on time here. <laughs> my name is Patricia Brownlee, and I wish to present to the committee my personal opinion on the issue of fluoridation of public drinking water. I'm originally from Ontario, and one of the communities of Brantford was the part of the original testing back in 1945. City Council in Toronto has approved fluoridation in 55. However, vigorous protests delayed the actual implementation for several years. A strong opponent to fluoridation was a radio and personal uh, personality named Gordon Sinclair. Maybe you're all too young to remember him. I doubt it. He objected to being forced to take medication he didn't want and offered him no benefit. Mr. Sinclair viewed this issue as one of government infringing on his basic rights as a citizen. I too take that position. The issue became entangled in years of legal wrangling until the city finally ordered that a plebiscite be held in 1962. The final result was a paper thin victory of fluoridation of 50% 50, 50 .1 in favour and 49.9% opposed. And here we are 50 years later with public opposition to this procedure in Calgary. Where fluoridation has been discontinued in communities from Canada, the former East Germany, Cuba and Finland, dental decay has not increased but actually decreased. I don't know how that happens, there's some reference in my material there. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from uh, 1999-201 has now acknowledged the findings of many leading dental research the mechanism of fluoride's benefits are mainly topical and systemic. Thus, we don't have to swallow fluoride to protect teeth. And the piece of history which really disturbs me is that despite being prescribed by doctors for over 50 years, US Food and Drug Administration has never approved any fluoride product designed for ingestion as safe or effective. Recently, as I have looked around on toothpaste uh, warnings, I have found <coughs> ones that state for children under six years, keep only, some are for only under 12, and uh, a definite warning, if more than used by brushing, which is a small pea-sized amount recommended for children, is bit swallowed to get medical help or contact a poison control center immediately. That kind of makes me wonder where we're at. I don't know whether that declaration gives them some uh, protection against legal liability. Fluoride is a cumulative poison. On average, only 50% of fluoride we ingest each day is excreted through our kidneys. The remainder accumulates in our bones, pineal gland, and other tissues. If the kidney is damaged, fluoride accumulation will increase, and with it, the likelihood of harm. Um, there was issues about uh, the fluorosis, which I first became aware of back in 19, early 60s. My children had it took them to dentists and doctors, there was no uh, answer other than it was a trauma and uh, the teeth would fall out anyway, so don't worry. I've since learned that there's much more to it than that. Uh, my current uh, issue that concerns me is about uh, skeletal fluorosis. It is a fluoride-induced bone and joint disease that Im impacts millions of people in India, China and Africa. So I would imagine it's here as well. It mimics the symptoms of arthritis. According to a review on fluoridation by Chemical and Engineering News, because some of the clinical symptoms mimic arthritis, the first two clinical phases of skeletal fluorosis, 
could be easily misdiagnosed. That's my concern. Uh, one in three Americans now have some form, form of arthritis. It, is, uh, it could be related to the growing, growing fluoride exposure, which is plausible. The causes of most forms of arthritis is unknown. Example is the osteoarthritis. In summation, I would like you to consider that as we live and learn and grow as an individual or a council or society, we can admit our mistakes. I accept that fluoride topical application is beneficial for teeth. However, there seems to be too many possible health side effects to continue putting the fluoridation in our drinking water. When we know more, we can make wise, informed decisions, and I'm sure you'll learn a lot today and perhaps tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. For You're not supposed to applaud. To, to the audience, we don't allow outbursts like that or we have to clear the room. So don't do it again. Uh, is there any questions? Alderman McLeod. Thank you. And thank you very much uh, for coming down today. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the um, time you took to inform me as well. Um, we had a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, just a, a quick cl uh, question. Um, the information that you presented today was based on the reading that you've done or? Um, many, you many years <laughs> of research. It's so much easier now with internet. But, but your background is, you're, like you're not a dentist or a no, health professional no, just, or something? No, uh, very like interested consumer of medical yeah. attention. Yeah, no, and I know you've been uh, working on this for quite some time. Thank you very much for coming down today. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Ms. Brownlee. Our next speaker, I believe it's John Chan. Good morning, Councillor. Uh, my name is John Chan. I am an environmental protection officer, although I'm here as a private citizen, and the brief I'm about to present here uh, is come from my own personal research, and it does not represent my official capacity at all. Uh, the first thing I'd like to point out is that fluoride is an industrial race product uh, from the aluminum industry. Uh, fluoride is also known to be one of the most active elements known to man, and it's as toxic as mercury. Um, in the last two um, debates in, uh, in the city of Calgary about fluoridations, uh, I have to point out, uh, without being too incharitable, the official of the Calgary Health have failed to keep up on the latest literature and research on the un un unacceptable health risks caused by fluoridations of a portable water, and also have disseminated misleading information during this fluoride debate, uh, the past fluoride debate. This lack of due diligence and subsequent um, disinformation constitute an official induced error and is flirting with medical malpractice. The latest study has clearly demonstrated that water fluoridation is unsafe for ingestion, that means by swallowing, while fluoride as dental treatment um, topically has some limited effectiveness uh, only when it's only applied to the teeth. So why are we swallowing it? Why are we ingesting it? Because the city is imposing mass medication on fluoride on a drinking water, where most people just simply cannot afford bottled water on the daily use. Fluoride, um, the proponent of fluoride, uh, including uh, Dr. Harold Hodge um, uh, and, and, and Dr. Cox, uh, those are the first uh, proponents and leading defendants for fluoride, claiming fluoridation is safe. Uh, those are the same people that was involved in injecting unwritten patient with plutonium when Dr. Hodge was involved with this uh, human radiation experiment. 
Um, these are also the same people that worked with um, the Mullen Institute that was hired by the aluminum industry. But the foil was found subsequently uh, to be profoundly toxic to human. Dr. Phyllis Molenik uh, uh, is a pharmacologist and a toxicologist by training. And in the 1980, Dr. Molenik was head of the toxicology department of the Foresight Dental Center, a world-renowned dental research institution affiliated with the Harvard Medical School. She was invited to start Foresight Technology Department because of her expertise and experience in neurotoxicology. Uh, she is presently a research associ associate in the psychiatry at the Children's Hospital, uh, Children's Hospital Medical Center in Boston. Uh, Dr. Molenlich, um, academic appointment, professional position held, teaching experience, award, honor, and many published scientific research article to her name are numerous, and those are all available for us to look at. Um, the test by Dr. Molenlich was asked to perform at the Foresight Dental Center, uh, was related to the neurotoxicity of fluoride. Um, and by doing the research on, on health impact on fluoride and human, um, when she completed her report, she was promptly fired when she refused to cancel her, uh, her publication of her report that found neurotoxicity of fluoride that can cause serious neurological damage among many other health issues. You, um, well, we, we, we will see that uh, on the other side, uh, they have claimed that fluoride is safe. Um, if we trace back to the source, fluoride is an industrial waste produced from the aluminum, aluminum industry. Another person conducted early scientific um, uh, uh, science uh, on, on fluoridation is uh, Gerald Cox of the Mellon Institute of Industrial Research. Mr. Chen? Yes. Uh, have you got a concluding statement? Your five minutes is up. All right, then let me skip to conclusion then, Mr. Jones. Um, basically, what we're talking at, what we're talking about here is mass medication without consent. And by any reason. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and as far as uh, the concern about low income children that have to have dental care uh, and, and therefore leave fluoridation, the argument is just not there. Uh, we have plenty of fluoride at many different sources. Uh, toothpaste itself have more than enough fluoride content as recommended by dentists. Uh, so this massive expenditure is, uh, is, is not only unnecessary, but it's uh, unsafe and it's extremely expensive. And if we want to solve the problem of um, low-income children, uh, the fraction of the cost, the fraction of what we spend on fluoridation could easily address those issues by just improving the nutrient uh, of the children. And by improving nutrient, the improvement of health, uh, dental health, are just as good as uh, using fluoride. So in conclusion, I strongly urge all the councillors to make judicious decision uh, when you come to vote on this motion to discontinue uh, fluoride, fluoridation of our portable water. So thank you. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Alderman McLeod. Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. If I understand you correctly, you have a background in, in science? Uh, I do. And, yeah, and you're saying that, um, that fluoride is unsafe to ingest. At what levels is, is it unsafe? There isn't a level that has been proven conclusively uh, by any science study to show that it's safe. What they have showed that even at the low dose that we are commonly apply throughout uh, municipality in North America, it showed that it can cause health issue. But there is no science out there to prove that low dosage at a prolonged exposure is safe. Okay, so um, are you suggesting that we should take the naturally occurring fluoride out of the water as well? Uh, I'm not aware that the uh, natural fluoride content in our water, 
uh, what I'm what I am saying is that the science in the past that uh, claimed and defended the fluoridation is safe is corporate science, is tobacco science, is uh, asbestos science. They are fraudulent science. They've been roundly proven. They are unsound by peer review. And all those information is available at the site. And I have sent the source of those information to all the arguments uh, by email. So you can easily use that as a reference. OK, I'm not sure I understand the answer to my question. Should we be taking naturally occurring fluoride out of the water? Um, I'm not in a position to say that. I'm not concerned about natural fluoride. Uh, but I am concerned about a chemical fluoride that is actually an industrial waste pilot that is currently introduced to our potable water. But I'm not here to argue about natural fluoride. And I don't believe the natural fluoride uh, content is actually of any concern. So what you're saying then is that the naturally occurring fluoride is different than the fluoride that's being added? No, I did not say that. I'm saying I have <laughs> no concern about it because I don't know about the natural uh, content level of fluoride. But I do know about the chemical fluoride that's currently being introduced in that water. I guess I'm still confused about that. Um, you made some very strong statements about um, that the public health officers are misleading the public with information and intentionally doing so. Can you clarify that, please? Well, they haven't used the latest uh, research, scientific research material that's available. There is an uh, ample body of scientific uh, information available, uh, including those that uh, can be sent by Dr. Jim Beck, who is in the audience here today. So it's your opinion that there's not a diversity of opinion on the research. It's that they're intentionally ignoring current research. Is that what you're saying? I said they have not kept up with the most recent scientific studies. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you. I believe our next speaker. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this will be the second time I warn you, you cannot applause in here. Sorry. Um, I, I'm going to apologize for some of you if I can pronounce your names or not, because your, your writing's about as bad as mine. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, would like to recognize and welcome someone that we have in our audience here today, and that is His Worship Peter Brown, the Mayor of Airdrie. Stand up, Peter. Welcome. Thank you. We're allowed to clap for that. <laughs> um, our next speaker, I believe, OK, well. I'm, I think it's Colleen Chan. Hi, I'm Colleen Cran. Oh, Sorry Cran, for the okay. chicken scratch. Um, this morning in the Calgary Herald, uh, Dr. Bryce Adamson is quoted as saying, childhood decay is only increasing since I've become a dentist. It hasn't decreased. So does that mean for the last 20 years that we've been spending millions of dollars adding fluoride to our drinking water, that it has had zero effect in reducing tooth decay in the city? Um, when I was a Saint, at SAIT doing the dental assisting program, they taught us absolutely nothing about fluoride except that too much causes dental fluorosis. So when I graduated, not only did I not know anything about fluoride, but I didn't even know what dental fluorosis was. In 1989, all that changed. I found out what was wrong with my son's new adult teeth. He had dental fluorosis, permanent and irreversible damage to his new adult teeth from too much fluoride. Teeth that cannot be repaired, only covered up to hide the damage. Poor children cannot afford cosmetic dentistry. I had to learn about fluoride the hard way. If I had known about the aspects of fluoride, this never would have happened to my son. I will never forgive the people who have been promoting the use of this chemical, the very people we rely on for information on good dental health, especially to our children. After my son was born, I immediately started him on Trabifluor, vitamin drops with fluoride. When he was old enough, I switched him over to fluoride supplements dispensed through the public health service. And for six years, I only missed giving him fluoride five days. 
This combined with swallowing fluoridated toothpaste, high levels of fluoride in his pablum and soya-based baby formula, and uh, the fluoride in other processed foods and beverages. He also drank more water in a day than my husband and myself combined, and this water naturally fluoridated at 0.3 parts per million. He never had a chance. When I pulled up the Canadian Dental Association website this week and discovered that they no longer endorse fluoride supplements for children before they get their permanent teeth, I was outraged. This position by the CDA is 25 years too late for my son and other children. Those promoting, promoting fluoride make absolutely no effort to determine how much fluoride we are all ingesting, especially children, because I think this would be impossible. Now the CDA is recommending the avail availability of fluorides from a variety of sources must be taken into account before embarking on a specific course of fluoride delivery. Again, 25 years too late for my son. How could such a toxic chemical like the fluoride they are putting in our drinking water have anything to do with re reducing tooth decay? This chemical is slowly accumulating in all of our bodies. If you want to learn more about fluoride in our drinking water, don't bother with the City of Calgary website. It provides misleading information and avoids all aspects that make water fluoridation controversial. Fluoride has invaded all aspects of our lives, from toothpaste to dental floss, teeth whitening, pro teeth whitening products, mouthwash, dental office products, aluminum Teflon cookware, fluoride supplements, pesticides sprayed on our food, general anesthetics, water fluoridation, pharmaceuticals, and many of our foods and beverages because they do not remove the fluoride before, before processing. And the list goes on. The international fight against fluoridation is growing. From New York City to Austin, Texas, Cornwall, Ontario, and many other communities in North America and the world. And why might that be? People are getting educated on this issue and realizing that water fluoridation is not what it appears to be. Education is the real enemy to the survival of water fluoridation. How many pro-fluoride council members have spent any time in the last three weeks reading up on fluoridation? If the answer is zero, how could you possibly make an informed political decision on this issue? There is absolutely nothing democratic about holding another plebiscite on water fluoridation when it gives uninformed people the right to vote on whether or not we should continue disposing of this toxic chemical into our drinking water. It is time to stop passing the buck on this issue and end water fluoridation now like many other communities have done. One day water fluoridation will be banned and I hope that all those involved in the promotion of the use of this chemical will be held liable for all the harm they have done to our environment, our health and our teeth. Thank you, Ms. Cran. Uh, Alderman DeMond, do you have questions? Thanks for coming out today. Um, you mentioned you're a dental assistant. I was, yes. Have, have you looked into what it's going to cost to have this fluorosis capped or covered? Uh, I think the damage done to my son's teeth is too severe. And anyways, cosmetic dentistry in regards to dental fluorosis, I believe is only like 10 years. So you can get veneers put on, but you will be replacing them eventually. And the cost is just huge. And it's not a solution. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you, if you'd known about this, you would have taken other me methods to avoid using the fluoridated water or at least, at the very least, stop using the drops. W is there some method that you would be specifically using to, ta to take the fluoride out of the water that he would have been drinking? Well, I've been buying bottled water since the water became fluoridated, but uh, my daughter was three years old when I found out about dental fluorosis, and from that day, she has not used one bit of fluoridated toothpaste. She has not had fluoride supplements, and I've made a real effort, and she does not have dental fluorosis. I grew up in Calgary drinking the naturally fluoridated water at 0.3 parts per million. I do not have dental fluorosis. And uh, once you start looking into the issue and you realize how widespread the fluoride has gotten into our lives, I just, I really have worked hard to try and avoid those. Okay, thank you very much. Alderman Farrell. Thank you for being here today, ma'am. Um, how much does it cost you to purchase bottled water? Uh, well, depending on how many people are at home that week, uh, I spend uh, $4 for a five-gallon um, bottle. $4 a week? $4 a week. Okay, thank you. Plus now, carrying in a heavy bottle. 
but I persevere. <laughs> now, I've, um, I've received probably over a thousand emails f about this issue, and uh, I would say the vast majority of them are people who want fluoride out of the water system. Many of them are from, uh, from other countries, and I don't include those in my statistics, but it's interesting this remains controversial around the world. But it, I've received quite a few emails from dental hygienists, and I'm wondering, were you a hygienist? I was an assistant. An assistant, okay. Um, there may be hygienist that comes forward. I'd like to know what they've learned about fluoride and what they learn about body systems, but... Um, My guess is they've learned nothing. Perhaps because, not, but because I... It, because if they had, they would, not have, they would not support the use of fluoride in our drinking water. I can't predetermine that, but, uh, but thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Our next speaker is David Keegan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Alderman, and fellow citizens. My name is David Keegan. I'm a family doctor here in the city of Calgary. I'm also an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Calgary, uh, though I'm here speaking as, a, as an individual, not on behalf of the faculty. Uh, I'm married and we have three kids, and uh, I'm here speaking in favor of fluoridation. Um, what my get take of the situation over the last month or so, whenever this first came out, was that there seems to be two issues. One, a lot of people, though not in the amendment, but a lot of people, uh, counselors and others talking to the media and in communication with myself and colleagues, have said that maybe there's not even a role for a city to be involved in putting fluoride in water in the first place. Maybe this is an Alberta Health Services role or somebody else's role. So number one is, is this a city role? And number two, is this a good thing on balance? So I'd like to address the first thing. I think Calgary is an absolutely great city. It's why we moved here. But I won't give you my impression of why Calgary is a great city. I'll quote Alderman Drew Farrell from her website, her vision of a great city of Calgary. To quote her first sentence, a great city is about advancing the health, quality of life, and dignity of its citizens while always keeping an eye on the bottom, of li on the bottom line. I could not agree more. One of the references she quotes in her amendment, in her proposal, is the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. And they say, quite clearly, water fluoridation, in their evidence, in their take and continual uh, exploration of the literature, water fluoridation is one of the 10 best advances in public health in the world. And this is one of the primary sources that she quotes. But I, and I agree with Drew Farrell. I agree with her completely about what she thinks a good, study, a good city is. But besides that, Several years ago, the city and its partners engaged in Imagine Calgary. This was a world-leading citizen involvement visioning exercise on the future of a great city. What's Calgary supposed to be looking like 100 years from now? And they set up targets. And under health and wellness, so A, the city and its colleagues and its collaborating groups felt that health and wellness was a key thing for a city to be involved in. It was not something that was for somebody else. It was for the city. And one of their key targets, T5, by 2036, the incidence of preventable disease, injury, and premature death are significantly reduced. Now, the city, this is not binding on the city, but the city has since embraced the Imagine Calgary plan and has actually created an office of sustainability to support reaching this vision. So I would argue clearly the city and the aldermen and the citizenry feel that a city government has a role in health, prom health promotion and disease prevention for its citizens, and I'm glad because that's one of the things that a city makes. Uh, that's one of the things that makes a city great, and that's one of their roles. Now, is water fluoridation a good thing? Well, I'm not an expert in public health and promotion, but I have, over the last several weeks, looked at a gazillion, or not a gazillion, about uh, eight to 10 systematic reviews, which are reviews that bring together, using formal methods, to look at what does all the research say, and bring it together, and bring together and come to, up with a conclusion. And very clearly, the answer is uh, that water fluoridation is better than every other method of fluoridation available to people. It's better than toothpaste alone. It's better than uh, fluoridation drops and so on. And the answer is why? It's because you can control it. It's a naturally occurring substance, fluoride, as Alderman Cloud has said. The Bow River water supply has 0.1 to 0.2 parts per million. The appropriate amount that most experts now agree is 0.7 parts per million. So we're talking about supplementing, not medicating the water, supplementing a natural element in the water to a level that gets some benefit for, for dental 
uh, disease prevention while not getting into the range of causing significant risk and injury. And this is not just me saying that, this is systematic reviews. This is the Australian government commissioning a major study and looking at all the research that was up to date and bringing it together with a final conclusion. What we know about water fluoridation is that it's cheap. It's far cheaper than having families trying to, uh, particularly those who are on the edge of economic circumstances, trying to figure out how in the world do I put fluoride in my child's water if the city's not going to do it. And as has been mentioned, water fluoridation is a great way of leveling social inequities. If you take water fluoridation out, in Britain it was shown that water, that oral health declined, but it most, is most hurt for people in lower socioeconomic groups. Now, don't take my word for any of this. You have in front of you city councillors, the public doesn't know this, the Faculty of Medicine has offered to devote its experts in public health to look at this issue on behalf of the city. You receive this, uh, this offer on Monday. I strongly encourage that coming out of today's meeting, you as a committee decide to defer this motion, to take the medical school up on its offer and have its experts, and I won't be on it because I'm clearly in favor of fluoridation, and have its experts look at the issue and come back to you with an answer of what the sum knowledge of the current research says today. Thank you very much for the ability to speak today. Thank you. Um, we have a number of questions for you. The first one is Alderman Keating. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I appreciate you coming because uh, part of the whole purpose of this is trying to get a, a true and medically and ethical stance on where we are. So um, do you have any knowledge, because uh, one of the issues is of whether they're drinking water or they're drinking other substances. Do you have any knowledge of whether or not fluoride is in the pops, the juices from concentrate where we add water and all of those sorts of things? Is it still there or is it altered or do you have any knowledge there? That's a great question. I don't know if it's in soft drinks. As a family doctor, I advise all my patients not to give their patients soft drinks, so I would not be looking upon that as a water, as a fluoride supplementation route anyways. However, I would assume that if there's fluoride in the water, it would depend on where soft drinks or other artificial drinks were made. Uh, so that if there was water in the supply where the Kool-Aid was made or the Gatorade was made, if they had fluoride in the water, I would assume that it would still be in that Gatorade, but I guess there's no way to know, again, we would not advise Gatorade or, I mean, Gatorade or, or soft drinks or whatever now and again are probably okay as a rare thing, but they're not, they shouldn't be used as a regular uh, source of hydration. Absolutely, and I agree with you 100% there. The issue is, is where are they getting the fluoride and how much and at what concentrate and what dose. Um, part of it is, if we're not getting it here, if we're not giving it in the water, the issue is, is they're getting it everywhere else, so maybe it's too much. But, uh, you know, we look at Slurpees and the big gulps and all of these things, and that's where I'm coming from. Where is the dose? Uh, do you have any knowledge of the, um, and, and we hear many comments about uh, medical effects. Uh, do you have any knowledge on whether or not there are certain cases medically where they should not be ingesting fluoride? Uh, specifically, I've heard kidney difficulties, anti-rejection drugs from transplants and all of that, and infants. Okay, so I'm not an expert in public policy or, uh, or water fluoridation over the last several weeks. I mean, oops, sorry, a family doctor is responsible for a whole lot of stuff, but I have been devoting a lot of time at this particular issue whenever I could. Uh, so in my reading of that, in the Australian study, which is the most comprehensive uh, review of water fluoridation, uh, I did not see that that was identified. Um, again, though, I would suggest that this committee pose that as one of the questions to an expert panel uh, that the medical school can create for you. So, just so I understand that, there are no medical cases where they should not ingest fluoride, to your knowledge? So, I didn't find them. There's been some recent questions over, should we be using fluoridated water to mix infant formula? Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that the, in general, we recommend that all babies are breastfed for the first six months of life exclusively and, and continue to breastfeed throughout their first year of life. Um, for those who, for whatever reason, uh, they, they have to have formula, there may be some question about should you use uh, fluoridated water for that. I don't think the answer or the jury's in yet on that. Again, I think that this is one of the many questions that have come up today that we don't have an answer for. I think that the council has an offer of expertise to answer some of these questions. And I think that that would be a helpful thing for you. Thank you. Um, to your knowledge uh, as, a, as a doctor, is there any other medical um, benefit to fluoride uh, other than teeth, oral health, or, or, is it, or is it strictly for teeth? It's a great question. There's uh, maybe some benefit in preventing fractures, uh, but not hip fractures later in life, which is too bad, because uh, hip fractures would be a great thing to prevent. But for other fractures later in life, there is 
some evidence that suggests it. Um, dental and oral health is the most important thing. The reason why is that if you prevent children from getting a lot of, uh, a lot of cavities in their mouth, you improve their lives and, and prevent them from having issues related to pain. You improve the impact on their family. They're not having to take time off to bring their child to multiple dental surgeries and so on. You improve their ability to speak and you improve their, their, their ability for, for good diction and an integration to society. So although it's just oral health, good oral health means other things can be good too. They're not disconnected. So uh, water fluoridation helps on average a population's children thrive by having not to be embarrassed about bad teeth, by uh, being able to have good diction in the future because they're not missing teeth and because of the, there's less impact on the family that poor oral health brings. Am I correct in assuming that there's fluoride in our bones which helps strengthen it? Yes, bone, and bones will remodel over time. So they don't become a sinkhole of toxic levels of fluoride that they, the bones turn over. And yes, there is fluoride in bones. But again, the greatest impact of water fluoridation is on teeth. That's my understanding. Uh, do you know if there's any difference between naturally uh, occurring fluoride and the artificial fluoride that we produce and put in the water at this time? I hadn't heard that concern until today, but fluoride is an element, and, uh, uh, and it's like any other element that if it's in a pure form, whether it's through industrial means or natural means, it's pure fluoride. So fluoride as an element should be no different with what's naturally occurring in leaches from rocks and so on as to what would be in a purified commercial form would be my understanding. I think though that it would behoove your, your committee to ask your city administration to clarify uh, the, the quality processes that go into choosing the source of fluoride that goes into the water. Uh, and I'm sure that there's very good evidence to back up that it's a pure form of fluoride. So then if it's a pure form of fluoride, it would be no different because fluoride is, fluoride is an element, it's a natural substance. Thank you. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What, uh, tell me what you believe is the, um, uh, or what, what do you have as proof that there's benefit to Calgarians uh, since we've uh, added the fluoride? What would you, what proof do you have of any benefit? So I don't have a study uh, to point to. There may be one done, but I, I'm not aware of a study that was done looking at Calgary uh, as pre-fluoride versus post-fluoride. There are many reasons why post-fluoride uh, things may have gotten worse, and it could be because there are so many more people from other countries where there may be varying degrees of, of oral health as a priority, and so they may not have been able to access great oral health care in their home country. They moved to Calgary, and they might have brought with them less good oral health as a starting point. So we don't, I don't think we know the answer as to did, has Calgary benefited. What we do know is that there are numbers of not just studies, but systematic reviews where all the research is put together using formal methods to look at what's the overall bottom line conclusion. And the bottom line conclusion is that even today, water fluoridation is a good thing, not a bad thing. I hear the sort of scenario that, that our previous speaker had, and that sounds very difficult, and she's not here at this moment, but it may have been at those times, there were too many sources of fluorides. Like anything, like any supplement, you can have too much of a good thing, but in the proper dose, the proper tiny dose, well controlled, the systematic reviews in the world today show that clearly still today, water fluoridation is a good thing, not a bad thing. <clears throat> well, there's been a, a definite decline, a significant decline in tooth decay in the last 30 years. The, the data shows that from uh, 1975 to 2005, over that third 30 year period, that uh, when they do the data and the study on 12 year olds and their uh, tooth decay, there's a huge decline. But when you look at the United States and Australia and New Zealand, the fluoridate, there's no more improvement there than there is in Belgium and Finland and Italy, which do not fluoridate. So tell me where the, how we know that the fluoridation is uh, playing a significant uh, play in this uh, decline, right? That's a great question. So when you set up a, a proper study, you have to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. What we eat in Canada, the US and Australia might be uh, more soft drinks on average, more candy bars on average than what maybe they eat in Italy. We don't know. So what you do when you set up a study like this is you compare uh, areas that have fluoridation versus not. And you ensure that they're matched so that you're comparing apples to apples and you change one thing only, one variable, and then you see the outcome. Now, my understanding of the literature is that when they're well done, controlled experiments where oh, that's the only key variable that changes, there are less 
cavities in, in the population, in all social uh, economic groups, but particularly the lower social economic groups. In the major, some of the major cities in the states today, there's really a dental crisis uh, in uh, uh, Detroit, uh, New York, and yet uh, they've been fluoridated for uh, 50 years. And I would suggest that if they pull out water fluoridation, it will get only worse because there are other issues that are causing it. So you're saying that it's diet, not fluoride, that uh, makes the difference there? It's a combination of things. You know, uh, so I'm in charge of brushing my kids' teeth at home. It's incredibly difficult, anybody who's been in charge of that. And so once it's become clear to me how difficult it is to brush your kids' teeth, I ask my patients' parents regularly, so who's in charge of brushing their teeth? And it's usually the child. And I think, wow, if I, as an adult, as a doctor, who kind of knows how really important it is to get those bristles up underneath the gingiva is, I have trouble, and the dental hygienist you know, says, that's a pretty good job you've been doing, uh, uh, you know, John's dad, but, uh, uh, but you could be doing a little bit better. So if I have trouble, then how can a six-year-old child be, giving, be doing great dental care to themselves? So that's what fluoridation gives you. It's an extra safety buffer, and as long as it's dialed down to the proper level so that it gives good value at a very low risk of, of, uh, of cosmetic uh, problems, it's a valuable second buffer because there's a whole lot of reasons. There's flossing, brushing, and the diet people consume, how frequently they brush, grazing of food. There's all sorts of things that contribute to poor oral health. You don't consider it medication? No, I consider this to be a supplement, sort of like iodine salt, sort of like uh, 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 iron in baby cereal, pablum, you know, one of the greatest Canadian inventions of all time. I take vitamin C every day, but I would not force it on everybody else in the city, so. I wouldn't either, because the research on vitamin C is a bit tricky. Uh, well, <laughs> we'll discuss that some other day, so thank you, thank you. Um, Alderman McLeod. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Um, one of the things that we've heard is there's alternative ways of getting fluoride. How do you address that? So my understanding of the of the systematic reviews are clearly they're, they're good, but they're not as good as water fluoridation. And so uh, the value of having it in the water is that it's in, it does get into your blood, and so you're continually bathing your teeth in topical fluoride by your saliva. That's how, why water fluoridation works, whereas brushing your teeth twice a day, while it's a good thing, is not enough because it's the one-time thing you spit out the fluoride because you don't want to ingest a big whomp of fluoride at once. And, uh, uh, but that's only a twice a day episodic approach. By having it in the water, through the system, you're constantly bathing, and that's why it's a better route, or it's superior above all these other systems. Thank you. Um, uh, you you've talked about the systematic um, study in Australia. Um, so I have two questions, I guess. One is when was that done? But the other is, um, can you explain to me what, like, is it, if I'm understanding you correctly, a systematic review is you take all the research out there and go through it all? Am I anywhere close to that? You go through it all and come up with an on balance, what's the risk and what's the benefit? Yes, yeah, so I'm not a systematic review expert. I have had my colleagues who are experts look at the ones that I could find and they said that they were well done. So a systematic review is you first establish criteria. What would a good study look like? So a study that just randomly reports a decline in dental health in Detroit would not be included because there's no comparison and so on. Yet a study in Britain that compares two towns side by side, one that has fluoridation, one that doesn't, similar demographics and industry otherwise, would be included. So you figure out which studies do you include, which do you not, and you set up other various, various sort of quality control measures to figure out what do you include, what don't you. And then you figure out what their conclusion was and you line them up and there's some statistics that goes with this to then figure out the power of the findings. And you know, there will always be a, a study here or a study there that's out of keeping. But when the vast majority line up in one sort of area, one side of the bar that says it's a good thing and there's only one or two that line up to say it's a bad thing, then the overall conclusion would be it's a good thing. But if the systematic review showed that, in fact, no, the, the impact was in a different skew, and you, again, you set up statistics to measure all these things, then the conclusion would be uh, different. And now there's not just been one systematic review, there's been many. The date of the Australian one was either 2006 or 2007. It was actually a review of the systematic reviews of the studies, so it was a mega review. Since then, somebody also did an update, uh, and uh, I forwarded that paper to Ms. Alterman's uh, office, uh, sort of picking up to make sure, had there been anything that intervening three and four years? 
And the answer is nothing's really changed. That the, the science still so far says, on average, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Okay, thank you. I, I guess it's good to know that you've got current, uh, current information. Um, I, I saw the letter about this panel suggestion that was made, and I have to admit that has a lot of appeal. Um, but I, I, my concern on it is, how, is um, how can we, as council members and the public, be confident that the panel is not biased? That's a great question, which is why I've already said to our dean, I don't want to be on this panel, because I've already come out publicly uh, and by my continued research in, in support of water fluoridation. How can you be sure it's, it's not biased? Well, at some point, at some point, you have to have faith in other people. Um, in the same way that we, as citizens, have faith in you as aldermen, that you will be trying to balance a great city against how to do it efficiently and with the right dollar figure. And at some point, there is a bit of a leap of faith. So I think what you do is you engage in discussion with uh, Dr. Feesby and say, here is what we would like to see. You know, how, how can we be sure? And I would actually suggest that maybe uh, yourself, Dr. Uh, Alderman McLeod, join the committee so that you can as, be an inside person to be sure that there is no evidence of bias. That when it'll, you know, so that you become then an expert, frankly, in systematic reviews on water fluoridation. It would be a good inside knowledge to have. But I think that you'd, you ask for whatever measures you need so that you as a group will feel confident that this will be an unbiased review. And you ask specific questions. So just like Alderman Keating said, you know, can, can you answer these three questions and then they'll get back to you with the answers. You know, at some point if the questions are 20, it makes it a longer review. Uh, but at the same time, I think the easiest way to prevent bias is have one of yourselves on the committee. I think it'd be a great way to you know, bring forward the vision of Imagine Calgary together, where organizations working in collaboration together to achieve common goals. Well, the University of Calgary is one of the partner groups in Imagination Calgary, in Imagine Calgary. Thank you. I, I, <laughs> the, the thought of sitting on that panel sort of makes my heart stop a little. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I uh, paid good enough attention to physics in high school to fully understand and appreciate what, uh, what's involved in this. Um, if I'm hearing you correctly, though, part of the, the um, benefit or the um, uh, how we structure the panel will be the terms of reference, how we, how, what questions we ask the panel would be just as important as who's on the panel. I, I would think because then that gives the panel a clear job to do. And there are political implications of water fluoridation, obviously. Mm -hmm. We've seen them in the, just the first six speakers here today. The panel would not be weighing in on that. The panel would be answering specific clinical questions, what are, or clinical and scientific questions. What is the answer to this question that will help you as aldermen make the decisions you have to do every day? I would, I would think this would be a handy resource to have rather than mm -hmm. having me come up and say it's good and having somebody else who's a professor uh, say it's bad and so on. I think it would be a very handy thing. Mm. And I, I guess that's part of the appeal is because at some point you do have to defer to those that are truly experts and paid better attention to physics in high school. Uh, um, okay, I don't think I have any more questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Farrell. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. I know we disagree on this topic, although I think we probably agree on on uh, other things. And one of them is uh, the role of health, although not health care, but health as for Calgarians. And so that's the subject of part two of the motion. Um, that was a controversial um, part of the motion because m many of my colleagues believe it's not the city's responsibility to get involved in health care. I think if we're going to, um, if the motion is successful, the first part of the motion, then we have an obligation to look at the second part. And that is the subject of my first question, is do you think if we are successful removing fluoride from the, the drinking water in its entirety, we have an obligation to look at our other choices? Well, I think people should be held accountable. I think city decision makers should be held accountable. And if there's, a, an, if there's an incredibly well documented way to promote oral health, particularly in people in lowest socioeconomic classes, and you as a group of uh, city aldermen and mayor, as a group decide to abandon that, 
then you've caused a problem, I would suggest. And then it is your responsibility to think how can you best advocate to ensure that those who will be most harmed by that decision, and there will be, can be best protected. Um, I, I, for the gentleman, Mr. Mead, who talked earlier, uh, talked about diverting the money for fluoridation towards some sort of dental care program. And while that may sound attractive, I'm quite concerned about how far three quarters of a million dollar will stretch across a city this big. Uh, and it will likely be exhausted in no time with very almost impossible to measure benefits uh, derived. So it would be a far more expensive program. And that's what's great. I mean, as you say, Ms. Farrell, you're keeping an eye on the bottom line. Water fluoridation is your best, cheapest way to protect the oral health of Calgarians, period. And, and, yeah. and, and so if you do something else, it's going to be incredibly expensive. And I don't know if the city wants to take on that burden, but boy, you as aldermen will take on that accountability for having made this decision that affects the oral health of so many people. I, I would suggest that some may think by fluoridating water, we're dealing with the poverty issue, period. And I think there's evidence in, in many, many cities that have high rates of poverty, their <clears throat> tooth decay rates are, are going up. And so it's not a panacea. No, it's not. Um, and, and nor should we see it as being done. I think that's my point. Now, one of the criticism, and you had, meant, you had mentioned controlling the dose, and certainly one of the criticisms I'm hearing from, from constituents is it, it, we can't control the dose. People drink varying amounts of water. Some people drink very little, so they, if fluoride's benefit, they're not consuming tap water. Um, and others drink copious amounts of tap water, so the dose isn't being controlled. And that's one of the criticisms. So I would suggest that would be a great question to ask an expert panel. How big an impact does this variability of fluoride in the city okay. uh, have? So if, um, if fluoride is removed from the water, and we haven't been comparing, um, there were no studies in Calgary on the effects or benefits of fluoride specific to this city, which I would suggest is an ethical issue personally. Um, if we do remove it, then should we be obligated to review the impacts of removal on the health of the population? Waterloo just removed fluoride from their water. Um, Ontario fluoridates widely, but Quebec does not, and yet the, uh, the difference between health, dental health is statistically insignificant. So um, would we be then obligated to study the impacts of our decision? So the reasons for a difference in dental health between Quebec and Ontario could be for a variety of reasons, not just water fluoridation. And I would caution that, please, as aldermen, you don't oh. make a decision based upon rapid, easy uh, comparisons and that which you don't oh, really know not. why the differences may be. No, but I think, I think w what we're hearing today and what we'll continue to hear all day is a diversity of opinion, mm -hmm. 60 years into it and we're talking about something as fundamental as our drinking water mm -hmm. and and so I would suggest that the jury remains it's the jury's still out that concerns me when it's my task as a as a decision maker when we're talking about as something as fundamental as drinking water I would but, disagree um, the jury worldwide is in Madam Farrell there has not been a single systematic review that I could find that said water fluoridation was a bad thing. And my question is then evaluation. Would it be our responsibility to look at evaluating the impacts of our decision from today or if, if we choose to remove fluoride, should we then study it and look at the impacts of our decision in the future? I think it would make sense. I think it would have to be a well-designed study to do that, but I think that would make sense. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the last time we went to an expert panel, um, the expert panel recommended lowering the amount in the drinking water. Now that wasn't made, that recommendation wasn't made by Health Canada and it wasn't made by, by Alberta Health Services, although Alberta Health Services participated in the panel. Um, but it was a recommendation <coughs> to, to uh, review it by the city of Calgary. That lower dose um, then has now become many, many years later the new standard, which is very interesting. So prior to that, um, people were consuming too much fluoride. What do we say to those people 
um, who we've, we assured at that time that everything was great. And, and then since then lowered the acceptable dose. Um, it's, it's science changes and we should always be reviewing science. I wouldn't say the science changed so much as there's like a pendulum and it eventually swings back to the right middle spot. And it may be that in the past, it has, when fluoride first came out, it swung too far. And there were actually a lot of studies that showed it was too supplemented. But and when fluoride first came out, it was 50 years of fluoride overdosing on fluoride, 50 years. That's one of the reasons I'm so concerned, is it took us that long to get to that point in our, in our knowledge of science. Um, and, and so when does the next big leap come with our knowledge? And it, it, it's concerning me. So I, I imagine- The answer to that is that it's only in the recent maybe 40, 50 years that the science of how to do these studies has been figured out. So, so yes, I think, yes, you evaluate, and, and, and maybe the number should be lower than 0.7. Maybe it should be 0.6. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but that's why I think it makes sense. Do what you did before. You had good success. It sounds like Calgary did this before and had a very good success with that, and in fact, was a trailblazer. So do it again. Mm -hmm. And it was a trailblazer because of city council. It wasn't because of Alberta Health Services, I have to say, okay. or Health Canada. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Collier. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my question that I wanted to uh, drill down a little deeper on with you was uh, uh, your comment about people will be harmed. Can you can you drill down on that and be very specific about which people, which age group, and and what the harm would be? Okay. My understanding is that water fluoridation benefits people by preventing uh, a certain amount of cavities or caries over time. So the harm? So the harm is that if you stop doing that, you won't get as good prevention. So what will happen, I, I'm not able, I'm not a, an epidemiologist who can say, based upon 100,000 people, what the harm will be, but by lowering the water fluoridation or removing it to just the natural levels, uh, my understanding is that there would be less cavities prevented, therefore there would be more cavities prevented. With the whole population? And my understanding is that it affects the entire population. There was a, a study in Britain uh, which looked at areas on the west coast of Britain. Uh, Dr. Jim Dickinson uh, has read this paper in detail and he's a, he's a bit of an expert on systematic reviews and these sorts of things. Uh, and so I can put you in touch with him on the details of this. But uh, when they withdrew water fluoridation in these parts of Britain and studied it carefully, just like Alderman Farrell is suggesting, then they found that in all age categories and in all socioeconomic classes, there were more cavities and it affected people at the lower end of socioeconomic classes more. Okay. That's my understanding. What other harm? Sorry? What other harm? What other harm of removing water fluoridation? Yeah. Um, then, as I said to, I think, uh, Alderman Stevenson or Keating, uh, there's possibly a benefit for fluoridation for fracture risk, so maybe taking fluoridation out would remove that prevention of fractures later in life. So, that, so the harm is the removal of good prevention. That's the harm. So if you take water fluoride out, you lose all the benefits that fluoride brings. That's the bottom line. So whatever fluoride is good for, if you remove it, you lose all that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Pincott. Thank you. Just to uh, declare an interest. Thank you. Alderman Demong, question? You mentioned the Australia study. I, I've glanced at a few, quite a few of these myself, and uh, th there are studies from both sides of the spectrum saying that it's good and it's bad. What makes you think that a study done by the Faculty of Medicine in Calgary over a six, eight week period is going to give us a definitive answer one way or the other when studies over the last 50 years seems to still, although contrary to what you're suggesting, leaves some doubt in the minds of approximately 50% of the population. Okay, so what you would be asking them to do is not to um, uh, do a massive new, you know, commission a new research study that would take three years. You'd be asking them to review the available systematic reviews that are out there, that by agreed upon standards meet certain levels of quality of having been conducted, and then looking at those conclusions and bringing them together and reporting back. And it, it may be, and I could have just simply missed some systematic reviews that showed that uh, there's 
that water fluoridation is not a good thing. I did find one that had uh, some slight caution, but it wasn't able to declare clearly that it was a bad thing. And so that's what you're asking them to do, is to, to look at what's available out there. So not to create new studies, and not necessarily even to look at individual studies, but to look at uh, people who, whose lives are, uh, are to review what research is out there, to put them together and to figure out the bottom line answer, to look at those different studies and put them together. And I guess that's the problem. You'll never find a full agreement on this. We know that. At some point, you have to make a decision, but I would suggest it be more helpful if you can get greater clarity on what the evidence means. Would probably help you, Alderman uh, Dijong, uh, be able to make your decision better. Because it sounds like you are yourself struggling with this. Mm -hmm. I myself, when I first saw, heard about this, I wasn't sure, and that's why I went in. But I'm trained in how to go to PubMed, how to search and put in the search terms correctly and pull out the studies that are quality studies. Mm -hmm. Uh, would the Faculty of Medicine be willing to accept legal liability as to uh, if, w when they come back with their results? I think, so I'm not an agent here on behalf of the faculty. I think the Faculty of Medicine would, if, if you ask somebody to do their job properly and they, they can demonstrate that they've done their job properly, they'll answer your question. It's up to you as aldermen, this is why you're elected, is to then take good information and figure out what to do with it. And so, uh, but I'm not here as an agent of the faculty. I guess that would be a specific question you'd have to ask to the dean. But I think that if we're trying to look at this as a collaborative city uh, where we use our partner organizations together, let's ask them the questions that they can answer and they'll get back to you. From, from your point of reference as, as, as an MD, you've heard many people to speak today with regards to fluorosis of the teeth. Is, do you consider that a, a, a con concern whatsoever? So that's a great question. How big is the problem of fluorosis? Um, so one of my colleagues, Dr. Jim Dickinson, has done quite a bit of work delving into the literature on it. There's actually, uh, my understanding is that there's a lot of things that, a lot of dental abnormalities are labeled as, as fluorosis because there's similar appearance, though that when a dentist looks at it properly says, actually, you know, this is a natural change that has nothing to do with fluoride. Apparently, I'm not an expert, that if you, if, if you are a trained expert, you can look at it and tell the difference between likely fluoride-induced changes versus not. In terms of how big a burden of illness it is, well, we've heard from one, from one person today who clearly sh says that it sounds like it was a big burden of illness for them in some fashion. Uh, my understanding is that that's why you figure out the right amount of parts per million for the fluoride, to get it to the sweet spot of the curve, as we would say, mm -hmm. so that it gives you reasonable benefit with a very low chance of, of uh, bad fluorosis. I, I understand what you're saying with that. My, my concern comes up with, again, the, the dosage uh, requirements. You say there's a specific dosage that is a sweet spot, as you say, and yet I, I, I struggle to, to come up with the difference between the one person that drinks maybe a glass of water a day and the athlete that's drinking 20 or 30 glasses a day. How can you determine that that is the right dosage for that person versus that person when there is no specific saying you should only drink this much water? So it's a great question. The this, this number you pick is not the number that goes in people's mouths. It's a number in the water supply of a city that has been demonstrated to show the, that overall the population is doing well with great benefit and very low harm. I fully understand Which what you're saying. You, you, you decide what the, we, we're, we're to decide the actual quantity in the system, but you specifically say there's a dosage to avoid fluorosis and, and can still uh, assist in, the, in, in decay uh, situations. How do you determine that the person that is actually receiving this medication, nutrient, whatever you will, is getting that right dosage? Can you, so, in any way, shape, or form, control so you, that? So you can't, but what you can control, is, as I'll return to my previous statement, is that if, if we know that 1.5 parts per million is too much, mm -hmm. and they know that because then they look at the whole population and they see, oh, there's, there's way too much fluorosis going on for what people are comfortable with, for whatever value fluoride brings. And so then you dial it down to the number, and my understanding is 0.7 is the, the right number for the city to ensure it gets in the water, and then if people have varying ingestions, at the end of the day, it kind of evens out for the population. There will always, there might be some people who still get. So you're suggesting that some will get not enough and some will get far too much. Yes, because that's the problem but, with. And, and you're okay as a doctor to say, as long as the overall average is okay for the people, I don't mind that some people get too much and some people get too little. Well, it's, when you're talking about population health, you have to make large 
you no, know, absolutely. big sweeping decisions. It's like immunizations. We know that not everybody who gets I, it. I'm just asking you yeah. as, a gener as, as a doctor to say you're okay with the fact that by generally saying this, I'm okay that some are getting too little and some are getting too much, but because the overall people are getting the average amount, I'm okay with that? What I'm saying is that you, you supplement at the right level so that the vast majority of people are getting uh, into good ranges and there's a small number at most who get into uh, a bit more and might end up with cosmetic defects. So we're not saying it's like it's even. No, no, you err on the side of, of, uh, of lower amounts because people have said, we don't want too much fluorosis in our community. Okay. So that's what you have to do. Okay, well, I can certainly understand that. Um... It does concern me that I'm seeing studies where up to 30, even 40 percent of the of, of United States cities, uh, and and the and doctors, dent dentists, with regards to them, are saying that there's that much fluorosis happening to people in the cities where it's flor where they have a fluoridated water supply. At what point do we say, "Ooh, we've gotten too much in. We now have 20, 30 percent fluorosis in the city. We have to dial it down." My understanding is, once you've got fluorosis, you cannot treat it. It, once it's done, it's it's done. You can't go back and say, well, we'll fix it now. So your question is, at what point do you dial it down? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm concerned that right now there are studies saying that it's at, at, at rates of high as high as 30 to 40 percent in some U.S. cities. Now they have decided we've got to dial it down. What do we do in 15 years from now when we realize that 0.7 was too much? The entire uh, athletics is portion of our sub, sub, uh, subsection of our population are coming down with fluorosis. Let's dial it down again. It's too late for them now. At what point do we say we've done the right thing? Okay, that's a great question. It sounds like though you're pro-fluoridation. You're just figuring out what level to I'm, do that. I'm neither pro or anti. Okay. I am so, simply sitting, sitting here. I want to look at the information. So it's the same as the flip side is that if you remove it altogether, when people have cavities and have dental surgery and so on, uh, then you've missed the boat on them too. Um, so I think that that's one of the questions that the city should, ha should ask, is that is today 0.7 the right number? Maybe 0.6 is the right number. And I think that that's, so you ask people who are water fluoridation experts and research methodology experts, you ask them, what is today's right number? It sounds like Calgary's a trailblazer when it picked 0.7 some time ago. Maybe now the time is 0.6 or 0.5. What we know is the Bow River has only 0.1 to 0.2, which is not sufficient to provide great protection from dental cavities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Kagan. Our next speaker is Richard Musto. Good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Richard Musto. I'm uh, trained as a physician in family medicine and in the specialty of community medicine, and I serve as the lead medical officer of health for Calgary Zone of Alberta Health Services. I thank you for the opportunity that you have afforded our community to express our views on fluoridation. I hope that all of us will hear and learn something new today and that we'll each leave with a more full understanding of the issues and their meaning to Calgarians. I will focus my few minutes on the related issues of risk and risk perception, and then we'll make some suggestions that are intended to help us move forward towards a reasonable and defensible resolution. I've been interested in uh, fluoridation for many years, both as a safe and highly cost-efficient public health measure that brings a meaningful oral health benefit to all who drink the water, and as a social phenomenon. Much of the controversy that continues to surround the issue in some communities can be explained by variations in the way each of us individually and collectively make decisions about what we perceive as risks and what level of risks we are prepared to accept to achieve certain benefits. We all make decisions about risk every day, whether consciously or subconsciously, and those decisions vary and evolve depending on our circumstances and life stage. Factors that usually are included in this risk assessment include the size and meaning of the potential harm and the extent to which we have control over our exposure to that risk. This notion of control is of particular significance in the discussion of fluoridation. We all trust that the city's waterworks department has followed all the correct procedures to clean and disinfect the water so that it is safe to drink right out of the tap. Few challenge whether it is best to chlorinate the water as an endpoint disinfection measure rather than other options such as ozonation. Why is it that some continue to question the adjustment of the level of fluoride, a natural constituent? I think it is because we in the public service have not always been effective in making clear what the decision-making processes are. 
what checks are in place to ensure that potentially harmful decisions are avoided, and what rigor is followed to ensure decisions are taken on the best basis of the best information and evidence available. For example, when asked publicly about the claims of harm made about fluoridation, I have generally responded that isolated findings are of interest, but that I place greater reliance upon rigorous systematic scientific reviews, such as has just been discussed by our previous presenter, which have consistently found that there is good evidence for the effectiveness of fluoridation to, review, uh, to reduce dental caries and insufficient evidence for harms other than fluorosis. But I've never taken pains to explain how systematic reviews are conducted, how they deliberately exclude all but the higher quality studies showing benefit, yet include all studies suggesting harm in order to ensure that above all else, we avoid, avoid harming our patients or in public health terms, our communities. This is a responsibility that, that I have as a medical officer of health and, and, and a public servant that I take seriously to ensure that all our programs and our, and our interventions are continually updated and based on the most recent and current evidence. So this leads me to some suggestions about how we might move forward to a responsible solution or resolution of whether to continue fluoridation in Calgary or not. And we've already heard now this notion that perhaps um, uh, uh, the University of Calgary or other resources might be um, available or asked to answer some questions. We did this in, uh, in 1998, and that panel, as you know, did uh, decide that there was no evidence available to warrant discontinuation of fluoridation, but did recommend reducing the target level to the 0.7, based, that it was, uh, based on evidence that it was the best trade-off between the benefit of a reduction in caries and the risk of fluorosis. So if we were to ask the university or other bodies to assist us with na uh, uh, now, I think that's probably a good idea. But we do need to be clear on what the questions we have, uh, we'd like to have answered. And it might be good to seek public input in defining those questions as well. The exact mechanisms for responding should be tailored to the questions. So another expert panel might be useful for a review of the risks and benefits. While a different group might be asked to examine the economics of alternate means of improving oral health and so on. It might even be worthwhile to clarify whether citizens would like to have direct input on the final decision through a plebiscite or whether they will be comfortable with the councillors making the decision on their behalf. Once the answers to these questions have been communicated to the citizens of Calgary and I might add uh, other communities such as Airdrie that are on the Calgary water supply, then we should all be able to be confident that a thoughtful and just decision has been made. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Keating, questions? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm, I'm great that you're here because I'm looking for those specific medically scientific information to be able to make the right decision. And that's the unfortunate part is eventually we have to make a decision. So we'll go down that line. We have heard the uh, talk about I iodized salt. And again, I'm not sure, but I believe that's actual iodine. Is that correct? Iodine, iodide? Yeah. yeah. Could you tell me what's in there? I don't know what exactly how it's added. It's iodide is, is what I understand, but I'm, I haven't uh, thought to look at that prior to coming Well, in. it's been used as a comparison many times. Well, should we take it out of salt? And I'm not sure what the purpose is, to tell you the truth. I'm not even sure what the chemical is, but we know it's there and it's been used many times in this debate. Well, if we take fluoride out, should we take, uh, you know, the iodine out of salt? So, uh, so the Mike, go ahead. The iodine, uh, again, is uh, iodide is a natural element in our... In our uh, environment and the issue uh, why it was introduced was some parts of Ontario and Quebec had a higher incidence of goiter and, uh, related to the thyroid and was related to inadequate amounts of iodine so the solution was put it in the salt so that we all have uh, the, the appropriate amount. So this is actual an additive they put in salt it's not for treatment or to do any specifics? It's an additive to the salt a supplement to uh, what we would get naturally through other other sources in our environment. Okay. So that's a parallel to, to fluoride. To, to the fluoride. So I, uh, and I fact, guess my question me. follows down that line then, okay. is if you have too much iodide, is it a problem? Um, again, I'm, you know, I, I, it's not something I've looked at. No, uh, but so, but uh, that, that's not, I mean, I'm not aware that, that yeah. there have been uh, yeah. concerns raised about harms by the iodide, iodized salt. It's also available in an uniodized form. Okay. And I guess my point is here, and one of the reasons why I ask is because that decision has to come down. Mm -hmm. Salt, is, in my view, is not a basic unit 
of human consumption where water is. We can't get along without the water, and if we fluoridize it, we're, we have to take the fluoride without question. Salt, on the other hand, we hear that we're not supposed to use as much, uh, so I mean that's being reduced. But um, and, and I guess that's my understanding, or my where do we go from this? Because it is a basic. You can't. Uh, so I guess our, I'll just leave it at that. It, it is a basic unit. Water is, and therefore salt isn't. So the, using that comparison, in my view, isn't exactly correct because. Um, you can't, you can't help but not take water, but you can certainly have a choice of salt, and you can probably get undiagnosed salt. As, as, uh, I'm guessing, and all of that sort of stuff. But presently, you can't get unfluoridated water unless you pay for it, uh, which would pay for salt anyway. So, so I, yeah. you know, I would make the distinction that I have not, I didn't introduce the notion of iodized no. salt in this. And but I in have fact, in Europe, um, uh, that is one of the ways that fluoride is delivered. Uh, they, they, instead of putting it in the water, they put it in the salt, they put it in milk. There are other ways to deliver uh, the benefit of fluoride. Yeah. And, and, and I guess, I mean, that's a great point. There are other ways of doing it, and then people would, uh, uh, would make that choice to do it rather than putting it in our basic unit. But, yeah, and but I we agree can go with down you that route. entirely yeah. that, that the fact that it's in water, which I believe is a, a, a human right, a basic human right, yeah. the access to good, healthy, clean water, makes it that much more important that we do the right thing. Yeah. And, and that just adds the burden to all of us who are involved with making that decision. And my understanding of uh, the science uh, uh, confirms, allows me to reaffirm my support for fluoridation as uh, an effective and safe way of getting that benefit to all the people that drink the water. Perfect, thank you. The, the other thing we hear often is it's, um, and I've heard this uh, from individuals that have talked to me that um, outside of what I've heard here today is my grandparents uh, or my grandchildren um, need it in the water because they're, they're not getting their teeth brushed because they won't, won't get it done. Uh, now, so that comes into parenting and, and where we go from there and all, which is another whole thing. So again, uh, it comes back to the idea of uh, putting it in because some do not do it. Uh, and we can't get into the idea of parenting everyone within the city. But we have to look at it in, in some aspect. Yeah. Um, I do have a question for you because it, it, it uh, was raised today. And I guess my statement is um, it came forward that infants should not have uh, fluoride, fluoride in, in basically almost any sort of form at this point and you recommend that you uh, breastfeed for six months and those but there are other medical cases and, and I'm sure you can comment on this where the um, child is allergic to milk because I happen to have a daughter who had to go on formula because she was allergic to milk and she couldn't do it um, so then it, it should the city then all start providing bottled water to every household where they have to use formula because the parents might not use bottled water to make that formula. So there's um, a lot of confusion about uh, okay. the statements that have made about uh, the use of fluoridated water in uh, infant formula. In fact, what the, uh, the bodies, including uh, Health Canada and uh, Alberta Health Services and the CDC Atlanta and the American Dental Association, say is that it is safe to use water that's fluoridated at the, at the 0.7 parts per million as our water is in the preparation of uh, infant formula. So I would not uh, in any way think that, that the city should be providing for an alternative because uh, they don't need to. Okay, so uh, to follow that up then because I did ask the questions and I've heard statements um, because of kidney difficulties or transplant or anti-rejection uh, drugs and a number of these. Uh, is any of that along the same lines as what you're saying now? Uh, again, um, I know of no reason why a physician would ad uh, advise their uh, patient to avoid fluoridated water. And the kidney uh, disease in particular, for persons who are uh, in renal failure and are on dialysis, the, the fluid that's used in the dialysis is uh, filtered of, of more than the fluoride. Chlorine is out and so on as well. So that's, that's a different issue. For someone who uh, is not on, on um, dialysis, there's no harm in drinking our fluoridated water. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, statistics or studies out there that talk about uh, teeth decay with the rest of the world? And, and, and I raise this because North America, or however, is unfortunately, we have a very high sugar content. And many other 
areas of the world do not have that sugar content that we have, and therefore, in comparison, how does that, or are, are there any studies or, or things that talk about tooth decay outside of the sugar content? Um, I think you're asking what are the international studies around tooth decay? Okay. Um, it's, it's a very common problem all around the world, um, and there's different ways that, um, <coughs> different, many different things that contribute to that, and also many things that contribute to avoidance of tooth decay, and fluoridation, uh, as Alderman Farrell said, is not a panacea. It's one of the things that we do to in order to uh, uh, ensure that we have optimal oral health. All right. Uh, I, my last question, and again, it's a, it's a more of opinion than a question, and, and because I, I need to understand where we're going from this. Uh, um, we all know that in many cases, science will say that fluoride is good, and therefore, let's do it without question. We know it's good for your teeth. Um, the issue is, is when we come back to it, is many times science will not state um, that it is harmful without clear, clear studies or definition that this is harmful even though we don't know whether it's there or not. Well, yeah, I, would, I, I wouldn't agree with you on that, and that's the point I was trying to make with uh, the description, brief description of the way a, a systematic re review is conducted. Because we are, because it is such a responsibility that we don't harm, that's one of the things we learn in medical school, first do no harm. Um, it's part of the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, so that's very important to us. So in fact, the systematic reviews err on the side of identifying a risk, a harm. And they downplay by requiring a higher quality of study to, uh, to review or that propose a benefit. Okay? So even with that, uh, this is systematic, pardon me, the systematic reviews that have been done continue to state that there's good evidence of a benefit, no good evidence of meaningful harm other than fluorosis. And I mean, that's, that's the difficulty that we all face. It's, it's essentially impossible to prove the negative. So it's, it's easy to, to say maybe it causes this, maybe it does that, and it's, it's impossible to prove otherwise. So we have to uh, manage that perception, you know, and that's why I, I focused on that. And I think the way to do that, one of the ways to do that, is to try to make it as clear as possible that we've got as robust, robust a process as possible around how we make our decisions and how we determine what that level of risk is. And we need to have the input of our community because in some respects, risk tolerance is an expression of a community norm. So if we are able to complete this process, whether or not you decide to engage the university or others to help with uh, answering specific questions that you have, and we work at getting that in information out to the public, and they still say, you know, on balance, that's not for us, okay, I accept that as the will of, of the community. That would be our community norm. That's our responsibility as public servants, to provide the best information we can, make decisions as we can, based on all that be best evidence. Sometimes um, we will make a decision that isn't a popular one, and you do that, and, and, and uh, others will do that as well. That's best on your best judgment of the evidence, and you weigh the consequences. Sometimes that means you lose the next election. But uh, it's a matter of what do we need to do, what does the science tell us, and I'm telling you what I understand the science tells us. What is the reflection of the, the, the community's will in terms of risk tolerance? We have to sort that out as well, and I think that's part of uh, this process and, and how you move forward in answering the question. Thank you. That was, that was uh, fabulous because it does nail down exactly what we're doing, unfortunately, is we have to make that decision whether it's favorable or unfavorable, and either way, um, I was going to make a, a, a kind of silly comment. Um, because we talk about medical research and all of that, and I wasn't going to do it, but after your comments, I think I will, and it has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about. Um, and I ask everyone here to take aside the emotional, I guess, concept of what I'm gonna say, but, and I watch way too much TV, so you can take it in that context. Um, I once saw a show where they believed the fellow's arthritis was from bad teeth, so they pulled all his teeth. 
Um, so when we look at medical, I guess, research and, and theory and, and risk, which is what you're talking about, we have to weigh out that risk and decide where we're going from there. Now, I don't know if that's a medical issue, if that was actually true or not, but uh, it was on TV, so it has to be true, you know, so. Um, I must but, have missed that program. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, but there, therein lies what you're talking about and what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you. I think we're, you know, a number of years ago that the dentistry, uh, the dentistry profession was very united on their uh, arguments against um, um, taking fluoride out of the water and their, and their support for fluoridation. But uh, it's not united today. There's, there's a, a big split. And although you and I likely agree that the, united, the University of Toronto is not anywhere comparable to the University of Calgary, um, but the University of Toronto is a well-recognized university. And Hardy Limbach, who is the head of preventive dentistry uh, program at the University of Toronto, states, and I'll, I'll quote what he said, he said, fluoridation is no longer effective. And then he went on to add that adding the chemical to the water is more harmful than beneficial. Can you comment on that? Because it, there seems to be the struggle to tell us that everybody's united on this, that the fluoridation, adding fluoride to the water is uh, beneficial and there's no harm, right? So I, I certainly am aware of uh, Dr. Leinbeck uh, in his role at, at U of T and so respect his opinion. Uh, he uh, regularly is involved in, in research uh, and in fact uh, one of his recent papers uh, looked at the question of whether um, um, there was accumulation of fluoride in bone. And they uh, looked at, uh, they actually sampled bone uh, in people that were undergoing surgery and from areas that were fluoridated and not fluoridated. And in fact, they didn't find a difference. So in spite of claims actually that he's made in the past and others that, that it uh, accumulates to harmful levels in bone uh, was not borne out by his own research. You think so, then that he's changed his uh, position, that it's no, now? No, 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 no. He's still, I think he would, if you asked him today, he'd, he'd say, uh, reaffirm that quote. So he's, he is one that, that's a voice that needs to be heard, and that's why we need to have uh, the regular and ongoing systematic review of the literature. Uh, and so where the unanimity uh, comes in, that I said and others have said, is around when you do that systematic, broad look at it all, all of the bodies have come to that same conclusion. So yes, there are outliers, uh, and we have to look at that. You need to listen to, to, to folks who raise questions, but then you have to then delve into the science and take the body of it to, to guide our decision making. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Alderman Collier Kirk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mesto, for being here. So are you an expert on fluoride or fluoridation? Uh, I've, I've been interested in reading about fluoridation for a long time, so where would my expertise be? It would, uh, it would be really actually around it as a public health measure. So, so yes, I am. So and that element of it, I'm a public health physician, and that's where my expertise lies. So as a measurement, though, and, in, and informing yourself through probably keeping current on the research? I do, and I rely also on my, our team within uh, Health Promotion Disease and Injury Prevention. So one of the folks that will be following me is Dr. Schwartz, who's our provincial dental officer. He would be more directly involved in flagging things for me, and then I review them. So what makes people an expert around this matter? I guess I'd maybe ask you. I, I, um... I get to ask the questions. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we could get in, I don't, I don't want to get into some semantics about No, but term, we need to so. know because everyone claims to be. Well, I, I don't know. I haven't heard anybody else. I'm the only one that has said uh, that I have expertise around uh, fluoridation as a public health measure because my expertise is public health. That's what I'm trained to do. It's a Royal College specialty. That's what I've done for the last 25 years. Yeah, so that's helpful. So um, based on, on uh, some of the comments you've made, uh, if this is so critical and so important, uh, why is it not a provincial Alberta Health Services policy uh, uh, 
uh, and why are rural Albertans left out of, uh, of uh, having fluoridation in their water? I come from southern Alberta. Those residents don't have it, and I'm sure it's the same way across rural Alberta. So why, why the discrepancy? Well, Alberta Health Services does not uh, operate the water treatment facilities. Uh, that's a municipal responsibility. So, so it's not our place to to put that in uh, those communities, right? I'm not, so I don't understand your okay, question. Okay, so the province of Alberta, Alberta Health Service, doesn't deem it to be a mandatory health requirement for, uh, for uh, health and wellness. So we need to make a distinction between Alberta Health and Wellness, which is maybe who you're asking about, right. and Alberta Health Services. So you're asking about Alberta Health and Wellness? Both, both. Because I would I, think I, they work together. So Alberta Health Services is a service delivery arm. So we, we do not set policy for the province. That's the role of government. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, Alberta Health and Wellness, um, in fact, are supportive of uh, uh, fluoridation as a, as a good public health measure. Um, it, it, that minister does not set government policy caucus does. So I don't know the extent whether they've asked that. We've, We've advocated, as you know, uh, in many in several other uh, issues for provincial action, such as on tobacco control and so on. Yet this city chose to be ahead of the province in terms of uh, restricting uh, access to tobacco. So that's that's the politics of our province. So how do you feel about rural Alberta not having uh, access to fluoridation? Well, I'm concerned. So some do. Uh, we do. Uh, uh, Alberta has, I think it's about 70 odd percent of our population is, is covered by fluoridated water. And of course, the, the biggest the populations are Calgary and Edmonton. Okay. Many rural communities do fluoridate, some don't. Uh, and uh, many Albertans who are on uh, wells, of course, will not be having their, their water treated at all. Some of those have uh, a good level of fluoride in their water. Some have too much. And so uh, that's one of the roles that we uh, serve as um, public health officials uh, is to um, uh, review uh, the water level in wells and, and, uh, and for a variety of things, uh, also nitrites and so on, which are of, of an issue for infants. So we work with uh, rural Albertans as well, and, and, I'm, and I think it's, I would love to see that, in fact, the province took action on it and made it a mandatory uh, uh, policy across the province, but they have chosen not to do that. Uh, you touched in your presentation upon plebiscites, and uh, and uh, I got the impression that you favor that route. Uh, it, it's a question to I think that, that we need to consider what is what would what would the community want us to do. So um, you're going to you've already heard so heard so far more of the speakers saying they want to have it out. Um, you know, when I talk with my friends, they want it in, and they're, they would be quite offended uh, and, and say that if, if it, they didn't have a chance to, to make sure it stays in. So, I mean, plebiscites are difficult. Uh, we know, and, and Alderman Farrow commented on this at, uh, uh, at your council meeting when she brought her motion forward, that there's not the level of participation in the public in our uh, electoral process that we'd like. That's what we have. So. Uh, it, it would be the most direct way, obviously, of uh, gauging the, public, uh, the public's wishes on the matter. Uh, the challenge would be getting this information out in a way that's, that's understood, understandable, and uh, providing opportunities for people to ask questions as, as, you're, as you're doing now. So we would have to ensure that it's a, a good process, a solid process for it to be meaningful. Right. So what if uh, we, we've gone this route in past years, as you know, and uh, it's pretty well a draw, pretty well 50-50. So, and plebiscites aren't binding on council. Uh, so what would you take from that? that well, what do you take from those results? Because they've basically been the same all the time. Well, I mean, the, the flip side of that is if we were, pardon me, if we were to take it out, again, you, uh, then you have a majority who are not getting the benefit that they asked you to keep in there. So. You have to sort that out as politicians. Again, I think um, you, uh, as you point out, it's not binding, so you take that as direction, but, but not binding direction. And then you have to also um, 
understand and ask those questions as you are now and potentially with uh, other resources like the university so that you're satisfied about the safety and, and efficacy of, of the issue and then you make your decision. Okay, thank you. Oh, my last question. Uh, uh, people just uh, uh, confine their questions on fluorosis to just teeth. So what in your view is the impact of fluorosis on the body? What is the uh, impact of fluorosis on the body? Some of the questions the yeah. and comments about fluorosis have uh, just been confined to its effect on teeth. So could you comment, please, uh, on the effect of fluorosis on the body? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other area where, where people talk about fluorosis is in bone, and that's at levels that are just not seen here. So it's not an issue in a community with uh, uh, optimally fluoridated water. Thank you. Alderman Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, to declare an interest and um, Thank you for coming, Dr. Musto. Uh, I do appreciate your presence because obviously you um, carry a lot of weight in, uh, in the province of Alberta and in the city of Calgary. So listening to your, your comments and the questions that I'm hearing from my colleagues, I have a few very, very pointed comments regarding health of, of children, particularly infants. I'm about to have a, a, a newborn baby literally any minute. Yeah. And, well, not me personally, but oh, okay. Joelle is. Um, I had something to do with it, or so they tell me. So uh, my, my, my concern is, is my wife also is unable to breastfeed because of the, uh, she has some other health issues as well. So this impacts my decision making tremendously because of the fact that I am aware of all the latest information and studies that are suggesting that we, if we're going to, to feed our child through bottle, which is obviously the only way that we can now. The studies are suggesting that we should not be using, as Alderman Keating suggested, we should not be using municipal tap water because of the fluoride. And uh, we should also reduce as much as possible our consumption of this. And there's no real way to, to control that if one consumes a lot of water. For example, if I consume two glasses of water a day, municipal tap water, and um, you, perhaps, as a, a marathon runner or something like that, would consume 30 or more. This would dramatically in increase and influence the amount of fluoride that you're bringing into your system. That's something that you cannot control. So I think there's two questions there. One is around uh, your child, and congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank your you. life's about to change. Thank you. Um, and. Uh, and actually, when I was cutting, when I first wrote my my comments, uh, I did actually bring that in about the notion of the risks that, and our risk judgment that we make uh, it varies through our time course. And one of the big changes in your life course is when you become a parent, and your risk tolerance changes, mm -hmm. um, and you you have this additional responsibility. Um, that's also the kind of additional responsibility that accrues to you as a public servant and me in, in public health. So we take those responsibilities very seriously. Um, the evidence, indeed, uh, in spite of uh, your comment, and I'm sorry to contradict, to contradict you, but uh, is that your child, uh, uh, if you are reconstituting formula with the Calgary water of 0.7 parts per million, mm -hmm. that would be absolutely safe. Okay. And the second your... part was about me. Yeah, I, I'm not a runner. I'm an old-time hockey player, and I drink mm -hmm. lots of water. And I'm glad that I do mm -hmm. uh, because uh, and the fact that I'm an old-time hockey player is my gums are receding and my roots are being exposed. And I know that the, the fluoride in the water is uh, continuing to provide protection to me as well. It's not a benefit that only accrues to children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, you're, you're referring, of course, to the topical benefits of having it on your teeth for, for that fraction of a second that you're, you're drinking. Well, it was, as was pointed out earlier, it's, it's both uh, topical and, or another way, and, and, this, and the systemic, there's the saliva and it's in our saliva and that continues that, that bathing, if you will, of our teeth in uh, the appropriate level of fluoride. Mm -hmm. um, so from a governance perspective and 
for, and I don't, I don't mind you contradicting me at all. I'm a public servant, and that happens quite regularly, as you imagine. So my comment now is, if we are looking at this from a governance perspective, and we're trying to do the best that we can as a municipality, whose responsibility is health in terms of the governance structure in the province of Alberta? Well, it's a shared responsibility. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's a societal responsibility, and it's the, it's the responsibility of the institutions that we create in society. Uh, because health uh, is uh, the health that we enjoy or the illnesses that, that uh, befall us uh, are a sum, summation of many determinants. Mm -hmm. Health care is, is one little bit, and in fact, the smallest part of our health. It's the other social determinants, uh, as our, the very first speaker talked about, uh, income and housing and so on. Those are all very important. You have a role to play in those. I have a role to play around the health services piece. I also have a role as a, as a medical officer of health to advocate with you and with other government levels to ensure that we all do our part, uh, that we have, uh, that we create an environment that creates opportunities for health for all of the citizens. And I believe fluoridation is one that does that. No, and I appreciate that. And I certainly understand that in the grand scheme of things, this is a, a, an issue that is about building cities. And we need to look at what we are doing as a wellness perspective. And it is health care, and it is arts, and it is uh, social contributions from a variety of different agencies all working together. But my my question specifically is, if you are so interested and, and, and believe to your very core, as I understand that you do, that we should continue this process, why is the Alberta Health Services not contributing financially to, to this program? It is $750,000 a year. That's something that uh, the City of Calgary has had a responsibility that has, in effect, been downloaded onto it by the province, and we would like to understand if this is a priority, which I understand it is, for Alberta Health Services, why is it not um, compensating the city? So Alberta Health Services is, in fact, uh, contributing in many ways to the oral health of the population. So we, uh, uh, one of the programs that, that we do uh, in recognition of uh, the fact that fluoridation is not sufficient, it's one of the things that contributes to a reduction in dental caries and improved oral health. Uh, we have targeted programs to uh, schools uh, that are identified as having children with, who are at higher risk for dental caries. And we, we have staff that attend and uh, apply fluoride varnishes. So in fact, we are currently spending more than the amount, uh, the $750,000 mm -hmm. in oral health programming. So. It's a partnership. This is what we do. You, are, you manage uh, the waterworks. That's, that's what you do. No, and I appreciate that. I, pre I, I, I do. And some recent materials that I've received, and, and do feel free to contradict or, or interject where necessary, um, that approximately out of $1,000 that we would spend on fluoridating our water, about 995 of those dollars are literally flushed down the toilet, used to wash our cars, used to wash our dishes, used to wash all of these other day-to-day -day items, and only $5 is actually consumed by people as potable water. Furthermore, all that $5, really only 50 cents out of $1,000 I'll say that again, only 50 cents out of $1,000 actually goes to the target audience, which is, which is children, isn't it? Does that sound like sound financial sense? So broaden the, the conversation. Um, we, uh, there's many things that we should do, and you've already done one of the examples that, uh, that you, I think, came up with the last conversation about this where you went ahead of what the public wanted was the uh, implementation of water meters. We know we need to be wiser in how we use our water. Uh, and there, there are other methods that we might do to try to separate out um, the uses of the water. They're, they themselves have 
complications or implications, and that might be something that will be a future discussion uh, that, that Council has to do. But the fact of the matter is, even though so much of that water is used in those other ways, that is still the most efficient way, uh, cost efficient way to get that benefit to everybody, not just the children, all of us who benefit, because as I said earlier, all of us benefit, including all of you here if you drink the water. Uh, the alternative, and that is one of the questions that might be posed um, uh, to a, an external body, is what are the, uh, do, do an economic analysis of the other potential ways of delivering it. Anytime you're talking about actually moving to dental care, first of all, you've already missed an opportunity to prevent. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, you've got one-on-one. -on -one. You've got a health professional with a patient. That's way more expensive. So the, the alternatives, in fact, are more expensive. We need them. We need those other services, as I mentioned. We are already investing additionally to, to try to provide additional benefit to the children at highest risk. So it's not one thing only. It's a combination of our, of our efforts and the, the things that you held uh, responsibility for as uh, city leaders and, and what I hold responsibility for as a health leader. No, and I, and I thank you for that. Um, my job, as I understand it, is to follow the initiatives and the direction from my constituents. Thus far, and this thing has been lit up like you wouldn't believe because of this issue, probably more than any other issue that I've, that I've come across in my three and a bit years on this council. It is about 400 to one to say get this out of our water. And all the arguments that I'm hearing, there's the financial arguments, obviously. There's the health arguments also. But for me, fundamentally, what struck me the most was the moral and ethical questions that this presents. Because one cannot really opt out of the water, can you? You are actually, in effect, we are, whether we like it or not, in effect, mass medicating without consent. And to have somebody from a, um, a plebiscite or to have our council dictating to citizens, really, where they have no other options, is, uh, it, it's immoral, isn't it? Well, it's, some ethicists, in fact, have argued that it would be immoral to do otherwise. It would be immoral to, uh, to deny that benefit to, uh, to the Calgarians. I'm not going to argue that. The, the most cogent and, and uh, thorough review of the ethics of uh, fluoridation was conducted by the Nuffield Council on uh, Bioethics in the UK uh, in a couple of years ago. And they, uh, they were specifically addressing the issue of public health ethics. So much of the ethics that, that have governed health professionals have really been around direct face-to-face -face care. And there's four principles that we follow, autonomy being one of them. Um, doing good is another, don't do harm is the third, and justice is the yes. fourth. So those are relevant in the public health realm, but they don't translate particularly well because they're, if you look at autonomy, for example, it's really difficult to uh, understand how autonomy plays out in a, in a community. There are many th decisions that, that are made by people that are unknown to me about what products what things are put in the products that are in the stores, what are available to me to buy. I didn't decide that. I can choose the product that's there, but I um, uh, may not exactly know what, what's in it. It's not, you know, we have rules around what's disclosed in a product. They're not as uh, conclusive or as inclusive as perhaps we might want. So the issue of autonomy is, is one that there's a lot of discussion about. And it's not uh, uh, as clear as it is in a, in a medical kind of decision making. In the, uh, in the Nuffield report, so they did a, the, the, they, they addressed the, the issue of public health ethics and what kinds of things do you need to have in place in order to make these decisions in an ethical way for a whole population. And then they did a number of case studies and one of the case studies, happily, was fluoridation. And, uh, and they did address the question of uh, is, you know, this kind of paternalism, if you will, the nanny state justifiable in this uh, situation? Is the benefit, uh, do the benefits appropriately outweigh any potential risks? And they did end up coming down with, with 
Yes. The question to be answered is, is the procedural justice. Do people have the opportunity to express their will on it? So that's really where they landed. They think it satisfied every other criteria uh, that, that they felt needed to be there. Uh, and then the final one was, is there a good process, an open and fair process for people to have input into whether that is applied at a population level? And that's this part of that process that we're involved in now and, and maybe what you might choose to do uh, by engaging others to help with answering specific questions that you have. No, I uh, thank you for that. I, that's, um, that's very helpful. Uh, my last question, because Alberta is just one small corner of, of Canada, when we look at around the country, other provinces and other jurisdictions throughout, throughout Canada have opted also to remove fluoride from their water. So if we look at two of our eastern neighbours, the province of Ontario and the province of Quebec, if we look at those two, one of them has removed it completely, whereas the other has not. And yet, if you look at their, generally, their rates of cavities and things of that nature, virtually identical. Can you explain why that would be? Well, first of all, Quebec has not uh, removed fluoride. Uh, there are still fluoridated communities. There are still communities that have, uh, of course, like Calgary, uh, natural levels of fluoride in their water. So, uh, and not every community in Ontario is fluoridated optimally. So you're, it's not an either or. So the comparisons, and, and there hasn't been a systematic comparison that looks at how long has each person lived in that particular community and, and in their, their history of exposure. Mm. So that hasn't been done, but it's not a facile either or. Okay, well that's also helpful. Um, also, various countries in Europe, in fact virtually all of Europe, does not fluoridate. Is that true or is that not true? That's not true. It is um, not true. As I mentioned earlier, there are, uh, there are countries that in fact do fluoridate, such as the UK, uh, and there are others that, that provide, uh, have other mechanisms of um, providing fluoride on a mass level. So they add it to salt, they put it in milk. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, and, and they may have uh, other additional public health programming uh, where uh, children are, have uh, fluoride varnishes and so on applied. Right. So but Europe is not a fluoride free zone in any, by any stretch of the imagination. Very well, but you can, you're suggesting that they have these topical treatments, varnishes, and they've added it to added it to certain products, where you can opt in or opt out as you as you wish. Is that right? Some countries, that's the case. Yes. Okay. Now, I, I appreciate that because if you wanted to, if you wanted to, you could direct yourself towards these programs, which would provide you with this type of of um, a fluoride treatment. Whereas in Calgary right now, you can't. You can't opt out. We are, in effect, as a state, choosing it for you. So in Europe, you're saying that there are places where it is fluoride, there is fluoride available. It's not a fluoride-free zone, but you have an opportunity to jump in or jump out as required. Is that what I'm hearing? That's correct, just as we do here in Calgary. So people, as you waved your bottle of water, you have the choice to do that. Um, we, that it might be another question. In fact, you might want to explore uh, uh, if, if you engage others to help with this review. Uh, you know, I'm sure, that when Edmonton introduced uh, fluoridation back in, I think, the 60s, they actually did have a tap available where people could go after the treatment of the water but before, fluoride, before the fluoride was added. Mm -hmm. So that was an option that they maintained for a period of time and then discontinued because it wasn't being accessed. So that might be something you'd want to explore here. Again, these are the questions that it should be asked and uh, be part of your decision. Okay, uh, and, and really do appreciate you coming down here because obviously uh, there's a significant amount of council here, there's a very large audience, and this is an issue that Calgarians and Albertans are very, very interested in. But, and, and, and sorry to pull a Columbo, but my last thing was that out of that thousand dollars, you don't dispute the number and you don't dispute the fact that we are 
in effect flushing about $995 down the toilet. I'm not real good at uh, doing numbers in my head, so uh, I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Alderman McLeod. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Do you, um, uh, in some of the um, many, many, many emails that I've had on this, there was question um, in one of them about the actual rate of fluorosis and the indications were that um, that there may be some misdiagnosis, that some things, um, dental issues that were being diagnosed as fluorosis were not in fact fluorosis um, or related to the fluoride. Do you know um, offhand what the rate of fluorosis is as I'm, a result of fluoride? In Calgary? Yes. I don't. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, if uh, Dr. Swartz is going to be able to comment on that uh, or not. Okay. It requires uh, the, the specific effort to look at that. Okay, that may be the same then for my next question, which is about the percentage reduction in cavities as a result of the fluoride, if we're able to actually get a handle on that. Well, we, we have done uh, surveys around the, the decayed, missing, filled teeth, and uh, since, we, uh, since we introduced fluoridation, um, the results are, are mixed. It's not a clear uh, and consistent drop which is not surprising because of, as I've mentioned and it's been repeated by others, uh, there are many factors that, that contribute to the development or avoidance of dental caries. Fluoridation is one helpful measure that, all, that can be accessible to all of us. It's not sufficient, it's not the only one. Okay. Um, you, you've talked about um, do no harm as being a, um, an underpinning of, of, uh, of, the, um, of your um, Hippocratic Oath. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, when, we, when we have um, conflicting research and there's that you know, off chance that there is something out there, and we've heard personal experiences from two counselors, how, how do you balance that one-off um, or anomaly um, against the do no harm? Like at what point do you say that the broad public benefit is better even though a few people drop off the table? I, I'm kind of putting it yeah. in a bad way there, but. Well, y you have to look at, at um, that claim and then you weigh it against uh, does it make sense? Is there biological plausibility? Is there uh, a dose response? Is there consistency with other research? There's a whole list of criteria called Bradford Hills is one of the common sort of set of criteria by which we establish causality. So you evaluate it and then you place it against the other evidence. If it's uh, compelling, you need to uh, make sure that it's replicated. Um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, sir, uh, Richard Dahl, who was uh, a physician in the, United, in the United Kingdom, who really led the, the charge against uh, tobacco as a carcinogen, his first paper that linked um, uh, cigarette smoking with cancer was rejected by the British Medical Journal because it was a one-off. Mm -hmm. They didn't accept it until it was replicated in another study. So it's that level of rigor that we need to do before we act on supposition or possibilities or what ifs. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard um, in these emails that I've got, uh, um, the fluoride has, I, I think we heard earlier about um, a case with arthritis. Um, and it, it seems to me that fluoride is being blamed for every disease that doesn't have a known cause. <laughs> um, and uh, can you comment on that? Or if the, uh, are you aware of any relationships to any of these issues? Well, again, um, there, there are lots of claims of harm being made. And, and that is one of the things that makes the whole issue um, troubling for, for you as decision makers and for the public, because uh, we do have uh, people with 
s seemingly reasonable credentials making these claims. So we need to listen to them, um, and, and we need to study them, and we need to weigh them against the other evidence. Um, it's difficult, as I said earlier, to prove the negative. Yeah. So you have to look at it all together and, uh, and then make a decision on the balance of that information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my last question is um, back to the, this idea of having an expert panel. Um, do you have anything you want to add on the question of um, how we ensure that the panel is unbiased um, going into this, um, if, we, if we decide to create this? Well, I think what I would add is that, that it's around the transparency of the process. So. Uh, if, uh, if you've had a good process to identify what the questions are that, that you wish to have asked, you are very clear uh, in the discussion about how or what processes are going to be undertaken to answer those questions. And an expert panel might, as I said, might be one of the ways that you do that. There might be other resources that you'd want to tap into. You might even want to commission a study of some description or another. But if you're apparent or transparent about that throughout, and people have an opportunity to have input around those criteria or the rules that you're going to play, uh, play by, then, then I think that ought to uh, go a long way in, in increasing our confidence that, that people are being honest and ethical. And, and again, I, I would repeat um, uh, what was said about at some, time, at some point you have to trust. You know, I trust you as uh, my elected representative to be honest and ethical and to work hard. You are working hard on this because, you know, you've, people have made sure you're working hard on it because they're sending all sorts of stuff. So I respect you for that. I trust that you're going to do the best you can. And I, and I would like to expect that you have the similar faith and trust in me because that's essential for me to do my job well, that I have credibility with you and, and uh, that you can trust what I'm saying to be best, uh, based on my best understanding of uh, this or any other question that I might come before you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You mentioned uh, in, in the rural communities you found wells with too much fluoride. How much is too much? Uh, maybe, maybe I can short, shortcut that sure. question a little bit easier instead. Um, with the last presenter, we were talking about, we were discussing dose in the sweet spot of what the dosage, the correct dosage is. And I'm still trying to wrap my mind around that. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, if we're putting 0.7 milligrams per liter into the water, that's what we're dis discussing doing. What, how many liters, so, so the average person generally drinks three liters a day? Is that correct? I don't think it's that much. Okay, I'm, I, I'm, I'm actually looking to you for correct answer yeah, on that. It's less than that. It's, so two liters? Yeah, it's okay, more so than a liter, liter and a half. We should be getting one and a half milligrams of fluoride a day is the general consensus. And that's the, really the number I'm trying to get at. So that's approximately the, the correct dosage? I think so. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any indication that fluoride can be absorbed through the skin? through baths, showers, anything along those lines? Not Has there been any studies whatsoever in, in 60 years of fluoridation to see if there's any epidermal seepage, so to speak? I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. So I can After 60 can years, you'd think somebody would have done that. I don't know. It's, uh, there's an awful lot of things that, I mean, we've got, that's, the skin is a marvelous organ. Oh, I know. <laughs> that protects us from uh, absorbing lots of things. So um, uh, it, it's not intuitive to me that it, that it would be absorbed through the skin. And, and so I, I mean, I'm quite happy to Well, it's just, I mean, we, that we realize that the skin absorbs pretty much everything else. So why well, it wouldn't? It doesn't, actually. Uh, the, the, the skin is a very effective barrier for many things. OK. Fair enough. Um, after 60 years of fluoridation, the debate still seems to rage on an ongoing basis. Why, in your opinion? Well, <clears throat> that's what I tried to address in my comments, so I'm sorry if I didn't okay. express myself well enough. I, I, think, I think it is this issue of risk and risk tolerance. Um, uh, Alderman Stevenson made the point about, um, uh, you know, this is something that I think was I hope it was Alderman Stevenson, That's right. perhaps it was Alderman Keating. Someone over there, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, about um, 
water being this precious thing that, that and then I said that I believe it's something that's a, we, it's a right to, to us as citizens. So all of those things just give it that much more emotive impact. Uh, and okay. uh, that's fine. That's life. Uh, and it just means that we have to be, uh, we have to go through this process regularly. We have to make sure that, that um, those of us in our respective roles uh, in health or in government need to stay on top of these issues. Okay. So that's fine. Um, do you consider stress, I've heard many times that stress is one of the leading causes of health problems in the Western world. Is that a reasonable acknowledgement? Stress is an, a, a big thing in our lives. Okay. Would the concept that a vast, a vast minority, a vast number of people in our population that believe that fluoride is bad and having it in our water causes them stress? Well, that's a good example of a supposition. Okay. Yeah. What if? What if? No, it so is. So I can't answer that. No, yeah. I'm not asking whether that supposition. Do you believe? That, that, that stress, that that could be a cause of stress. I don't That's know. a supposition? I, I, and I don't know the answer to that. I know that, that uh, ch when, when, I have, when I was younger, and I can't say when my children had caries because they didn't, but as parents, with, when they have uh, caries, when I have had caries as a child growing up in Montreal where there was no, no fluoridation, that was stress, let me tell you. That pain, the, co the cost uh, that uh, my parents had to pay for without uh, insurance plans, that stress. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions, thank you, Dr. Musso. Oh, your light just come on? Okay, all in the furrow. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Dr. Musso. You, I always enjoy your presentations. They're very thoughtful. I, I also wanted to thank you for... Uh, for one of your comments that you just made. Um, several comments I've received from Calgarians who were didn't agree with me bringing this motion forward suggested that we've been through all of this and aren't we done with this discussion? And, and what you said was that we should continue to review these things, and I wanted to thank you for that. Um, I think it is important that we continue to vote. Uh, uh, otherwise, we would still have if bisphenol A is an acceptable substance that's now ubiquitous, or the big debate now is phthalates. So we're always learning, and we should be keeping abreast of this new information. This is our privilege to be in a democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Musso. For the audience, anybody that, has, that wishes to speak that is not signed the speaker's list that is on the speaker's podium over there, and we are now recessed till 105.
Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. The next speaker that I would like to call forward, I should let you know that we're on speaker number eight of 41. So we got a long way to go. So my next speaker is Michelle Robinson. We have your name and uh, you have five minutes. Hi there, I'm Michelle Robinson and I'm from Abbeydale. I have copies for what I wanted to say to everybody here in case you'd like one. Um, I want to thank you for giving me, giving the whole public a chance to speak today. I came here today advocating for my family. My husband wanted to be here today but he had to work. Um, there is scientific evidence to prove that adding fluoride to our water is not the best way to maintain our health, both orally and otherwise. We should acknowledge that there is room for scientific debate on the risks and benefits of fluoridation, despite our medical and dental association's objections. To name at least one whole book devoted to the subject, I recommend The Case Against Fluoride, How Hazardous Waste Ended Up in Our Drinking Water, and the bad science and powerful politics that kept it there by three scientists, Dr. Paul Connett, Dr. James Beck, and Dr. Penning Micklem. Sorry if I mispronounced that. The medical and dental associations have played politics on this issue. If there is that much evidence to illustrate the downsides of fluoridation to make a book, can we please stop playing politics on the concept that there should be no debate? There is a debate, and we need to listen to the other side that hasn't been advocated for. Not everyone is capable of ingesting this toxin. To those who have legitimate health issues, specifically kidney issues, we are making their health issues much harder to overcome. Fluoride exasperates uh, chronic kidney issues. If fluoridation is wanted for the willing, there are options rather than mass water consumption. Those other ob options include tablets, toothpaste, with fluoridation and or fluoridation at the dental offices. Even formula for babies have a high source of fluoride to the point of concern. I would ask these people who support fluoridation to consider the rights of the unwilling. As a Calgarian in a free society, I should be able to make the decision on how to approach my health and the health to my family. Forcing everyone to drink a chemical, drug or toxin goes against the whole idea of freedom and constitutional rights. As a parent, I try to eliminate food dyes, processed foods, pesticides, herbicides, chemicals, carcinogens, and many other toxins found in our food, water, and supplement choices. Even our air locally is polluted with silver iodine, considered a hazardous substance, a priority pollutant, and a toxin pollutant by the EPA, all in the name of hail suppression. Many of these things I don't have a choice on, and I wish I did. Fluoride Fluoride is another toxin I'm trying to have a choice on and trying to eliminate. I'm asking you as a parent, as a wife, as a pet owner, as a nursing mother, and as a concerned citizen wanting clean water, to please take the fluoride out of the city water. To have taxpayers spend money on this is disgraceful and unnecessary. To force this on my family without our consent is unethical. Please keep that in mind while making this decision and thank you for your time. Peacefully, Michelle Robinson. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions? Seeing none, Ms. Robinson, thanks for coming down and doing your presentation. Thank you. Next speaker on the list is, I hope I get this right, Stan Nikhail? Nickel. Nickel? Oh, just hold on a second, sir. Alderman Carr? Oh. You don't have to stand, it's the wearing committee. I'd just like to declare an interest. Okay. It's hard not to stand in this chamber. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nickel? Chairman, members of council, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. My name is Stan Nickel. I'm a uh, member of the Coalition of Seniors Advocates Association and its past vice president. Uh, I am appalled that with the intelligence, education, and information available being posted everywhere, why would anyone want to ingest and promote water treated with such a dangerous chemical as fluoride? 
my wife brought to my attention the, the uh, meaning uh, according to the Canadian Dictionary of fluoride. Fluoride is a binary compound of fluorine with another element. Fluorine is highly corrosive, poisonous, gaseous, halogen element, the most reactive of all the elements. This is a health issue and a matter of one's choice which is being denied to those who do not want fluoride in their water. It is forced upon us. Is this democracy? Just as smokers don't have a right to expose us to secondhand smoke, so shouldn't those of us against fluoride be exposed to this chemo chemical in our water supply. Can all those pro-fluoride experts guarantee that none of the thyroid, kidney, hip fractures, brain tumors, osteoporosis, cancer, and other health conditions were not caused by the ingestion of fluoride from our water supply over a period of years? It builds up in, the, in our bodies. What about all the costs to our health care on the adverse effects caused by the ingestion of fluoride? Are our lives being shortened by ingesting fluoride? We don't ever hear the side effects of ingesting fluoride from the pro-fluoridationists. Why? We are captive by all the food and drink which is made with fluoridated water. Eating and drinking beverages in restaurants with fluoridated water also puts us at risk. We can't escape from it no matter what we do. Isn't that overkill and irresponsible? Seriously. I once enjoyed Calgary water and bragged about its good taste. Shortly after fluoride was introduced to our water supply, my stomach reacted to it adversely. I was forced to buy non-fluoridated bottled water and, and dispensers costing me thousands of dollars over almost 20 years. And I am still paying for city water. As uh, Alderman Marr was saying, what good is fluoride in flushing our toilets, washing dishes and clothes, watering our lawns and gardens, and washing our vehicles? What a waste of our tax money, to which I strongly object. They are also polluting our rivers with fluoride. What good is fluoride to people with dentures? They don't need fluoride. What about people with allergy? allergies? Should they be ignored? Moth rinses contain fluoride toothpaste is heavily fluoridated. Dentists give fluoride treatments. You can purchase fluoride drops in the drugstore. So why is our water fluoridated? Is it ethical or even legal of uh, being slowly poisoned? This may be challenged and the city would be held to account for their actions, costing us even further. With all this fluoride being consumed and the good it's supposed to do, then dentists should be leaning on their drills waiting for patients. And instead, yet they seem to be very busy as obtaining an appointment takes long periods of time. Other jurisdictions are removing or resisting fluor fluoridating their water supply. Why is Calgary so backward and not doing so? Likewise, look what fluor do fluoridation, uh, fluoride is doing to the dispensing equipment. Now it will cost us millions to replace uh, if, if fluoride, what, what it's doing to, its, uh, to the dispensing equipment, then how is it affecting the, our bodies? Now it will cost us millions to replace this equipment, not to mention the $750,000 per year for the fluoride. We do not need this cost to our treasury, nor to our health risk. The evidence against fluoride has been continually mounting. Why isn't this evidence and common sense prevailing here? Take fluoride out of our water. The paper is written by Dr. Richard Folks, which is some of it here, uh, the late Dr. J uh, John Cahoon, why I changed my mind about fluoridation, and Dr. Jim Beck, as well as others, are professionals whose expertise and advice should be taken seriously. With the kind of determined information now available, I don't see how any municipality dares to put fluoride in our water supply. Please take it out immediately for the health of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nickel. Is there any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Okay. The next speaker on my list is, I hope I get this right, Luke Schwart. I'd like to use the uh, projector for the overhead. Oh, it's on, okay. Mr. Chairman and Councillors, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Dr. Luke Schwartz. I'm a dentist. I'm the Dental Public Health Officer for Alberta Health Services. 
I drink fluoridated water, tap water every day. Oral health is a key component of general health. You cannot separate the health of your mouth from the health of your body. Common sense tells us that fewer cavities means fewer days missed from school, fewer instances of pain and swelling, better ability to chew food, and better quality of life. There's good science showing that water fluoridation works to reduce tooth decay. The weight of the evidence indicates that it has two positive dental effects. Number one, it increases the number of children who've never had decay. I'm gonna show you page 12 from the British Systematic Review. which shows 30 different research measures in cities that started water fluoridation where they didn't have them. The vertical black line shows at zero means there's been no change. The colored bars show the percentage of children who have zero cavities. Most studies show that after fluoridation starts, the proportion of children with no decay increases. They're on the right side of the no change line. The second effect that fluoridated water has is it reduces the amount of decay in children with cavities. The second page I'll show you is page 16 from the British Systematic Review that shows seven measures of what happened when fluoride was removed from a fluoridated community. The vertical line at zero again shows that there is no effect. The colored bars on the left of the line show that after fluoridation stops, children have more cavities. Calgary children have better dental health since water fluoridation started. As you know, Calgary does have natural fluoride in the water. It fluctuates with the seasons up to 0.3 or maybe even 0.4 parts per million. City engineers carefully boost and control the natural level at 0.7 parts per million, enough to benefit dental health. Fluoridation is safe and effective and improves the health of teeth. You may have heard of concerns about dental fluorosis and how it is caused by water fluoridation. First of all, it's important to note that fluorosis is an aesthetic marking of teeth and not a health problem. Dental fluorosis is typically a whitish discoloration of enamel. The biggest risk for enamel fluorosis comes from using drops or tablets of fluoride or uncontrolled amounts of toothpaste. That's one of the reasons Calgary had an expert panel review in 1998. Dental fluorosis ranges from very, very mild to severe. We do not find severe levels of dental fluorosis in Calgary, and it is not associated with the levels of fluoride that we use in water fluoridation. Calgary is already at the lowest level of fluoridation recommended by Health Canada's expert panel. Um, I'm going to show you a page that shows the dental fluorosis rates in Calgary and across the province. The, the blue line, the heavy blue line, shows the number of children who have zero dental fluorosis. And you can see that that's on the increase. That's exactly what you want to be having. The green and red lines show the levels of dental fluorosis that are either of uh, very mild concern or of moderate concern. And both of those lines are dropping over the years. And then the final page that I'll show you is the level of dental fluorosis in Calgary compared with the Palliser Health Region. I used Palliser Health Region because when we did the survey there, we had a similar calibrator. And the comparison and the comparison with uh, water fluoridation is quite different. So the level of, level of communities in the Palliser Health Region with optimal fluoride water is, a, is less than 10% of the population. You can see that the level of dental fluorosis is almost identical, and that's just in another part of our own province. Many things that can happen to the development of enamel on permanent teeth to cause things that look like dental fluorosis. Taking antibiotics, having high fevers, having an abscess on the primary tooth, falling and bumping the primary tooth. Often all of these things are lumped together and called dental fluorosis. Some children have these effects on enamel without any good reason. We've been asked why not just give toothpaste or fluoride treatments to at-risk people. There is no simple way to find and reach the people who are most at risk of tooth decay but fluoridated water is available to everyone. It doesn't stigmatize our fellow citizens who might not have enough money to pay. 
for their dental care or preventive services or may not even be able to brush at all. I would suggest making the easy choice a good choice, drink tap water. By fluoridating, the community says that it values the dental health of all its residents. Thank you. Is there any questions? Alderman McLeod. Sorry. Um, I guess I, I, if I'm looking at this chart, am I to understand that our rate of, actually, can you tell me what our rate of fluorosis is, the percentages, um, roughly? So if you, if you look at this chart, uh, the number of children without any, any evidence of dental fluorosis is 69%. Right, so. So 31% might have some evidence of dental fluorosis. And that would be fluoride related as opposed to other um, issues that cause teeth to look like fluorosis? No, it will be all of those things rolled up together. So Health, Health Canada recently did a Canadian health measure sur survey that looked at dental fluorosis specifically with very carefully calibrated um, operators. The, they looked at the population across Canada and included about 1,100 children. 10% of those children were in Alberta. Uh, and that included a site in Edmonton and a site in Red Deer. Both of those communities are fluoridated. The Canadian Health Measure, Measure Survey did not find any children with moderate dental fluorosis. So some of these numbers that we're getting is just on the basis of how our people were calibrated and um, what we were looking for. I, I just want to make sure I understand that correctly. You're saying that, that the Health Canada study that was recently done showed no dental fluorosis in Red Deer and Edmonton from the fluoride water? Forgive me, no moderate dental fluorosis. Okay. So there was very mild and mild dental fluorosis was found. Okay. Okay. Um, well, that's interesting. And that, and that was separating it out from other factors that... Yes. Well, that's very interesting. So these numbers, when you say 31%, may, may include uh, a lot of other things then. Yes. Um, what about um, reduction in cavities? Do you have any numbers on that? Um, if, we, if we look again at the systematic review, so we look at the good studies, they're all rolled up together. The number or the percentage of children who have no decay whatsoever probably increases by about 15%. That's great, because these are kids who never had a cavity. If you look at the studies that show, and then how many less, how much less decay is there across the population? So in these large studies, it shows there's about two teeth with less decay. Again, I'm, I'm rolling up together the six-year-olds and the 12-year-olds and the 14-year-olds. It's hard to generalize, but when you do a systematic review, they try and make a case for all of those things together. So the, the evidence does support a reduction in cavities for sure then? Yes, the, the best study on effectiveness of water fluoridation, how good is it at actually reducing decay was done by the Americans and reported in 2001 by the Centers for Disease Control. They, give it, they gave it an effectiveness rating of 2A, which is the second highest on a, a recommendation level out of five. Okay, thank you. Um, and my last question is about this idea that is being floated with the expert panel. Um, do you have a view on that and do, do you have any um, advice that you might want to give us if we did a panel, um, what kind of questions that we would want to ask? Uh, Calgary has done an expert panel before, and this issue comes up routinely. As you know, um, the Irish did a huge review that took them a couple of years and reported in 2002, and also recommended that the level of fluoridation be at 0 0.7. The British did a huge review that took at least a couple of years and reported in year 2000, and they recommended that water fluoridation, still, there was no reason not to change that as an effective public health measure. The Australians upgraded the York Review and they reported that in 2007 and they didn't find that there was any significant change to that. 
Health Canada, in the wake of its responsibility to the people, also did an expert panel review, and which included Dr. Levy, who's probably the prime researcher on fluoride intake in the world, and also included a toxicologist on their panel, and looked at all of the research to see what is the best recommendation we can make for Canadians. And uh, their report has still not been finally published, but it has been open for public comment. That's finally closed, and they are now responding to it. So the expert panel included both Health Canada and Ministry of the Environment because allegations were made about the safety of both of those. That report will be coming out probably in April. And the recommendation will be that the level of fluoridation that is ideal in Canada is 0.7 parts per million, where we are in Calgary and have been since 1999. Okay, so if we have a panel that looks into this from the university, they're going to find the same information. It's Every time there's an expert panel, they almost invariably come up with the same response. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alderman DeMont. In your opinion, what's the leading cause of fluorosis? Uh, excessive amounts of toothpaste. Of toothpaste itself? Yes. And what in the toothpaste is causing the fluorosis? The fluoride in the toothpaste. The fluoride? Yes. Okay. So when they say that it's it's it, the, the pea-sized amount on the toothpaste that that they recommend for the toothbrush, that's too much. Or what, how, how do you what do you mean? I, I don't quite grasp. <laughs> You're suggesting brushing our teeth is causing fluorosis. Uh, dental fluorosis only occurs while the tooth is developing. So once the tooth has erupted, there is no longer any danger of the tooth developing dental fluorosis. The latest recommendations from Health Canada, and these just came out last year, is in fact that a pea-sized amount of toothpaste is too much for a very young child. Our latest recommendation is for the amount of toothpaste that's the size of a grain of rice, up to and age three years. Up to age three years. So how much fluoride is in a pea-sized quantity of toothpaste? Uh, well, it depends on the size of the pea, but it could be up to maybe 0 0.75 milligrams. 0 0.75 milligrams. Okay. Now, I was talking to Dr. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name from earlier, uh, who was recommending that 1.5 milligrams per liter is what is the recommended dosage for an average person of, to, to, to take fluoride in. Is that correct? The average adult consumes about two liters of water a day. So, so if that's 0. 0.7, that will make uh, 1.4 milligrams. 1.5, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, you're right, 1.4. So if a three-year-old happens to drink more than a liter and a half of water a day, and I realize that's a great deal for a three-year-old, they're at risk of getting fluorosis? They'd have to be drinking that routinely many days, days in and day out. But you're right, that will increase their, their risk of dental fluorosis if they're consuming that much water. Okay. Um, I was just looking at a study here that was commenting that major dental researchers conclude that fluoride is ineffective at preventing pit and fissure tooth decay, which is 85% of the tooth decay experienced by children. Is that accurate? <clears throat> the, one of the systemic effects of fluoride is to actually smooth out the layers of enamel in the pits and fissures. So it does have some effect there, but that, that is not its major effect. Um, topical fluorides work best on smooth surfaces. So the, the fluorides that you actually apply to the tooth as opposed to the ingested fluoride. Okay. Um, just kind of uh, referencing your, uh, the, the Irish study that you had commented on, uh, it, I'm trying to figure where I found, had it here, but they were commenting that up to 50% of Irish youth are experiencing fluorosis. Are they all brushing too much? Uh, I can't answer that. But that was in the same study that you just referenced. The Irish study? All yeah. of the studies look at levels of fluorosis. Yes, I know. And that study suggested that up to 50% of Irish youth are experiencing fluorosis. Yes, and so they, recommend, they recommended that they turn it down to 0 0.7. The, the water fluoridation level be turned down. So, when we look at the amount that we're fluoridating, 
and you commented that 0.7 milligrams is now, or point, I think I'm doing that right, is, is the lowest amount that Health Canada recommends. Correct. And that is what CDC and Ireland have just both reduced it down to. Correct. CDC's, <clears throat> CDC's recommendation just came out earlier this month. Yes. It will be approved later this spring. But it is recommending to lower it to 0.7 as well. It is. Okay. So that means for the last, again, 60 years, we've been recommending too high of a dosage. Uh, it means that the world has changed since 60 years ago. Interesting. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm just going to quote one more study that, that uh, you, you referred to the, uh, the major study. That I'm looking at a study from uh, the U.S. National Institute of Dental Research. 39,000 children in 84 communities uh, done in 1986, 88, no, sorry, from 88, 89, uh, commented that there was no statistical difference out of the 128 tooth surfaces in a child's mouth, 0.6 of a cavity difference between the communities of fluoridated and non-fluoridated communities? <clears throat> to get an accurate measurement of the difference that you have in dental health, you have to do a very involved study. If you're just doing a gross look at what are the people here and what are the people here without knowing where they moved from, where they grew up, whether they were actually drinking the tap water, and whether they're brushing with fluoride toothpaste, you're not going to be able to get a good assessment of what effect the fluoridation in the water actually gave you. And yet, isn't that the basis of using the large quantities? I mean, 39,000 people, there's an average that you start to get a, a, a gist of. Um, yes. That's, that's the whole purpose of taking large scale studies. You do start to get a gist from that. So you, you can get some information from that. I wouldn't call that a good, a good way to measure the effect of water fluoridation. But the study that you cited where it came up with two, di two cavities difference is a good example? That was from the systematic review. So that is looking at all of the studies and pulling the best quality evidence. And when you say the best quality evidence, who decides which is the best quality evidence? So when they go into a systematic review, they say beforehand, what, it, what is the question going to be? As Dr. Keegan uh, described, you have to make sure that there's uh, a proper control group. Well, no, I realize you, you look at the studies and make sure that they're not being done by Mr. Joe out of high school. Exactly. I, I gather that. But at the same time, I... I, I I'm having difficulty grappling with, with the fact that the, the pro-fluoride and the anti-fluoride seem to be using completely different methods of, of studies. And I look at the numbers that they're dealing with and go, okay, well, these are respectable people. They're doing literally tens of thousands of people in these studies. What, what makes it so that you accept these studies and not these that I can grasp from a simple politic political layman's lo outlook. You, you look at this and you say, well, how can you say that a study over 40, 000, uh, 39,000 people in, in, in this community is not a legitimate study? It is a legitimate study, but it's not a study of the effectiveness of water fluoridation. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Alderman Fincock. Um, thank you. Uh, just, I want to follow up on just something you said. In your opinion, fluorosis is caused prior to eruption or is established prior to eruption, tooth eruption? Correct. Yes. Okay. And fluorosis is caused by toothpaste, in your opinion? Okay, I excessive amounts of toothpaste, it, yes. All right. So. If the tooth hasn't erupted, how does the toothpaste cause fluorosis? Um, children, of course, have primary teeth, but the permanent teeth are developing and, and erupting until about age 12 or 13. Okay, so it's... Um, so maybe, so you're, so you're saying it's through the ingestion of fluoride in the toothpaste? Yes. Uh, that causes fluorosis in the teeth that are not actually in the mouth yet, but that the ones are not erupted yet? Yes. Okay. There's, there's been talk about, you know, and you just talked about this with, uh, with Alderman DeMond, talked about the different types of cavities and, and how it's fluoride actually helps 85% of, 
or doesn't help 85% of the cavities around pitting, but because it, it needs to be applied topically for that, that, that ingestion of fluoride doesn't work on that. So uh, is, is ingested fluoride helping smooth out the enamel, like you talked about, on teeth that are not erupted yet? It, it does have that effect as a minor effect, yes. Okay, so it's minor, but it causes, <clears throat> but it actually causes fluorosis on the teeth that are not erupted. In excessive doses, yes. Right, which, okay, which we heard is more than a grain, more than a rice of... That's the recommendation, is okay. to have a grain of rice. All if right, the so a grain, a grain of that. rice. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, is there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you. Next speaker is Valerie Fitch. Counselors, my name is Valerie Fitch, and I believe that Calgarians have a right to clean, potable, unmedicated water. The public water supply is not a vehicle to mass medicate the population. This is an ethical issue. I have a degree in pharmacy. I'm very concerned about dosage. With fluoride in the city water, there's no control over dosage. This is a safety issue. If the fluoride is applied topically by the dentist, at least there is some degree of control over dosage. So what are the most effective things we can do to prevent cavities? And I think we need to look at health in a very different way. I don't think that Alberta has a health care system. What we have is a high-tech diagnostic and treatment illness care industry. We shouldn't be focusing on the magic pill or the magic potion to prevent illness. If you would visualize a cliff with the healthy people at the top of the cliff and the people who have health challenges or illnesses at the bottom of the cliff, and ask some very basic questions. Why are so many people falling off the cliff? This applies not only to dental caries, but it applies to heart disease, cancer, obesity, type two diabetes, um, osteoporosis. You need to ask some very basic questions. So you have health at the top, you have illness care at the bottom, you have your ambulances, your hospitals, and things just tend to go round and round there, a lot like the Calgary Weir. So let's take a look at health. Do people not know how to stay healthy? Do they choose not to stay healthy? Or are there so many diseases around that nobody can stay healthy? I think we should address the first one. And I don't think people know how to stay healthy. And a lot of it comes these are, all these illnesses are really basically lifestyle illnesses. And when you look at lifestyle, you need to, um, well, when you start to make lifestyle changes, you need to look at food choice and nutrition because this is one of the very basic things that you need to change. The more processed food you eat, the more disease. The more animal food you eat, the more disease. If you're on a high protein Western diet, your body is a pretty good chance your body's going to be acidic. To compensate, the blood will draw from uh, draw calcium from the bones in order to balance it out. If you continue to eat a high protein diet, you're going to stay in negative calcium balance no matter how much calcium you take. And if you think this is affecting the bones, it'll also affect the teeth. What about processed foods? I'm thinking specifically of refined carbohydrates, the white rice, the white flour, the cakes, the cookies, the high fructose drinks, uh, even the pure fruit juices. These are concentrated sugars. These, I think, are more important and these are the things that should be addressed with all the population, and specifically with the people who are disadvantaged in the low-income groups. Because what's the good of having a child who is disadvantaged, who has really good teeth, but they have obesity because they're eating all the wrong foods? 
and it just sets them up for life. So instead of focusing money on the magic pill or the magic potion in city water, which I think is totally ridiculous, why don't we look at nutrition? and spend the money on that. It'll help the population as a whole, and it'll also help the disadvantaged people. And look at some basic studies, like um, T. Colin Campbell and the China Health Study. In China, people don't tend, in rural China, people don't tend to move around very much, and they could do a really good study on what the people ate and the diseases that they got. And, you know, look at some of the, the different research. You know, last time, I think City Council relied on the authorities in Calgary. And I'm really, well, I guess I feel more like the girl with the dragon tattoo because I'm really quite suspicious of all these local authorities. But the basic thing is ethical. I think it's really unethical to be putting this fluoride in city water. Thank you. Thank you. Your timing was right to the second, actually. Pretty good. Uh, Alderman Pincott, you have a question? Hi, Val. Hi, Ryan. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, I, I want to get, I mean, one of the, the things that I've been concerned about is around dose and that, and we heard it with some of the questioning around that uh, Alderman DeMong asked, you know, how do you, how do you control the dose when somebody drinks one glass of water or 20 glasses of water or um, one of our political colleagues who drinks 30 a day? He has to he has to drink thirty a day. Can you I mean can you think of any other kind of medication that we might prescribe where we actually don't bother controlling the dose? Um, I think with some dosage there there can be a bit of a wide range, but I think with um, drugs or chemicals. Um, well, and, and, and such as fluoride, I think it's really important to have a close, um, to monitor the dose closely. Okay. But in this one, you, we can't. Can't. Is that, can't. is that your opinion? That you can't. And so you shouldn't be put it, putting it in the public water system. Okay. It's not a vehicle to mass medicate the population. Because right. at at the end of the day, at the tap, we cannot control how much somebody gets. That's right, and more people, and as more people become uh, informed about health, they, I think they tend to drink more water. Mm. And um, I just think it's totally wrong to be mass medicating like this. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Alderman Mark. I almost stood up again. Uh, thank you, uh, and sorry, I didn't catch your name. My name is Valerie Fitch. Okay, Ms. Fitch, thank you. Uh, I, I just have a couple of questions. And what, what I was struggling when I was talking to Dr. Musto earlier was really over this ethical question, which you're bringing again. What are your options as somebody that does not want fluoride in the water? What is your current options to, to limit your exposure to it right now in the city of Calgary? Well... I suppose I could use bottled water, mm -hmm. but I'm reluctant to do that uh, for various reasons. Um, a friend of mine had breast cancer, and I attended a conference in Vancouver at Inspire Health. They had banned all the number one and the number seven containers in their facility. And, um, you know, this was sort of before the plastic was changed. But even now, in Calgary, I know of a place that had used these bottle, the bottles to empty out their photographic chemicals. And I am in, you know, I'm really reluctant to use these bottles because you never know where they've been, how well they've been cleaned, and what's leaching out of the bottle. So I think the best option is probably to buy a water filter. But, um, you know, these can be quite expensive, and I think it's beyond the means of a lot of the low-income people. So they really don't have a choice. You mm -hmm. know, they have to... Drink the tap water, maybe try to get some bottled water. I just think it's very unfair for the city to be having people jump through hoops in order to just get a glass of water. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, Ms. Fitch, thanks for your presentation. Next speaker, Vicki McKinnon.
Good afternoon. I'm here today as a grandmother who wants her grandchildren to have the benefit of fluoridated water. When I heard that it was at risk, I had to come to be a voice for proponents because I knew you would hear from the other side. And I've, we've heard today that you've had many electronic messages if they're not here in person from the other side. So I'm here today um, to tell you that on the basis of the endorsements of the organizations that I trust for my medical information, and I, everything from the CDC to the Canadian Pediatric Society, Canadian Medical Association, Alberta Health Services, I am confident that at the regulated rate of 0.7 parts per million, fluoridation is safe and will protect my grandchildren's teeth. As our very first speaker this morning said, my grandchildren are my most precious thing, and I would want, want to do anything that would cause them any harm. I'm speaking today as someone who had a substantial dental decay as a child. I missed lots of school for dental appointments, and I'm now faced with fillings that need to be replaced and a mouthful of silver and gold. I'd rather it was on my wrist. My mother told me that our dentist said back in the 50s that if we'd had water fluoridation, I would not be in this situation. Now in my senior years, I realize why cavity-free teeth in childhood are important because they're the best teeth to take us into our later years. I gave my own three children who were raised in Calgary in the 70s and 80s fluoride supplements, those fluoride drops that I added to their juice, as did many of my friends with their children. This was a long-term undertaking over many years, 12 years for each of those children, that required a huge commitment to obtain the fluoride supplement, to um, obtain the supplements, to use them regularly, to ensure that the number of drops was exact, and to make sure my children drank their juice. Although I really was a highly motivated mother in this area, I frequently fell off the wagon, and my children had inconsistent access to supplemental fluoride. I regret that they were not privileged, as their cousins were in Edmonton, where there was fluoridation, to have had that benefit, and their cousins all have no cavities and beautiful teeth. Ideally, I would ask this committee and council to support fluoridation for my grandchildren and all Calgary children who would have the opportunity to grow up without any cavities. While this may be idealistic, I would then ask that this council remain open-minded and establish the expert panel that we've heard about earlier today. Fluoridation is our best, universal, safe and effective tool for protecting cavities for, uh, to protect our children from cavities. Thanks very much. Thank you. Is there any questions? Alderman DeMont. Um, <clears throat> geez, where did I put it? This is meant more in a facetious manner than anything else, but in 1950, 19,293 dentists also advised, advised you to smoke Viceroy cigarettes. I'm just saying that as time goes by, things change. So that, that was really all. I, it, it wasn't, sorry, I, that was impro improper of me. That wasn't a question. I apologize. If I, if I can't comment on that, though, I think that we... Um We've heard today um, of the uh, quality of people that are doing the investigation, who are reviewing, doing the systematic reviews, and I still feel that they are better equipped to make those judgments uh, coming from a position of doing no harm than I am as um, a layperson. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, do you want to wait for a second? There's one more question. Holman Stevenson. Um, I was interested in your comment about how much, um, how difficult it was to make sure your kids got the proper dose of, how did you mean you had to make sure they got the right amount every day, is that? Exactly. You had to squeeze it out of this little bottle and you had to count the drops and the number of drops changed according to the age of the child. So, and it, believe me, if you were in a hurry in the morning, a little extra squirt, so tell me how people today are able to get that right amount. 
I don't know. I, I'm not aware of where they're using fluoride supplements anymore. No, they're no, not I'm, in Calgary. I'm talking about from our water. How would we know? How would a parent know today that their child is getting the exact amount? Well, I know that it's well. It would be well controlled at 0.7 parts per million, and okay. I'm confident that part seven, 0.7 parts per million is a safe and effective dose. That's, I'm, I'm fully aware that that's what's in the water, and I'm confident that they're regulating that too. What I'm asking you is how would a parent make sure their child got the right amount? Uh, oh. Because all, that, all we know is there's 0.7 in the water, but how do we make sure the child gets the right amount now? I understand your question, I think, and that is how are we making sure that there is sufficient and not too much fluoride that they're drinking to get yeah. that regulated? Right. Um, well, I think the studies that indicate that fluoride at the regulated level is in fact reducing decay is indicating that it is effective and pe so people must be getting, children must be getting adequate fluoride through the water system. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Alderman Marr, you have a question? I do. And I, I, I think it was Alderman Stevenson was trying to get to the point where you were suggesting back in, in your children's time that you were using an, a measuring dropper where you could control by opting in at your own choice as a parent to determine how much fluoride you were giving your child. But today, I don't know if my daughter is sitting at the water fountain right now drinking a liter and a half of water, plus the fact that the water that she would drink at home and da 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 da. So the point is, is that we now have no control over how much you're consuming based on we don't know how much these children are consuming at any given time. You were saying that you could control it as, you know, three drops per glass of water. You would give it once a day move on. Now we're talking about having X amount of parts per million, 0.7 parts per million, per million in our water. And if you're drinking, let's say three cups of water a day as a child, and I'm drinking three cups of water as an adult, the dose is not proportionate. So what I'm trying to determine is, is that is there a way that, that people can measure and control how much is being consumed? What? I think that's a question that re that would depend on what the um, tolerable range is, and I'm confident that with fluoridation and the amount of water that we're drinking, we're within the tolerable range for the amount of fluoride. The point I was wanting to make about the fluoride drops is that it's not a good alternative because it really takes a high level of compliance. And the people, um, if we're thinking not of my grandchildren but of disadvantaged children, to have parents that would be able, willing, capable of doing that may or may not be um, an option. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Ms. McKinney. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, I think it's unfair to ask a member of the public questions that relate to things like that. You might want to save it for a couple of the doctors and the experts that come up. They might have a better answer. The next person on my list, if I pronounce the name right, is Nick Eckes. Uh, good afternoon, honorable council members, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Nick Eckes. I'm a physician doing specialty training in internal medicine. I'm here as an individual, and I'm not representing any organization. Uh, today, I'd like to share a little bit about how medical professionals make decisions regarding health and um, essentially that decisions made by healthcare professionals derive their foundations from two main fields as we've been discussing today, uh, science and ethics. So science in its essence is the pursuit of truth beyond opinion, beyond conjecture, beyond intuition, beyond belief. Science attempts to show in a reliable, reproducible form what we can really know about the universe in which we live. However, science is a world of probability. Nothing can ever be known for sure because scientists are always open to the possibility that another experiment will someday disprove what is currently thought to be true. Science is a part of medicine. 
What can we know about what causes a disease? What can we know about what makes it better? However, the limits of our knowledge in science are also the limits of our knowledge in medicine. Nothing can be known for sure, but the more studies that there are, the more carefully that those studies are done, and the more consistent the results are, the more we can be sure that what we are seeing, in all likelihood, represents the truth. The second component of medical decision making concerns ethics. Essentially, what is the right thing to do? So looking at fluoridation, there's two questions that we need to answer. Number one, what is the truth to the best of our knowledge regarding the benefits and the risks of fluoridation? Do these benefits outweigh the risks? And number two, is fluoridating the water ethical? Is it the right thing to do? To answer question number one, what is the truth about water fluoridation, we must look to the scientific literature. Two recent systematic reviews, one commissioned by the government of the United Kingdom in the year 2000, and the other commissioned by the government of Australia in the year 2007, compile the results of all of the most carefully controlled studies. In short, they suggest that it's likely that fluoridating the water is beneficial in preventing dental caries and unlikely that it causes significant harm. It is likely that the benefits of fluoridating the water outweigh the risks and it's also likely that a decision to remove fluoride from the water would cause harm. This is the most certain that anybody can be about the truth of water fluoridation and I suggest being very cautious when listening to anybody who states their case more strongly than that. This argument is based on the best knowledge that we have available to us today. Answering the ethical question is more complicated, as are most issues of right versus wrong. However, it's important to note that the ethical question must take into account what we know about water fluoridation. I'll use a clear example. We know that it's likely that car brakes save lives and unlikely that they cause anybody significant harm. So, it is considered ethical to require everyone to have brakes on their cars, even though that restricts the freedom of people who would choose not to outfit their cars with brakes. We also know that it's almost certainly more cost effective to outfit cars with brakes than it would be to pay for all of the associated health care and automobile repair costs that would go along with not having brakes. Similarly, we know that it's likely that water fluoridation prevents dental caries and unlikely that it causes significant harm. The following is a quote from Dr. John Harris, an internationally recognized expert in medical ethics. He states, we should not ask, are we entitled to impose fluoridation on the unwilling people? But are the unwilling people entitled to impose the risks, damage, and costs of failure to fluoridate on the community at large? End quote. Should your neighbor have the right to take the brakes off of his car? In summary, number one, what is the truth? The truth is that the benefits of fluoride likely outweigh the risks. Number two, is it ethically responsible to fluoridate the water? Based on everything we currently know about fluoride, yes, it is. I hope that this has helped clarify the way that healthcare professionals make decisions and will help everyone to understand exactly why Health Canada, the Canadian Dental Association, the Canadian Medical Association, and the World Health Organization support fluoridation, as do our own medical officers of health and our own dentists. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Alderman Kara. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, just because you used the, the metaphor, I think it's interesting. The, the Center for Disease Control in the United States points to adult obesity as a pandemic on a scale that, you know, beggars the, the pandemics that the CDC was set up to to address polio and typhoid and directly connects automobile dependency and the obesity associated with spending too much time in your car and not enough time walking uh, with that with 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 you know heart with with the heart disease and the uh, the diabetes associated with adult obesity what these are are huge externalities that float back to the question of how do we make cars safer for people to drive? We put brakes on them. Putting brakes on cars, you know, makes it 
makes it uh, more uh, makes it easier for us to rationalize using cars as a primary mode of transportation, which at the end of the day, after a 70-year experiment in abandoning human habitat construction and building automobile habitat construction, as maybe having externalities that we didn't see. So I mean, I think it's likely that our understanding of fluoride right now doesn't prevent that. But are we, how likely is it that we are examining the full suite of potential externalities that come from this? And I guess that's, that's, that's what I'd like to put out there. And I mean, we're mixing our metaphors like mad people here. But the reality is um, it comes down to a question of precautionary principles and how much have these um, studies, these sort of like meta studies that have looked at all of the information, really explored questions of externality? So I think, um, so one thing that is true of anything is that, I mean, there are an infinite number of variables in the world and uh, an infinite number of variables essentially affecting, affecting health and it's very difficult to um, I mean, the field of medicine is very difficult because, you know, the body as a system has, you know, millions of variables. And so um, the difficulty in the science around medicine is doing our best to isolate those variables and the best to measure the relevant outcomes. Um, and I think that if there were, you know, a large number of significantly adverse events occurring from fluoride, that likely would have borne itself out in the medical literature to this point. However, I mean, your point is well taken. You could make the argument that if people have better teeth, they're going to eat more and get, you know, and become more obese. But I mean, again, you, you could, st but, but, but to actually draw, but to actually draw the connection, therefore, between more fluoride and obesity, I mean, you'd have to actually see that connection because there could be a lot of other reasons why people in a certain area uh, would, be, be, no. would be becoming obese. No. Forgive me, what I was drawing the, the connection between was we put brakes on cars. So we continually think that cars are a good way to get around. If we had never put brakes on cars, we maybe would have said, this isn't a good way to get around. Let's organize our living arrangement differently. I mean, I'm using your metaphor, and I think we're, we're mixing our metaphors crazily here. <laughs> okay. So I apologize. I mean, I guess it's just a question of, my question just gets back to externalities. Like, do we understand? We're looking at, we are trying to isolate variables. But you know what we're talking about here are problems of organized complexity that are you know difficult to pull out when we're when we're using statistical analysis. And I would agree with you, and I would say that the um, the difficulty is that the um, not fluoridating water, the decision to stop fluoridating water, uh, could have just as many unintended consequences that. Uh, as as the decision to fluoridate, and the point being that we don't know anything about what any of those are, but based on what we do know, the benefits outweigh the risks, and that's essentially what the, that's the way that people make decisions every day is based on what we do know. Do the benefits outweigh the risks, and that's you know, and that's how people go about making decisions every day. And so my argument is that you know, based on based on the medical literature and based on um, you know medical ethics, that this would be uh, you know uh, an intervention that would be justified on a population level. Oh, thank you. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on that note, I'm, I'm awfully glad that we don't put fluoride on cars and hope it transfers, you know, because that would be a little difficult, but uh, um, I'm not quite sure how that got in there, but that's okay. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the capability of coming back and asking another question from a comment that we've heard that we've already questioned on. So I have a question about something that was said earlier talking about saliva and that you will be able to get the fluoride bathing the teeth from your saliva. Uh, how does that happen? Um, I don't know the precise kind of molecular mechanisms, not to be facetious at all. No, no. I, um, but essentially, I think that, um, yeah, the, the fluoride is absorbed systemically and then secreted in your saliva. And that's what I was looking for, if that's yeah. the case. Yes, that's, that's my understanding. Um, so it is absorbed by your body and then given off. So we could assume that there's fluoride in the sweat and, and the, all of those sorts of things at the same time. Is that correct? Um, I don't know that for sure. Okay. I, my, I would, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say possibly. But I mean, I don't know that for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman McLeod. Thank you. Um, I wanted to get back to the question of um, 
how much fluoride is being ingested. Um, and it, it would seem to me that little people, children and infants, need less fluoride than adults or can tolerate less fluoride or is less, defect, less effective. And I, I guess that's part of my question. But um, as how much water do we have to drink before we get to a toxic level of fluoride? Do you know the answer to that? So in terms of you know, fluoride toxicity where you're, you're going to see, you know, serious adverse events from fluoride, you know, beyond cosmetic concerns. I'm not sure, A, if that level exists or B, what it is. Um, in terms of uh, controlling the dose of fluoride, so you could, you could make the argument that, you know, smaller people also probably drink less water. Yeah. Um, the argument that I would make about dosage is actually one that not fluoridating the water does not give you any more control over dosage than fluoridating it does. Because, I mean, essentially there is fluoride that naturally occurs in the water. It's been stated it varies based on the season. And in fact, I think you'd have a much more difficult time exactly knowing how much fluoride was going into your body if the dosage was, if the, the uh, concentration of fluoride in the water was uncontrolled. Because on any given day, you'd have absolutely no idea how much fluoride is in the water. And um, so really, if, if, if it's a concern, if, if the judgment is that fluoride is a medication and not, you know, just a naturally occurring substance that we want to alter the levels of, then if you're, if you're, if you're approaching the policy from that perspective, then the ethical thing to do would be to actually pay money to remove all of the fluoride from the water so that people would know exactly how much they're getting. But that on a population level would probably not be very good for the health of anybody. And it's interesting because the original studies that talk about where, where fluoride comes from come from they came from I think Colorado, and the the dosage of uh, the sorry the concentration of fluoride in the water there was three to four parts per million or something quite high, and the reason a dentist first noticed it was because people yeah people were getting fluorosis at that high level. But it's interesting then because if you went to those people and then it's kind of the, the, the reverse of the argument that you, that you see here because you go to those people and say, well, they're saying, hey, we're getting fluorosis the same way that people here are saying, hey, we get cavities. And so then they say, well, maybe we should reduce the levels of fluoride in our water so that people don't get fluorosis. But then the other people who didn't have fluorosis will say, well, then we're going to develop cavities. And that's, again, the reverse. People here are saying, well, hey, then we're going to get fluorosis. And so, you know, it, it's something that naturally occurs in the water. And so what studies have shown us is that there's a level which we can optimize in terms of cavities versus fluorosis. And so, I mean, if you had a community that had, you know, that had a bunch of fluoride in the water that was naturally occurring, and then, you know, the, the decision to actually bring fluoride down ethically would probably be very similar to the decision that we're looking at today in terms of optimizing the dose of fluoride in the water. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Alderman DeMond. When you refer to uh, ethics, where does the burden of proof lie? Upon those that advocate the activity or those who, will be, who oppose it based on those principles? I think it lies with both. I think. Um, you know, I, th I think essentially it's important that people doing the science are ethical about the way that's conducted. So it's very, for example, if there were to be a uh, faculty of medicine committee that was appointed to look at this issue, it's the, the, the um, burden of ethical responsibility lies on them to do the best job that they can with the training that they have to arrive at the answer that's closest to the truth. And then it's the responsibility of the policymakers to take that and weigh it against everything else, including public opinion, including cost, including everything else, and come to a decision. And I don't think you can, you can um, rest responsibility on one party or the other. I think everybody has the, everybody especially involved in, uh, um, in public institutions has the responsibility to behave ethically in all aspects of what they do. And this, and this is, again, like everything, most things in our society, this is kind of multifactorial. And so everybody has the responsibility. OK. So once the activity is done, per se, fluorides in the water, does the burden of proof 
lie with those who advocate removing it or those that that have it in to continue to prove that this is the right quantity, that it is still doing what it's intended to do, or the reverse. So I think it's important for, I mean, in general, in a democracy, I think it's important for everybody to advocate for what they believe. Oh, of course, of and, course. And, and this is just your opinion. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just looking for your opinion. You're, you're, you're a researcher. You, you, you've commented on the ethics. And I'm just wondering, from your point of view, where does that burden of proof lie? Does it lie with people that, with, with the group that says it should be there, it's there, we got to continue having it there, and these are the reasons? Or now that it's in there, does do they get to relax somewhat and wait for the other side to say, no, these are the reasons it has to come out. So um, the, uh, so I'd like to clarify quickly, just I'm not a researcher, just for the sake of- Oh, I apologize. Of just, just, no, no, that's okay, just, just for the sake of clarity. Um, and what I was, I guess the, what I was getting to with the whole everybody needs to advocate for themselves in a democracy was not to kind of brush the question off, it was really to say that really it's up to everybody to be, um, cognizant of kind of our ongoing, you know, th what, what do we take for granted in our society that may or may not be the right thing. There's tons of things that we do that we do now that might be the right, maybe it's wrong to have cars. I mean, you know, you know, like that, that kind of thing. But I, th I think it's, I, I think it's absolutely, it's absolutely important that everybody remain vigilant. And I would argue that scientists are often, the, the whole idea behind science is to be critical of what's already known. I mean, if you can, if you can do a very, very well-designed study that says, hey, you know, the truth of what we thought before is not true, it's important to be looked at. I mean, that, and I mean, to bring back to the example of smoking in the 1950s, I mean, if we hadn't, if someone hadn't said, hey, like, you know, maybe smoking's a bad thing, maybe it's causing these cancers, then, then nothing would have happened. Um, and if, if, and again, if policymakers, if people hadn't listened to that, I mean, who knows where we'd be today. But, so I think it lies with both parties. And I, I would argue that, um, again, in this situation, it's not even necessarily, I mean, it, it's difficult to say black and white kind of fluoride or no fluoride because, again, fluoride occurs naturally in the water, so it's 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 a level issue, and I think that is gets a little bit lost in the debate. People are saying like, hey, like, you know, we don't want fluoridation. You say, well, the normal level is 0.3 or 0.4, so we're adding 0.3 or 0.4 to that and creating 0.7. I understand. Not, and so, I mean, uh, your point is well taken, but I think the responsibility lies with everybody, and I think you can't, especially, yeah, I mean, if you, if you advocate for having it at a level of 0.7, and new data comes out that is strong data and says, hey, that's not good, then I think most, especially the medical and dental community would be, you know, the first people to say, hey, whoa, let, let's take a look at this again and, and figure out what's going on. Thank you. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm enjoying this discussion. This is very healthy discussion and something that we need to do on a regular basis. Um, I, I don't, I, I can't agree with your car brake um, analogy, because if we didn't have brakes, I think we would have mayhem. Maybe uh, that's what my colleague to my left would like. But the, uh, my, my question is about the ethics of delivering a substance through the water supply. And that seems to be often where this discussion comes down, is water is necessary for life. We've got um, other, I mean, the reference to salt or milk or fortified cereals comes up, but people do have choice with that. Um, but if water is such a good delivery system for certain substances, um, we've been hearing a lot about vitamin D, specifically Canadians and their lack of sunlight. Should we be looking at other and I'm not being facetious, I'm asking that question. I'm wondering why we stopped at this substance and not moved on to others as a delivery method for things that we all need. I think some of the, um, I mean, your point is well taken. Um, I think some of the, uh, the ethical issues regarding that is, again, it just, it just goes back to the fact that, you know, fluoride is, fluoride is in our water, fluoride is in every, fluoride is in all the food that we, eat it's and everything that we drink fluoride is everywhere and it, it, we're taught we're talking about again we're talking about having the um uh, about keeping the level keeping you know mm -hmm. agreeing upon a level 
that provides the most benefit with the least harm. And again, like I would say, there's communities that have way more, more fluoride than they're supposed to. I know, but we're intervening in that. So we're taking action that's separate from providing safe, clean drinking water. So there, there is, it's a question that we need to ask ourselves on a regular basis. The things that we decided were fine and ethical in the 50s um, are very, I mean, our, our version and vision of ethics is very different. So these are important questions to be asking ourselves. Is there a different way of doing it? Um, you said that it's likely, very likely, that, um, that fluoride is helpful. And yet, 10 years ago, it was very likely that much higher concentrations was helpful. And yet we've, we've learned from that because we asked the, the, these same questions. And the same questions are being asked with substances that Health Canada has deemed safe. Um, it takes a lot longer to get something out of the water. Um, Lindview Ridge is, we allowed single family development in Lindview Ridge because our previous knowledge of safe levels of lead changed. And then we realized we allowed a community that has to be completely removed. So we're always learning. Um, and I think that's the purpose of today's discussion. So um, thank you for being here today. Mark. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in all this debate, I've, I've, I've rather forgotten your name. Nick. Okay, well, Dr. Nick is what I'll call you. <laughs> um, because I, I think you've earned that title, Doctor. So, and I really want to thank you for, for contributing today's debate. Now, as I understand it, there's a couple of different types of fluoride available to add to the water. Are you aware of which kind we're using here in the city of Calgary? Uh, no, I'm not sure which additive we're using. I think the, the issue of concern or interest in that discussion would essentially be, I mean, fluoride itself is an ion. So whenever you have uh, fluoride added to, fluoride would initially, I think, be a solid and it would be added to, added to the water and then it would dissociate from whatever that ion was bound to. So for example, in sodium fluoride, it would be sodium. Mm -hmm. uh, that the uh, fluoride was bound to. And so fluoride itself in solution, uh, should the, the fluoride ion exists in isolation and wouldn't necessarily, um, the ion is independent there, therefore of what it was bound to. But in terms of what we use to, what, what, what compound the fluoride is a part of when it's added, I'm not sure. So in terms of, I guess, the question would be what additionally apart from fluoride is being added to our water. I do know that there are six or seven separate uh, ways that it can be done. And mm -hmm. so I'd imagine that any way that has been chosen would likely um, have been deemed to be, you know, the safest, most beneficial, cheapest, what have you. Um, and that, uh, I mean, fluoride, again, it's in the water naturally and it would come in a compound from a rock initially, uh, you know, for, so for sodium fluoride or fluorosilicate or what, 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 whatever, so. Okay, well, I'll tell you, because the one that we're using is hydrofluorosilic acid. And as I understand it, it is a, basically, it's a byproduct from the fertilizing industry. Would, would you agree? Or have you heard this? I haven't heard this. And um, again, I mean, and for example, so that, you know, the, the initial kind of visceral response for most people when they hear something like that is, well, that sounds kind of, kind of scary. But I mean, really, um, you know, we're talking about concentrations here. So, you know, we're talking about, again, one part per million. And and an acid is really only an acid depending on its concentration. So, I mean, if you have essentially, if you look at the, you know, the pH of water, it would essentially be unchanged by the addition of that small quantity of acid. And so, I mean, it, 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 is, it, is, it is an issue of quantities. And so it's, it's to say that we're, you know, we're ingesting all of this horrible acid, I mean, you really have to look at, you know, proportions. Right, it's seven parts per million. Point seven. Oh, sorry, point seven. Uh, as you were, that's obviously a huge difference. That the acid part of it doesn't scare me so much as the method in which this is collected, because it is essentially um, collected from the scrubbers of the smokestacks in creating fertilizer. That's partly that 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 concerns me. And there is, as you say, there's six or seven different types of of um, of uh, fluoride available and 
you also suggested that there is a variety of different rationales as to why we would select X versus Y, uh, cost being one of them and, and safety another. But if we're talking about an ethical perspective and we don't know exactly how this fluoride got to us, how it's going to affect us in the long term, I'm not necessarily talking about the 10 years or 15 years or what it's doing to our teeth, but what is it doing to our bodies over time for a million, 100,000 people? My responsibility as one of the elected officials of this is to look after the safety and security of that population, whether or not there, there may be an ancillary benefit to, to fluoridating water, does it create harm? And if it does, and if you can't opt out of it because it's in your water, which no one can get out of, then we have an ethical problem here that cannot be justified based on some of the, the, the comments that you've had with regards to reduction of cavities. In my view, this is the, the ethical part comes from you can't opt out. You are basically, you're all in or you're all out. So uh, my question now then is if we don't know what kinds of fluorides available, how can we make this decision for 1.1 million people? And how would you make, help us to make that decision solely on the basis that the studies that you've, you've read tell us that it's not likely to cause harm. So I think, um, and you know, that's, that's absolutely a, a very good point. Um, so I think there's a number of points to be made about that. Uh, the first is that I would say, yeah, if people are taking compounds off smokestacks and dropping it into water, that would be a problem. I would hope that that's not actually the process that occurs. Um, but again, I mean, the issue is that when it comes to unknowns, um, it's always it's always assumed that um, that essentially, if you are adding this small amount of substance to a water, for all that we know, that could be doing like the the human the the, the human body is such an infinite, infinitely variable system that we have absolutely no idea what the effects of that tiny amount of chemical are. But they could just as likely to be be good as be bad. And, you know, and, and, and the point being, I mean, it's an organic compound and you have absolutely no idea of saying, you know, what, what if we, what if you took it out and you found, you know, people got more cancer? I mean, there's no way of knowing one way or the other. And, um, you know, the other argument I would make is that if there were, you know, um, significant um, negative uh, health outcomes from the compound that fluoride is a part of, um, we'd probably see it in the long term. We'd probably see all kinds of these, uh, you know, we'd see a statistically significant large number of cancers in populations that have fluoridated water, and that just hasn't been seen, and that just hasn't been borne out in the literature. And so, but but I mean, if, if, if that was the case, initially, yeah, initially you'd say, okay, well, I mean, we're seeing lots of cancers here in all these fluoridated areas, and it's statistically significant, and the studies done are good studies, and, you know, let's, you know, let's take it out or, but I mean, but that's not the case. And if that was the case, then, you know, the public health physicians would be coming to you and saying, let's get the fluoride out of the water. It's causing cancer. But that's not what's happening. That's not what the literature has shown us. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no further questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Etchers, for your time. Next speaker on my list is Jeanette Boyd. Hello, my name is Jeanette Boyd. Thanks so much for having us all here today. Some great information. I'm learning a lot here today. Incredible brains and minds and, and great insights. Um, I am for fluoride, uh, but I think one of our biggest issues is education. Um, my children were all born in Vancouver and they had no fluoride in Vancouver. So yes, we did have to give the fluoride drops as people have talked about here today. It had to be done on a daily basis. When my second child was born, she was 12 months old, I came home to Calgary to visit my parents. I ran out of fluoride drops, so I went to the pharmacy. 
when I went to the pharmacy, the pharmacist gave me such a blast because I was doing something so terrible to my daughter by giving her fluoride drops that I stopped giving her fluoride drops. This pharmacist did not know that I was living in a province that had no fluoride in the water. I was a young mom. There is no literature given to moms, at least there wasn't at the time when I had children, as to oral care for your child. Six months after I got home, NBC, I held my 18-month-old daughter as she passed out screaming in pain due to rotten teeth. She went for four years without front teeth because I did not give her her fluoride drops because of a conflict of two provinces and no education. One thing people don't seem to realize, and I'm surprised it wasn't mentioned earlier today um, from some of the physicians and the dentists, is when children's teeth first are formed and first come out of their gums, you can literally take your fingernail and erode it to nothing. They have no protection on their teeth. That's why it's a necessity that they have fluoride. Putting it in the water, mass medication, is the best way to go. That way it's available for every single one. When Mr. Mead had mentioned that, you know, he's working with the homeless and, 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 uh, and the p working poor, you know, I was a single mom for, of three kids for years. And of course, you're not hearing them talk about fluoride as an issue here in Calgary, because right now it's not an issue. They are getting the fluoride. But I can guarantee you, if you take the fluoride out of this water, Mr. Mead is going to hear quite a bit coming from these poor people while their children's teeth are literally rotting out of their mouth. Who's going to give the parents the education? Who's going to ensure that our children have healthy teeth. The only people that will benefit by taking fluoride out of the water are dentists. They will be getting a lot, a lot of work. So I ask you guys, think about it before you make a decision, what the ramifications are going to be. Saving yourself 750000 a year, that's peanuts as to what it's going to cost parents in this city to keep up with their children's teeth. I am 43 years old, born and raised Calgarian, zero cavities, thanks to the water in Calgary. Thank you so much. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Bryn. Next speaker on my list is Dennis Stefani. Dennis Stefani. Okay, thanks for sharing that with us. <laughs> I'll, I'll go to the next. I'll go to the next speaker, Yvonne Sherman. 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 Okay. Uh, Sheila Tuminsky. <laughs> Sheila Tuminsky. You're Sheila. <laughs> Are you Dennis? I am Dennis. Okay. Sorry about the bathroom. We know where you were. We won't go there. <laughs> Do you have some slides? So th thanks very much. Um, my, my name is uh, Dennis Stefani, and I'm with the Environmental uh, Public Health Program uh, here in Calgary. And I'm here to talk about the safety of uh, hydrofluorosilic acid, which is the fluoride product uh, being used, uh, uh, being added to the Cal Calgary drinking water supply. Uh, the manufacturer of this product um, is one of four companies in North America listed by the American Water Works uh, uh, Association as conforming to standard B703, which is for quality assurance of the purity of the product. Uh, uh, being used. Uh, 
and be manufactured and sold. Now, when hydrofluorosilic acid is added uh, to uh, drinking water, it disassociates completely into fluoride ions and hydrated silica. Hydrated silica is a soluble form of silica and is non-toxic. The uh, our product specifications uh, by, the, by the manufacturer for this product are for hydrofluorosilic acid at 25 percent, a plus or minus 2 percent, water 75 percent, hydrofluoric acid one, less than 1 percent, and some trace impurities uh, to a 0.02 percent uh, maximum. Uh, the product is uh, certified in accordance with the American National Standards Institute and the National Sanitation Foundation to standard 60 for drinking water chemicals and for health effects, which is a standard to ensure public health protection for additives that are added to water and also present in the finished drinking water. Now the next slide I'm going to show you is the analytical breakdown of trace contaminants in the product received by the City of Calgary prior to addition to the drinking water. Now this, uh, this table shows the concentrations in the center column of impurities in the product received by the City. The right column shows uh, Health Canada acceptable uh, drinking water guidelines for, for those substances. Now in the concentrated product, prior to dilution, 16 of the 18 uh, substances are already below uh, guideline standards. The remaining two substances are also well below the Health Canada guideline when the product is added to the drinking water. Now during a water treatment, approximately 430 grams of this product are added per 1 million liters of water, resulting in a volumetric dilution of 3 million times. Now, so that means that concentrations that you saw in the previous table must be diluted by 3 million times for their final concentration in the finished uh, Calgary uh, drinking water supply. And the next slide shows these concentrations. And as you can see by all those zeros in the center column, the final concentrations of these impurities in Calgary drinking water after dilution ranges from 170,000 to over 1 million times less than the Health Canada and drinking water quality guidelines. So these are huge dilutions. So what are the implications then of this product uh, to public health, public health and safety? Well, really there are none. Um, uh, I want to emphasize that there are, there are no health concerns based on the extremely low concentrations present in the final drinking water that are 170,000 times at the minimum to over a million times um, in, in, in the uh, lower than the Canadian drinking water quality guidelines. So I think this certainly gives a level of confidence of the safety of that water. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? No questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stefani. Next uh, presenter is. Ted Wynilowitz. I hope I got that right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I tend to skip over it. I'll call you right after him. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Ted Wynilowitz. Uh, I'm a citizen of uh, Calgary since uh, 1975. Uh, I've uh, the points that I made have been made, so I'm going to certainly honour uh, the request made and, and be as brief as I can be. At any rate, public, participa uh, par public participation plays an important role in a democracy, and I'm pleased to stand before you to uh, offer 
my position and, and explain why I support the removal of fluoride uh, from city water. Uh, I'll go briefly about it uh, because it's been mentioned. The first one was uh, the 1991-2001 um, Centers of Disease Control Prevention has acknowledged the mechanism of fluoride's benefits are mainly topical and, and not systemic. Uh, the second point also mentioned, once fluoride is put in the water, it is impossible to control the dose that each person receives. And uh, the third point is that uh, fluoridation is, an uneth is unethical because individuals are not asked for their informed consent prior to medication. Uh, this, uh, this is a standard practice, practice for all medication and one of the key reasons why most of Western Europe has ruled against fluoridation. So for those three uh, out of many different reasons, uh, I oppose the fluoridation. I am not a scientist, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, th that sh does not preclude us from having an opinion. Uh, one of the uh, concerns uh, that I have is that uh, it you know, there is an argument that's very absolute, and uh, as uh, Vaclav Havel once said, uh, follow those who seek the truth, but run from those who have found it. And so I think that we have to be cautious in the direction that we take and have a debate where, um, you know, all uh, positions are listened to, but with a degree of skepticism. So to conclude, uh, choice on this matter is important from my viewpoint. Those who wish to continue to use fluoride have that right. And there could be different ways of dispensing that. There could be fluoride vouchers or whatever. But uh, at the same time, I think that the uh, rights of those who oppose fluoridation should be uh, respected as well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Um, Sheila Tominsky. Sorry for forgetting about you. Thank you very much and good afternoon. My name is Sheila Tominsky and I am a public health dietitian and manager of population and public health nutrition in Alberta Health Services. I would like to voice my support for our public water fluoridation in the City of Calgary. Fluoride is a nutrient. This means that its consumption is essential for optimal health. This is recognized, it's recognized as a nutrient by every credible health and scientific body around the world, including Health Canada, the Institute of Medicine and the Centre for Disease Control. These organizations and others have established recommendations for requirements. Fluoride's main role is in the prevention of tooth decay. Having healthy teeth is an important part of overall health, so protecting our teeth from decay contributes to our health and well-being. There is a limited amount of fluoride available naturally in our food and water, not enough to meet those requirements. By adding fluoride to our water, we ensure that we have enough fluoride to protect our teeth from decay. Major health bodies around the world have undertaken extensive and exhaustive reviews of thousands of studies around the safety and effectiveness of water fluoridation, and the results are clear and consistent. In every single case, no adverse effects to human health were found, and there's with moderate levels of consumption. I'd also like to say that I'm the mother of four children who are grown up, and as someone who works in the field of nutrition and is familiar with the studies, my children have always drank fluoridated water tap water. As a mother, I would never have done anything to put my children in harm's way. So I have always had the full confidence in the research and studies to provide my kids with tap water. And I would also like to just add to <laughs> the dialogue here around the count, none of my kids have any dental caries. All of my kids have good strong teeth and none of them have any signs of fluorosis. In conclusion, fluoride is an essential part of a healthy diet. The jury is in. Fluorid water fluoridation, as carried out in Calgary, is the safest and the most effective way of ensuring that all of our citizens get enough fluoride. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any questions? Seeing none, thanks for your presentation. The next speaker I have is Dr. Bob Dixon. I was going to say, you don't look like a Bob. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I'm representing Dr. Bob uh, Dixon, who is unfortunately absent this week, and my name is Susanna Niederer. Thank you for the opportunity, so I'm reading his presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to present before the UND committee and in essence to city council. My profound apologies for not attending in person. At this moment, I'm most likely swimming under the unfluoridated waterfall in our eco reserve in Costa Rica. However, you can be certain the committee and the process will be close to my mind and heart. I expect there will be many passionate presenters on both sides of this contentious debate. I can assure you that none have researched and poured through the literature and press to the extent that Dr. Beck and I have. I want to say that I believe in fluoride. It is just that we are using it absolutely wrong and dangerously. Fluoride, as admitted by most of the world, including the often quoted Center for Disease Control, works only topically. The humorous analogy often repeated is that we don't swallow our sunscreen, so we shouldn't swallow fluoride either, particularly with all the inherent problems and associated dangers. You will likely hear a lot from proponents today about the safety of fluoridation. I fail to understand how ingesting one of the most toxic substances on the planet without control of dose and without monitoring or follow-up could ever be considered safe. This defies the oath I have taken as a physician to do no harm to patients and humankind. We have a small amount of natural calcium fluoride in our bow and elbow river water supplies, and many of us, including me, brush with pharmaceutical grade sodium fluoride. Hydrofluorocycillus acid is scrubbed out the industrial smokestacks of the fertilizer and aluminum industries. Then, because it is so toxic and volatile, it is rigidly controlled and not allowed to be disposed of in our streams, rivers, lakes, oceans, air, or land. The only place that industry has been allowed to dispose of this volatile waste, aside from toxic waste dumps, is in our otherwise pristine drinking water. Highly level medical officials in Alberta Health Service have told me that they don't have to talk about dose or mass medication as fluoride is not a medication. Well, it does not naturally occur in the body and is, it is not essentially to bodily functions. And the Supreme Court of Canada in 1958 ruled that fluoride is indeed a medication. Therefore, any ethical physician is bound to obtain informed consent, control dose, monitor effects, be vigilant for side effects, and follow up regularly. None, I repeat, none of these are done by the City of Calgary, Alberta Health Services, or Health Canada. A senior health official also was quoted on CBC National Radio recently in saying there is no medical justification for MDs to tell patients not to take fluoride. That statement simply defies common sense, respect, responsibility, good medicine and the precautionary principles which say if you are uncertain, don't do it. Harm is most certainly being done slowly and indiciously to the average citizen, but take a moment to think about those who cannot vote or often don't have a voice of their own, infants and small children, the elderly, thyroid and kidney patients, the poor. This brings up another adage incessantly repeated, fluoridation is good for the poor. That is far from the truth. Very good studies show that it's poverty, not fluoridation, that makes it or breaks it for poor kids. There is no difference in parallel studies in groups of disadvantaged kids who are either fluoridated or not. And many graphs and studies from long-term surveillance verify that it is better dental care, more brushing and flossing, fluoridated toothpaste, better diet with increased levels of calcium, and other essential nutritions that are causing the decline of dental decay in our world. The major non-fluoridated regions and countries have the same decline in cavities as the major fluoridated areas such as, uh, as Alberta and the USA. Some quick points to finish. British Columbia and Europe are 95% and 98% unfluoridated. Their teeth are as good as ours in 75% fluoridated Alberta. A PhD Nobel 
laureate recently called fraudation the biggest fraud ever propagated against society. 7,000 scientists from the EPA have petitioned the US Congress to put a moratorium on fluoridation. 3,300 professionals worldwide have signed on to a campaign to hold fluoridation. I, I hate to break in on you, but your five minutes is up. Could you get a con concluding comment? So just... as a statement, please have the political courage to remove this volatile toxin from our drinking water. Thank you. On behalf of Dr. Bob Dixon. Is there any questions? If, can we get copies of your presentation? I have my presentation, yes. Could you maybe get a, give it to the clerk so we could copy it? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no questions. Uh, the next presenter is... That's me. Susanna Niederer? Yes, that's me. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Me again. But I didn't have to look very far. <laughs> My name is Susanna Niederer. I'm not a medical expert, not a scientist, not a chemist, but an entrepreneur and a concerned citizen. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present before you. I'm a new Calgarian and moved from Switzerland almost one and a half years ago. When I learned that Calgary is still fluoridated, the public drinking water, I was more than surprised that such an outdated and politically potentially harmful practice is still in use. Switzerland is a country with one of the highest standards of living, with one of the best educational and healthcare systems, and very important, Switzerland's water is not fluoridated. Only Basel, only Basel the only city in Switzerland, fluoridated its water in the past from 1962 to 2003. Switzerland uses salt fluoridation and leaves it up to the individual to use salt with or without fluoride. So also offers toothpaste with or without fluoride. In Switzerland, fluoride is regarded as intervention into personal freedom. I believe that's a personal uh, attribute that is also very dear uh, to Canadians and to North Americans in general. Tobias Studer, a board member of Basel's Health and Social Commission said, it is of most importance that the individual has the freedom to choose the appropriate prophylaxis. The main reason why the water fluoridation was stopped in the city of Basel in 2003, which was the only city in Switzerland, uh, are reported as lack of evidence that water fluoridation is more effective than salt fluoridation in re reducing tooth decay. The second point, the inefficiency, wastefulness of water fluoridation, and Swiss like to be very efficient. The Health Commission President Jörg Merz stated, only a minimal part of so-called drinking water is used for drinking and cooking. More than 99% of the water is not drinking water, but is used for washing cars, cleaning stairs, showering, to pour on flowers, and so on. Fluoride is poison that loads unnecessary our rivers and environment. Supported by Dr. Studer, the fluoridation of water had a minimal efficiency as most of the fluor was spoiled. The Health Commission recommended to stop water fluoridation and to offer the individual's fluoridation salt. A Basel City Parliament acknowledged the facts and stopped the city water fluoridation in 2003. Uh, the European views on fluoridation. Concerns about the medical ethics of water fluoridation were voiced quite strongly by the recent Nobel Prize recipient for medicine, Dr. Arvid Carlsson of Sweden. Carlsson, who helped lead the successful campaign to stop water fluoridation in Sweden, argued that public water supplies they are not an appropriate vehicle with which to deliver pharmacologically active drugs to the entire population. He underlined, I'm quite convinced that water fluoridation is a not too distant future, will be consigned to medical history. The addition to drugs to the drinking water means exactly the opposite of an individualized therapy. Not only is that the dose cannot be at adapted to individual requirements, it is, in addition, based on completely irre irrelevant factor, namely consumption of drinking water, which varies greatly between individual and is, moreover, very poorly surveyed. 
Carlson views are quite similar to those recently expressed by various European health authorities, for example, the Water Authority in Belgium. It is the fundamental position of the drinking water sector that it is not its task to deliver medicinal treatment to people. This is the sole responsibility of health services. According to the uh, Chief Water Authority in Luxembourg, in our views, the drinking water isn't a suitable way for medical treatments and that people needing a, an addition of fluoride can be decided by their own to use the most appropriate way. And Germany's government was saying, the augmentation of the Federal Ministry of Health against a general permission of fluoridation of drinking water is the problematic nature of compulsory medication. And according to the Head of Environment Protection in France, fluoride chemicals are not included in the list of chemicals for drinking water treatment. This is due to ethical as well as medical considerations. Please provide us with fluoride-free drinking water. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any questions, Alderman Farrell? Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your last name. Susanna Niederer. Niederer? Niederer, yeah. Thank you. Um, so you're not a health professional. No. You have some experience in the discussion that has been occurring in Europe. And when did this change? Because much of Europe did fluoridate, or, or am I in? Absolutely. They did. And so when did this change of, of process um, happen? When did it, when did, and what precipitated it? I'm curious about yeah. that. So, I mean, I cannot talk for all the countries. For Switzerland, as I said, it was only uh, Basel which fluoridated its water. And all the other countries, they started fluoridating uh, in, in the 50s. But then many stopped after 20, 30 years because it was just not proven. The, the benefits were not sort of strong enough uh, that it really prevents uh, the, the health of the dental health because it can be really sub, uh, uh, substituted and it also um, minimizes the individual right of the person to choose or not to choose. And so this is mostly Western Europe where this is occurring, um, this change of process or is it um, Eastern Europe, there are a lot of countries in East, Eastern Europe which okay. don't fluoridate uh, as well, even some North African countries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is certainly a strong trend. And so are those countries monitoring the effects? Very strongly. I mean, uh, Basel, they did uh, extensive research with other cities in Switzerland, like Zurich never fluoridated its water. So they didn't see any better dental um, uh, health in the in the, the uh, people, children, and older people than in Basel. So there was not uh, efficient evidence to prove that fluoridation is necessary of the border. Okay. Thank you for your presentation today. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Daniela Andre. Oh, sorry. Sorry, there is a question for you. You, that was a late light. I think it's just on the outside. You have trouble seeing it. <laughs> well, I don't go by what's there. I go by what's here. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate that. Um, you said that um, Basil started, stopped fluoridating the water because there was no... Um, I, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but no, no, the fluoride was shown not to be effective for the exactly the lack of evidence that water fluoridation uh -huh. was effective. So, um, and you also said that um, after they took it out, there was no change in the dental decay rate. Uh, correct. Right, but they did add it to the salt for the city. Yeah, I was in other cities of Switzerland. We, Switzerland adds it to the salt, but there is a fluoridated salt and salt that is not fluoridated. So I as an individual can choose. I see, but that may explain why there was no change in the dental decay rate. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, thanks. Our next speaker is Daniela Andre.
Hello everyone. I uh, salute the entire ad audience. Um, Could you move Mr. closer Chair? to the mic? Could Sorry. You move I salute the, the entire audience. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Alderman, committee, and fellow citizens. I thank everyone for being here, for uh, taking the passion, the care, the effort, and the time to put something forward that interests all of us, present and not present. Uh, I'm a Calgary citizen. I'm not a water, a medical, or legal expert, and I'm not claiming that. I just express my opinion backed by research and my understanding of the research. I let you review, analyze, and draw conclusions. I'm petitioning the Calgary municipality today to stop water fluoridation because, one, numerous studies show that not only is fluoridation ineffective against cavities, but it poses serious health risks, such as altering of the endocrine function, causing dental fluorosis in young children, potentially lowering IQ, increasing risk of bone fractures, and producing overexposure to fluoride in combination with toothpaste, toothpaste, mouth rinse products, and foods. Articles uh, with sources on authors, publications, and studies are attached, and I will provide them to you. Um, a couple of studies um, to continue uh, what the other fellow citizens have brought here. So one, the World Health Organization has compiled a study that shows no difference in tooth decay in, con in countries that uh, use fluoridated water versus countries that use non-fluoridated water. Two, the largest dental survey ever conducted in the United States found virtually no difference in dental decay between children living in fluoridated versus unfluoridated areas. The study was conducted by the National Institute of Dental Research. Three, the American Dental Association and the American Center for Disease Control recommends that infants should not receive fluoridated water for drinking or making baby formula as fluoridated water contains 250 times more fluoride than the mother's milk. Four, professionals are of the opinion that we already take the optimal one milligram of fluoride from pesticide residues, fluoridated foods and beverages, uh, and fluoride air pollution. Uh, five, it's very important to keep in mind that we are taking fluoride in our bodies, not only through drinking the water, but also when we shower and take baths. Uh, from what I read, read, it seems like our body can take up to 1.5 liter of water uh, in a, when taking a bath or a shower. And the third and very important, um, the um, fluoride is evaporating easier than the water. So when we shower or take a bath, we are ingesting concentrated um, uh, a concentrated portion of fluoride, which is not good. So that comes to the fact that basically we absolutely are not controlling how much fluoride we are putting in our bodies through different ways. Skin, inhaling, and also uh, drink, uh, through the drinking water. And seven, you asked about the, um, the quantity of fluoride, which is safe. Nobody knows that, but what we know is that 500 milligrams of fluoride is enough to kill a child. <clears throat> My second point is that it makes no economic sense to spend three, four millions or six millions or more um, when water fluoridation is, is increasingly rejected by communities worldwide. 98% of Western Europe rejected water fluoridation and so have many communities in the United States and Canada. In Canada, only Alberta and parts of Ontario are still fluoridating water. Three, water fluoridation seems illegal to me. 
Water fluoridation is based on the claim of preventing cavities, which is a medical claim. And as such, making these claims instantly and automatically transforms fluoride into a drug. Excuse me, ma'am, uh, your time is up. Can you do a concluding comment? Um, yes, My, the five minutes. You can only get another five minutes if members of committee give yes, it to you. Yes, five minutes, please. Thank no, you. Uh, <laughs> Sorry? They're not giving, nobody's put their light on to give you extra time, so I need a concluding comment that's less than a minute. If you wish, you can leave a copy of your presentation, too. Yes, so um, um, besides what I have presented so far, uh, fluoridating the water um, is violating Canadian laws, medical laws, and human rights. So my kind request is that you do pu uh, pull out uh, research studies so that uh, you can make a, a informed decision for all of, uh, all of us. This is very important. Um, and uh, also, I would like to kindly ask you not to take a decision until uh, <clears throat> the cost is thoroughly assessed, because um, I understand that we had only one engineer who has come with a three, four uh, millions uh, cost. So we need to have a firm number uh, to take a decision. And third, I would really love to be on the panel uh, that um, further discusses the issue on fluoride. And I think I have done my homework to have a point for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thanks for your presentation. <coughs> the next presenter is, I'm not sure if I understand this, Grace Wright or Melinda Museme? Are you a single or a double? Yeah, which one are you? It, was this an either or? Um, it was going to be both of us, now it's one. Okay. Hello, my name is Grace Wright. Um, I work for the Aboriginal Health Program with Alberta Health Services, which is a province wide program committed to the development and implementation of health services to improve the health and wellness capacity and access of services for Aboriginal people residing in Alberta. In 2001, there were almost 20,000 self-identified Aboriginal people living within the city of Calgary. The growth rate of the Aboriginal population in Calgary is the fastest in Canada. If current growth rates continue, the Aboriginal population will nearly triple to 65,000 in 2017. Consistent findings across many studies have indicated that Aboriginal people experience substantially greater mortality and morbidity rates and poor self-rated health compared to the other Albertans. The persistent poor oral health of Alber Aboriginal people is a significant concern by health systems across Canada. Aboriginal populations have three to five times the dental decay rates of other Canadians, and many of the children require hospital care for dental abscesses. The average Aboriginal child in Alberta has more than twice as many decays missing or filled teeth and is twice as likely to have untreated decay compared to the average non-Aboriginal child. First Nations and Inuit individuals recognized by the federal government to have treaty rights are eligible only for limited oral and dental insurance service services. There are a large number of non-registered First Nations people and Métis people residing in Calgary who are not eligible for any benefits from this program. A major concern then is access to oral and dental services, which is severely impacted by lack of insurance as a result of in income inequity. The majority of urban Aboriginal people in Calgary struggle with poverty. In 2006, the median income for Aboriginal people was $18,962, 30% lower than the $27,000 median income for the rest of Canadians. The income gap is $7,083 higher in urban settings. This means urban Aboriginal people have a 50% less median income than other Canadians in urban settings. About a quarter of the population in Canada, usually those with low incomes, go to dentists for little more than emergency care. This is mirrored by the Aboriginal community. 
albeit a much higher rate. And although not due solely to low income, this behavior does raise concerns about access to dental services generally. We know that water fluoridation is beneficial to all. As a measure that is equally accessible to all, fluoridation reaches those in greatest need and at highest risk. Because everyone has easy access to it, water fluoridation is an effective and socially equitable strategy for reducing tooth decay across our communities. There are several causes for the poor oral health of urban Aboriginal people. Today, however, we highlighted the obvious for urban Aboriginal people income inequity, poverty, and lack of access to services. Water fluoridation in the face of lack of access to oral and dental services by Aboriginal people cannot be under underestimated as an effective preventative strategy against the persistent poor oral health of urban ab Aboriginal people residing in Calgary. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? See, Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I put my light on late. Okay. I, I can't resist. Um, yes, there is no question urban Aboriginals are in a desperate state for a whole series of reasons. Um, you're not suggesting that fluoride um, will solve these problems. No, not solve them, but it, it will contribute to um, the dental health of the urban Aboriginal people. And is there any evidence of that? As we're seeing, poverty, um, a lot of the dental decay has something to do with poverty, whether it's nutrition, hygiene, um, a whole myriad of issues associated with poverty. But the cities in the states who have been fluoridating for much, much longer than we have, who are still dealing with a dental health crisis, it's, it's, fluoride isn't the panacea. And I, I find it offensive to think that some people might think it is. So I, as long as we can agree that there's much more work to be done in the issue of poverty than simply fluoridating the water. Oh. We don't just put fluoride in the water and then we're done. No, that was not my suggestion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Alderman uh, Keating, you have a question? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, the statistics, is that today's or in real time sort of, whether I mean today or in the last while? or. Which statistics were you? That you talked about the, the uh, about the oral health of, of uh, urban Aboriginals and how it is. I think you said three times or something along that. Mm -hmm. I believe that's from two thousand and six. Okay, so that happened during fluoridization of water. Mm -hmm. So would there not be a better program to help them rather than just continuing the, the course? Well, there probably are many programs that could help with dental if yeah. they had access to. Um, a dentist regularly that would be beneficial but um, fluoridation in the water is simply one yeah. one positive step so I guess going back to the second part of the motion is um, if we make the decision to remove it and take those funds and put them into a program that is going to help those in most need uh, would that not be better than just leaving it as it is is there a program now that they're planning on doing or is this just well, can, uh, the second part of the motion says look into the fact of taking the monies that is now spent and putting it into a program to help those in most need. That so, would be great. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Judy Johnson. Judy Johnson. Okay, uh, after that is Kevin Taylor. Kevin Taylor, Chris Harper. Uh, good morning, or afternoon actually. <laughs> it was morning when I got here. Uh, my name is Chris Harper, and uh, I'm just standing before you as a citizen, uh, not representing any of the organizations that I work with in the community. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I, I love fluoride. Uh, I have been, I, when I grew up in Ontario in Thunder Bay, we had a fluoridation program at our school where every few weeks we would go line up in the hallway and we would uh, swish it in our mouths and spit it out. And uh, I do have fluorosis of my teeth or what appear to be some of the symptoms of it. So does my sister, so does my brother. My parents do not. Uh, many of my colleagues in my cohort in Thunder Bay uh, do also have the white marks on their teeth. 
And sometimes the perception is, is that I have poor dental health because of that, and that is, that is not true. Uh, I do floss and brush regularly, I always have. My parents uh, instilled those values in us, and so uh, yet I do have a partial gold tooth, which according to the stock market will be very valuable by the time I retire. So, uh, but, I, but I love fluoride, but I love fluoride in the correct dose. When I go to the dentist, my dentist is very, very particular about using those little trays and you can kind of pick the flavors, nasty, nastier, and then, then there's mint, which is the only one that seems, you know, sensible to put in my mouth. And so, you know, my dentist uses the proper dose. I've never been told by my dentist or my medical practitioner, drink lots of tap water, don't drink bottled water, because tap water has fluoride. No dentist or doctor has ever told me that in my life. And so if there are so many benefits from it, I'm curious as to why some of the professionals are not encouraging patients directly to consume municipal water. Why when we go to restaurants, we see an abundance of sparkling water from France or the States uh, to, uh, on the menu. Uh, and you know, municipal water is made to seem sort of dirty and improper. And so, you know, I'm all about the proper dosage. And I'm also, I was also given by God when I was born a, a mind and a body. And, you know, my body tells me when it's not feeling well, but my mind can interpret the environment around me. And there have been the assertion that these are facts, that it is a fact that fluoridated water is, in fact, beneficial for human health. That may very well be true. Uh, but as Dr. Nick uh, pointed out, it may also be equally as likely that it is not. And so, when it comes to my mind, my mind tells me that there's conflicting information. And when I have conflicting information, I'm curious for more facts. And I'm also welcoming a caution because I don't really want to be putting things in my body that I don't understand. And many of us do that anyway. Uh, however, when it comes to water, water is a basic fundamental element for life. I need water to live. We all need water to live. We get water from coffee, from pop, from taps, uh, from little green bottles in the shopping stores and at restaurants. But water is necessary to live. Uh, so there's a lot of conflicting information right now that I'm observing, and, and today proved that even further for myself. Uh, poverty and access to dental care. I think that when it comes to poverty, the, the issue is less about fluoride and water and more about the fact that I think even for people who are not in poverty in Alberta, uh, we do have a very, very high cost to uh, proper and uh, diligent dental care in this province. Uh, and that could have been due to the deregulation of the fee guide, but I think access has created the necessity to uh, mass medicate, perhaps, the population, and I don't think that's good. I think if we want people to have access to proper dental care, they should get that from a dentist and not from their tap, uh, especially when there's conflicting information regarding the merits and the safety and the benefits of what comes out of our tap water. Uh, I also think that it's a little bit contradictory that we extol the values of fluoride and water, while at the same time kids at school follow their glass of water if they even have that, or their bottle of water, uh, with a chaser of Coke or Pepsi. Uh, I think that that's a little bit contradictory. If we really have a vested interest in the health of our kids, we would look at this from the big picture and not simply from the issue of fluoride and water. There's many other ways to prevent cavities, such as br brushing and flossing, not eating too many sugars and whatnot, which, as we discussed today already, are very prevalent in, in our food in our food in North America. Uh, and you know, if fluoride was the solution to that, that would be great. However, I'm not convinced it is. The conflicting information tells me that perhaps there is further investigation that needs to be done. I would also question the role of the city in fluoridation. I do feel sorry that committee as well as council have been given the task of having to decide this. In my opinion, I have, as I stated, a mind and I have a body. My mind is very capable of applying common sense to the information that I see in the world. And many of us have that capability and are privileged to have that. However, I think that the role of health services and the government should be to facilitate understanding so that I can make my own choices for my body in an informed manner, as opposed to simply stating that reports from Europe and the States are good, therefore in Canada, uh, we should put fluoride in our water. Give me facts and allow me to make the decision. Uh, if, you know, that's what I expect from my doctor. I don't expect my government to tell me I need to consume fluoride. I expect my doctor to tell me I need to consume fluoride. And so uh, I see my time is up, Alderman Jones, so I'll yield. If you can do a concluding statement. Sure. I, I just, my concluding statement is that uh, I'm capable of making choices with the right information. My perspective is that government and medical practitioners, their role is to provide me with that information so I can make an informed choice. And frankly, if people want fluoridated water, let's put that in bottles. Because I, I think that water should be clean water and as close to the source as possible should be available to all Calgarians and Albertans. And we can put the other stuff into bottles rather than the other way around, which is what we currently have. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Is there any questions? 
Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee, we are recessed at 345. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. And my next speaker is Bryce Adamson. Bryce Adamson? Oh. <laughs> no, he's right there. Uh, good afternoon, uh, councillors of the uh, City of Calgary. I am here as the past president of the Calgary and District Dental Society. At our January meeting, 140 dentists voted in favor of a motion to uh, write a letter to council, which I have here, and speak to you in person with the opinion that fluoridation should remain. Fluoridation buys time, time to educate, provide dental treatment, and reduce the pain and suffering caused by early childhood decay. I will show you the human cost of this entirely preventable disease and the role fluoridation plays in it. In high, school, in high school, I learned two things. One, I was good at science, and two, I was bad at cards. The periodic table of elements has fluoride on the top right corner, and that is the most reactive element. Fluoride is the anion of fluorine. I'm not particularly good at cards, so when we're playing, I like the games where there's a joker or a wild card because it improves my chances of winning. If the periodic table of elements were a deck of cards, fluoride would be the joker. What defines a true dental emergency? For me, a true dental emergency is a phone call from a, from a parent with a child who is up at night. A child under the age of five who is unable to sleep because of the severe pain caused by one or more severely decayed and now infected teeth. That alone is tragic. But sometimes the tragedy doesn't end there. <clears throat> Consider one or two increasingly tired and frustrated parents. Normally these people are calm, rational, hardworking members of society. But they're growing impatient. They're growing impatient because of the sleepiness and the sleepiness is making them irrational. Irrational enough that a husband would strike his wife. What for? For allowing their child to continue to scream, robbing him of his sleep, making him a fear of losing his job. Irrational enough for the wife of that husband to start putting alcohol in the child's formula or juice in order to allow them to sleep and to avoid yet another beating. Or worse yet, either parent who would pick up an inconsolable child and shake them until they are unresponsive in a fit of frustration and rage. This is not hyperbole. This is a scenario that does and can occur, and it can be prevented by three things, education, care and timely access to it, and fluoridation. Fluoride alone will not prevent tooth decay. Our modern diets are insidiously hard on our teeth. Fluoride slows down tooth decay, and slowing down tooth decay buys us time. In my office, this buys time to educate parents that they should be helping their children brush their teeth until they're the age of 10. It gives me time to watch a small cavity on a young person for six to 12 months to see if the body can heal itself with improved brushing and diet at home. Time for children with multiple cavities to idle patiently on a waiting list for three or four months for hospital time to be treated by a pediatric dentist safely under sedation to fix all of the teeth at once without memory of this ordeal. It gives us time to treat fewer teeth and to treat these teeth more conservatively and thus more ex less expensively. Time is a luxury and one they do not have in Vancouver. Vancouver has never had fluoride, fluoride in their water. My colleagues there cannot wait to see if that small cavity will get better. They must cut sooner and therefore they must cut more often. And too often they must cut deeper, deeper into the child's tooth and deeper into those parents' wallets. I do not need a joker to play cards. <clears throat> I want a joker because it improves my odds of winning. 
You do not need fluoridation to have a safe drinking water supply. You want fluoridation in your water if you put a child's wellness before your own. As a dentist, I feel the real joker here is me. I and my colleagues would be considerably busy within a short five to seven years without fluoridation. That is not why I am here. I am here today, <clears throat> I am here today because I am better at science than I am at cards. Science has shown fluoridation to reduce the impact, cost, and societal pain that is caused by early childhood decay. When I drink Calgary water, I want fluoride in it. <clears throat> I want fluoride in it for my two sons, ages three and two months old. And if you care about doing your part <clears throat> in the prevention of the misery of childhood decay, you'll want fluoride in your city water too. Is that your presentation? That's the end of mine. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions? Alderman DeMont. Um, <clears throat> you, you bring up your Vancouver uh, colleagues when discussing dental decay. We've, we've heard here and seen studies that the dental rate or dental care decay rate in Vancouver and or BC is uh, no major or very little difference in dental decay between a non-fluoridated uh, location and, and us being fluoridated. Do you have any comments with regards to this? Um, I'm here as the man in the trenches, uh, the person who's dealing with uh, uh, decay and, and helping my patients towards better oral health. And as that, I do talk to my colleagues, and one of them, so one of my colleagues is Hasnain Duji. He's a pediatric dentist in Hope, BC, at the major, majority of his population, his patient population being from Vancouver. Um, if I'm allowed to tell a story, he shared with me. Dr. Johnston was once head of the uh, children, the pediatric uh, dental department at Sick Kids in Toronto, and subsequently moved to Vancouver. And when Dr. Johnston first began working, he kind of felt his colleagues were over-treating the patients. He, he wondered why they were intervening um, so early, something he would normally watch to see if it would change or get worse. Um, in Toronto, they were treating in Vancouver. And uh, a year later, he understood why, because the things he did watch blew up on him. Decay just moved more aggressively in Vancouver compared to his experience in Toronto. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, that there were, I can't remember the conference that you were mentioning, 140 voted in favor of keeping fluoride in the water. How many voted against or how many abstained? There were no abstentions. It was unanimous? It was unanimous. It was 140 who were in attendance at that meeting that day. Mm -hmm. uh, the Calgary District Descent Dental Society has approximately 650 members of the 850 that are in Calgary. So that's just a represent representative sample of that day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming out today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing so no other questions. Uh, my next speaker is Jacqueline Van Malsen. Good afternoon, members of Council. My name is Jacqueline Van Melsen, and I'm a dental hygienist with Mosaic Primary Care Network. Primary care networks are groups of family physicians, healthcare professionals, and partners of Alberta Health Services who work together to provide medical care. My role within Mosaic PCN is to improve the oral health of children in East Calgary. We've chosen to focus on East Calgary, recognizing that this population has higher levels of dental disease. At the heart of the issue is the importance that a child's oral health has on their overall health. Dental cavities is a result of a bacterial infection. If cavities are not treated, the infection can spread to other parts of the body, cause fever, pain, and swelling. In severe cases, the infection can enter into the bloodstream and cause sepsis. Though very rare and extreme, complications from dental cavities can be fatal. Every day in Calgary, there are children who cannot pay attention in school, who cannot fall asleep at night because they have tooth pain. Research has linked dental decay in baby teeth with many impacts on a child's overall health, including problems with nutrition, 
speech development, learning, as well as effects on the child's adult teeth. Severe dental decay has been linked with failure to thrive. Early childhood caries has been described as the most common chronic childhood disease. It is more common than asthma, hay fever, and diabetes. In Calgary, the prevalence of dental decay in children between ages one and four is about 11%. In East Calgary, one in every four children experience dental decay before they are five. Most importantly, this disease is largely preventable. Systematic reviews of water fluoridation support its effectiveness and safety to reduce cavities. Systematic reviews look at all of the research, including studies about the benefits, safety, and the possible adverse effects of fluoridation, as well as the quality and the quantity of the literature, with the deliberate intent to eliminate investigator bias and determine best evidence. Systematic reviews reporting on the effectiventness of water fluoridation in prevent Venting cavities look at both the impact on dental decay where water fluoridation has been instituted and where it's been removed. The results show the same thing. The introduction of water fluoridation is strongly associated with an increase in the percentage of cavity-free children by approximately 15%. Another dental index called DMFT is used to describe the prevalence of decay in an individual by looking at the number of decayed, missing, and filled teeth. Again, the results suggest that introduction of water fluoridation is strongly associated with an improvement in DMFT scores. On average, 2.3 fewer teeth are affected according to systematic reviews. Individual studies continue to show that water fluoridation is cost effective. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention reports that for every dollar spent on fluoridation, on average saves $38 in associated dental bills. Over a lifetime, the cost of fluoridation is typically less than the cost of a dental filling. Proponents of removing water fluoridation have suggested alternate methods of delivery for disadvantaged populations. Alternate methods of fluoride supplementation may not mitigate the risk of dental decay as effectively as fluoridation. Literature recommends fluoridation in combination with adjunctive topical fluorides, such as fluoride varnish, for individuals who are at high cavities risk. At-risk populations may fail to utilize alternate methods of fluoride because of barriers including language, economic constraints, and lack of awareness of the importance of preventable oral health care. Historically, compliance with fluoride supplementation is poor. Prior to the introduction of fluoridation in Calgary, fluoride drops were made available as an alternative. Participation in the fluoride drop program was estimated to be less than 20%. It can be assumed that many at-risk children do not have adequate access to the fluoride through these preventive programs. Fluoride is proven to be an effective preventive mechanism to do, reduce the incidence of cavities. While the benefits of fluoridation are achieved for the population in its entirety, the effects are most impactful for disadvantaged populations. As a dental professional, my code of ethics requires that I act in the best interests of my patients and society. In keeping with this motive, I feel compelled to strongly urge Council to retain water fluoridation. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? Alderman Keating. Thank you, Chair. Uh, should have been a question I asked some time ago, but you brought it up that the decay is caused by bacteria in the mouth or around the teeth. And again, from my understanding, how does fluoride inhibit that buildup, or, or can you answer that? That's a good question. Um, decay is a multifactorial disease. In order to have a cavity, you need to have a tooth. You need to have a source of bacteria. You need to have a source of fermentable carbohydrate. Um, in looking and the approach that we take to preventing cavities is as well multifactorial. We want to keep mums healthy so that the bacteria isn't transferred to baby. Um, it's fluoride, it offers a protective effect in terms of making the enamel crystal more less soluble to acids caused by the bacteria. In high concentrations, there's literature that suggests that it, there is a bactericidal effect. Thank you. Alderman McLeod. I'm not sure I understood that last part, the bacterial side yes, effect. Um, 
that in high concentrations, which is less relevant for the conversation around water fluoridation, and more so around adjunctive topicals such as a fluoride varnish, that um, it reduces the level of bacteria, affects the um, plaque to reduce the level of bacteria. Okay. Um, I want to get back to the question of um, uh, infants and young children and the dosage mm -hmm. um, because you work with this specifically right what advice do you give families given that fluoride is in the water and how how to how do you recommend they control that um, the in terms of young infants we look again regardless of age to dietary reference intake intakes for fluoride. They exist for many nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin D, and including fluoride. Um, for children age one to three, the recommendation up is 1.3 milligrams per day. So in discussion with parents, we um, look to the recommendations from Alberta Health Services, Health Canada, Canadian Dental Institution, or Canadian Dental Association, pardon me, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, which are mandated to provide safe recommendations for public. With respect to infants, the current recommendation around formula, for example, which has come up in discussion today, is that with the water level at 0.7 ppm, reconstituting infant formula is safe. The recommendation as well around toothpaste, because children may not be able to expectorate or spit out toothpaste at a young age, and the concern with swallowing excess toothpaste is also very true and very real. So with patients, we'd again articulate the um, amount of toothpaste must be controlled for young infants. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, I, th I, th I think it more or less, it, it does. I'm thinking um, also though of um, um, juices and pop and now we, we've heard um, that there's socioeconomic factors related to this and that's what, why you're specifically working in the area that you do. Um, but for that population, a lot of times we hear, I don't know if it's fact or not, that um, there, there's a tendency to um, use cheap juices or reconstituted juices or water. So I guess my question is, do, are you factoring in what's in, the wa what's in those products as well? If they're made in Calgary, they've got fluoride in them too. Definitely. Um, a document published from Health Canada recently, let me just pull up the title so I'm referencing it accurately for you. Um, Fluoride in Drinking Water, which was a document that went out to public for comment. Um, it recognized that there are other sources of fluoride and in making recommendations related to the dose from water, looked and considered that there were alternate sources in fruit juices, in the food, in fluoride that... Um, okay, so you're not concerned at all that these children are getting too much? No, I am not. And you're not concerned that it's harmful to them in any way? No, I am not. I Systematic reviews continue to report that dental fluorosis is the only adverse effect of fluoride. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions. Our next speaker is Graham Greeds. Graham Greeds. Next speaker is Dr. Brent Friesen. Thank you. Would I be able to have the uh, projector on, please? Um. My name is uh, Dr. Brent Friesen. I'm Medical Officer of Health with Alberta Health Services and uh, Lead uh, Medical Officer of Health within Alberta Health Services for Environmental Public Health. Um, I uh, have um, past history in terms of being a strong advocate uh, for uh, protection of uh, water supplies. Uh, 
uh, in the province and in particular protection of the uh, water supply uh, for the city of Calgary through uh, advocacy around the uh, both the Bull River and uh, Elbow River to uh, uh, protect the uh, quality of the raw water that's used for our uh, drinking water supply. Um, Fluoride is recognized as a key factor in oral health, uh, uh, and that research consistently shows that communities with water fluoridation have better oral health than communities with uh, low water uh, uh, fluoride levels. The uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Andre Corvo, the Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, uh, for the province of Alberta, uh, strongly endorses uh, water fluoridation. I know that you've uh, heard from others uh, about the uh, systematic uh, reviews, uh, but again, I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, reinforce those uh, systematic reviews with you uh, and highlight the, uh, uh, the uh, current uh, nature of those systematic reviews. Uh, so again, uh, there's been the systematic review through the World Health Organization in 2006, the Australian Review uh, in 2007, uh, Health Canada's uh, review in 2009, uh, and then more recently uh, reviews uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, by the uh, Centers for Disease Control and the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection uh, Agency. Uh, and again, the reviews by uh, all of these government agencies or uh, scientific uh, groups that have done these systematic reviews have reached a similar conclusion that uh, fluoride at a concentration found in drinking water regardless of the form of fluoride agent used, does not pose any health concerns uh, to uh, consumers. We've had uh, discussion in terms of the uh, um, uh, level of uh, fluoride and that being beneficial. Uh, Health Canada's current recommendation is the uh, a fluoride level in drinking water be 0.7 milligrams uh, per litre. Uh, this uh, level was arised, arrived at by a risk assessment uh, process that takes into account uh, total fluoride uh, intake uh, and in considering uh, fluoride from other sources uh, such as the uh, uh, food uh, and uh, dentifrices that uh, people would use. Uh, it does reflect a balance in terms of the protective effect of uh, fluoride uh, on oral health uh, with the, uh, uh, well, uh, minimizing the risk of uh, fluorosis. Um, one of the challenges that uh, uh, we have in, in Calgary, and that uh, uh, if the uh, city were to uh, uh, make a decision to remove uh, uh, fluoride or discontinue uh, uh, fluoride fluoridation, is the wide variation that exists between the uh, Glenmore water treatment plant and the Bears Paw water treatment plant. So the naturally occurring fluoride out of the uh, Glenmore water treatment plant ranges from uh, 0.2 to uh, uh, over 0.3, depending on the time of the year, whereas in Bear Paw, uh, Bear's Paw plant, it ranges from uh, 0.1 to uh, 0.2. So uh, uh, if there was a decision to uh, uh, discontinue water fluoridation, there would actually be a, a much wider variation in the exposure of residents in Calgary uh, to uh, fluoride uh, through the water supply uh, than currently exists uh, where it is uh, uh, controlled at uh, 0.7 parts per million. Just um, in that to uh, summarize the uh, uh, importance of water fluoridation uh, is uh, really essential for uh, children with a, a poor social economic uh, background. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, has identified that it uh, can be a key factor in reducing the uh, in inequities uh, in uh, dental health. Um, yes. In my concluding remarks, um, it's interesting appearing for you, before you uh, uh, here today um, in that uh, dental caries uh, and that was uh, 
one of the issues that uh, caused me to become interested in public health and undertake uh, specialty training in uh, community medicine. Uh, as a general practitioner working in uh, Churchill and uh, in the Northwest Territories, um, uh, one of the things that I was involved in was uh, giving anesthetics to uh, young Inuit to children uh, and that for uh, treatment of uh, um, massive uh, dental uh, disease. Uh, and uh, so situation of giving these gen pulling these children out of their uh, home communities to fly them uh, down uh, into another province for their uh, treatment, uh, the disruption from that, uh, and then seeing them with a mouthful of uh, stainless steel uh, as a treatment of their uh, underlying dental disease. Uh, I think from a public health perspective, uh, I was extremely uh, pleased and proud in terms of uh, when uh, Calgary, Calgarians made the decision following a plebiscite uh, for uh, water fluoridation. Uh, and uh, I think it's essential for, uh, again, maintaining that uh, beneficial effect for oral health uh, and recognizing that uh, uh, dental disease is a significant illness that we uh, continue uh, water fluoridation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Thank you. Alderman Keating. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, one of the best descriptions I've heard tonight of all of the science is it's uh, likely that it is a benefit. It's not likely that it's a harm. But uh, when it comes down to it, the question we still have is this the best way to go ahead? And so coming back to the number of studies that you referenced, did any of them talk about uh, if there was a separate program to target those in most need, would we see the same results of, or even better results uh, if we remove fluoride? One of the, um, one of the major challenges that we face with um, uh, with any program when you move from uh, what would be a universal program which is what water fluoridation in is in terms of being uh, universally available to all to um, uh, a targeted program uh, is the difficulty of uh, actually identifying uh, those most at risk um, and uh, so there are strategies that you can uh, do for that, like to uh, uh, put those programs together. Uh, I think again, um, uh, I'd, I'd want you to remember the comment from one of the other speakers that uh, those uh, other targeted intervention programs for high risk, and we have some of them already in place in Calgary, uh, are intended or build on uh, water fluoridation as a base. Um, uh, if you were to look at a targeted program, uh, it will be much more costly uh, and uh, uh, it will be an ongoing challenge to ensure that it's uh, reaching uh, the, uh, uh, those uh, most at, at risk uh, to provide them with care. And um, uh, we, we just know that even dating back to the supplement program that was uh, done in partnership with the City of Calgary prior to water fluoridation. Uh, is that uh, we had uh, inconsistent uh, uh, use of the uh, drops uh, uh, at our various clinics across the uh, 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 city and, and often the utilization of the uh, uh, fluoride drops was uh, highest in the uh, higher income uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, compared to the uh, lower income neighborhoods. Um, it's hard for a single mom uh, that may be working uh, two jobs and uh, worrying about uh, putting food on the table and where the payment's going to come for next month's rent uh, to um, uh, be thinking then about uh, uh, putting the fluoride drops into their children's ju uh, juice. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your comments and, and I think they're, they're clear as well. I guess I'll rephrase my question because you answered all the uh, negative aspects of going down that route but never really asked, answered the question. Has there ever been a study that's looked at the possibility of removing fluoride and setting up a separate program to help those in most need? Um, the uh, Australian uh, systematic review uh, looked at uh, other options such as uh, fluoride and, and uh, salt. 
uh, fluoride in milk program so that they did look uh, at uh, other approaches. So the answer to your question is yes, the, uh, uh, depending on the particular questions, uh, charges that were made to those uh, uh, systematic review committees, some of them looked at alternative options and that is part of their process. Uh, those that did uh, found that uh, water fluoridation uh, was still the uh, uh, safest, uh, most cost-effective means uh, of uh, uh, providing the uh, protective, uh, protective effect of uh, fluoride for dental caries. Thank you. Alderman DeMar. In any of your studies, have you uh, looked at what, what any of the uh, cumulative um, build up of fluoride, whether it be in the body, in the environment, in the plants, and what the results of that might have been? Uh, uh, yes, the uh, uh, studies uh, have uh, looked at that. Uh, and again, the finding of those studies is at the uh, level uh, uh, that is used in water fluoridation, uh, that there is uh, not a concern with regards to uh, any other uh, systematic uh, or, or syst pardon me, uh, systemic uh, human uh, effects uh, and that the uh, uh, only effect noted is uh, uh, dental uh, fluorosis, but there's not concern with regards to uh, skeletal fluorosis uh, or other uh, uh, adverse health uh, effects. Um, similarly, the studies that have looked at uh, 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 adding uh, water, water fluoridation and that have not identified any uh, adverse uh, effects on uh, aquatic life uh, as a result of uh, communities that uh, uh, fluoridate the water. Thank you. Alderman McLeod. Thank you. Um, my question was just touched on actually a minute ago, but what, um, what, um, so uh, we, 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 we've heard about um, the fluoride uh, strengthening the teeth, and we've heard that fluoride um, might um, cause bone density loss or stru bone structure. And I'm wondering if you can um, comment on that because um, I'm not clear. <laughs> I mean, teeth and bones seem different to me, and um, I'm not clear on what the effect is on on your bones. Um, what has been found, in, and this has been noted in uh, uh, certain uh, uh, areas of the world where there are very high concentrations of uh, uh, fluoride uh, occurring in the uh, the water that uh, you can get what is called uh, skeletal uh, fluorosis, uh, which is a, a significant uh, health condition uh, and that uh, and uh, is something that you uh, would, would want to uh, avoid and not have occur. The uh, concentrations that uh, what you'd be concerned about uh, uh, for those are concentrations uh, over um, uh, 10 parts uh, per million uh, uh, in the uh, waters where it's uh, seen. Uh, the uh, centers uh, for d in the U.S. and uh, uh, through the Centers for Disease Control, they have a maximal allowable limit of fluoride in uh, um, water, naturally occurring water of um, uh, four uh, uh, parts per million. Uh, and that's intended to provide protection uh, against that uh, condition uh, arising, taking into consideration uh, other potential uh, sources of fluoride. Uh, the studies, uh, this is a health issue uh, that again, um, the uh, systematic reviews uh, have uh, specifically uh, looked at because it is a uh, concern that is raised with regards to uh, water fluoridation. Uh, and again, uh, those systematic reviews have been um, consistent uh, in finding that there is not a concern with uh, skeletal fluorosis uh, at the concentrations uh, uh, recommended for uh, water fluoridation. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I guess my ne um, next question, I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but I, I still have some confusion about um, the difference between 
what's added to our water and what naturally occurs in our water. Like I, you've commented that there's naturally occurring fluoride. I've heard that um, fluoride that's added has to have a, uh, has to be bonded, or I'm not sure what the word was, but it, it, it comes with something else in order to, <laughs> to get into the water. Well, that's, you know, fluoride is an ion, and by nature of an ion, it, it means that it's bounded with another compound, and there can be different compounds that it's bound, uh, bounded with uh, and that. Uh, so it depends uh, what the source of the fluoride is as to the type of compounds that have been uh, bounded with. Um, but there's no difference uh, uh, as far as the um, uh, clinical effect uh, of the uh, uh, fluoride ion, uh, uh, depending on the uh, source of the uh, 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 particular source that's used. And again, uh, the systematic reviews, this is often a question that is, is uh, uh, or has been a question concern raised in the past that, uh, uh, well, uh, it's, it's not naturally occurring fluoride uh, and that, and so uh, that it's, it's uh, uh, it has been a focus of the reviews, and again, uh, the reviews have uh, uh, not identified uh, that as a concern uh, for water fluoridation as to the nature of the source uh, of fluoride that is used uh, for uh, uh, fluoridation. Okay, so we've heard that they got the fluoride by scrubbing out some chimneys or something. It doesn't really matter where the fluoride comes from, it's still fluoride. Well, what's, what's critical is, the, you know, the, the issue is fluoride is present in, in rock and mineral uh, and that. So the way that it gets into our water, uh, you, you know, the, the water uh, going into the, the uh, bow and, um, and the elbow uh, is through the groundwater that enters into those, those rivers. And the reason why it's higher in the elbow than the uh, uh, Bow River uh, is that uh, groundwater has a much greater impact in terms of, or is a greater contributor to the flows in the elbow compared to the, uh, the to the Bow River. Uh, so uh, again, uh, with the production of, uh, of fluoride, if it, it comes through various mining uh, operations and that where the rock is being processed, is that you would have uh, fluoride generated. What's really critical, as uh, uh, what uh, Mr. Stefani presented to you earlier, uh, is that the uh, source that uh, the City of Calgary is using for fluoride uh, has the appropriate quality control measures in place uh, and uh, meets the uh, uh, standard uh, guidelines for uh, uh, fluoride that is used in drinking water systems, which is in fact the uh, case for the City of Calgary, uh, the sourcing of uh, fluoride for the City of Calgary. Okay, just to make sure I'm understanding that correctly, it doesn't much matter where the fluoride comes from, it's still fluoride. There's no such thing as clean fluoride or dirty fluoride, it's just fluoride. Yes, what's, what's critical in terms of uh, the uh, source of that fluoride is that there is the appropriate um, uh, quality control measures in there, uh, seeing if there is contaminants present, if there's trace contaminants present that they are at a level that uh, are acceptable uh, and that and wouldn't uh, exceed in term, exceed the Canadian drinking water uh, guidelines. Okay, um, I have one last question for you. Do you drink tap water or bottled water? Uh, tap water exclusively. And uh, that's what my family uh, drinks as well. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Stevenson. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Mr. Friesen. Um, as you can imagine, we've accumulated uh, data and research from all over the world on this. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask you to comment on Chile. Uh, in Chile, uh, they had an average of six um, cavities per 12-year-old, and in 1985, they put in fluoridation at that point. Um, it decreased from six down to 5.3 in six years. But then by the time 10 years went by, 1995, it was up to over 6.7. Uh, so they discontinued fluoride again. Have you, are those figures right or have you, have you looked at that at all? Or? I, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, specifically uh, familiar with the, the data for Chile uh, and that's so I can't comment on that. Um, 
what I can reference back is to the systematic reviews and uh, you maybe call one of the presenters uh, uh, again uh, dem uh, presented studies looking at the um, protective effect that you uh, see from water fluoridation uh, and that. And um, what has been seen over time uh, is that there has been uh, a decrease in the overall effectiveness of uh, uh, water fluoridation as far as the um, expected impact uh, from it. Um, but that needs to be interpreted with caution because uh, for certain members of the population, we may not be getting uh, as much uh, of a benefit from water fluoridation uh, because of uh, other factors such as the presence of uh, fluoride in, in toothpaste uh, and that other sources that we've got uh, for being exposed to uh, uh, fluoride such as uh, uh, drinking beverages that uh, may be fluoridated um, uh, and that. Uh, but there is similar evidence showing for um, the disadvantaged populations uh, that there is still a significant positive uh, uh, benefit uh, for them from uh, water fluoridation. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, what's occurring in Chile, uh, uh, there might have been a number of different factors that were uh, impacting uh, to see that result as far as the dental caries. Um, the, uh, again, as one of the other presenters indicated, uh, there's other factors that uh, increase the risk of caries or decrease the risk of caries, such as the nature of the diet that, uh, yeah. that we're well, consuming. In, in Ireland, it's supposed to be, and then the last data I saw, it was the most um, uh, heavily fluoridated, or 66%, uh, I think, was the, the number that were fluoridated there. But um, in the Northern Europe and the Nordic countries, there's, I think there's five or six countries that uh, have little or no fluoridation, and yet they're um, uh, less tooth decay than, uh, than what Ireland has, right? So. This, these are the confusing things for us because um, uh, everybody's presenting us with data. But the biggest concern that I have is the dosage and how we, because everyone, no one's questioning the fact that um, there's, that there can be overdosage of, um, of fluoride. Everybody's admitting that can happen. Uh, but um, how do we, as, uh, as, as a council for this city of a million people, how do we justify having this in the water when there is no control on dosage? And there's a number of people that do not want it and can't take it. Um, you, know, you know, there was conversations earlier about what, what might be some of the questions that you'd ask of a, um, a, a committee or panel that uh, if, if you were to decide to create one. Uh, that might in fact be one of the questions you you put to them because um, I heard from some of the comments of uh, uh, other um, aldermen slash councillors. I'm not sure where we are. We're still, we're still yeah. aldermen until okay. the next election. All right, uh, from uh, some of the other aldermen that, uh, you know, talking about the uh, amount of water different people would drink or consume during the day. If you make the decision to discontinue water fluoridation um, with the variation in natural occurring fluoride uh, and that, it means that potentially somebody in northeast Calgary uh, could be getting water in terms of at 0.1 part per million. Somebody down in um, southwest uh, uh, Calgary would be getting uh, 0.3 parts per million and that. And so, uh, and then if they're working in downtown Calgary, uh, they're getting uh, a blend between those uh, two. Um, so Dr. Friesen, I, I understand that. I, I've heard you say that before, but I, I don't understand how with this uh, method of um, adding the, the fluoride in there, how we incorporate all the other sources of fluoride because there's a lot of them and some people are brushing their teeth three times a day with fluoridated toothpaste, some are doing it without fluoridated toothpaste. I don't understand how we can ever come to a, a, a 
a, uh, understanding of what dosage people would be getting. Well, again, if you have a constant amount in the in the water, uh, and that, then that's a given that uh, all of us will know uh, exists in the water, uh, and then we can adjust our intake from the other sources. Okay, uh, around so that. What's that right amount? We were at a higher amount. Now we're at 0.7. And what about in five years from now or 10 years from now? The the um, uh, advice comes to us that 0.7 is too high. We should be at 0.3.5 or 0.4 or something. I, well, we don't know what this is. Well, I, th I think, again, um, uh, I think you do, and, and you can take comfort in terms of the uh, study that you had, uh, the City of Calgary had carried out previously, and the findings, recommendations from that uh, expert group uh, have been uh, reaffirmed and supported by uh, other s systematic reviews that uh, have occurred. Uh, those systematic reviews, uh, even though you know they're being done uh, as recently as, uh, well, being carried out in terms of 2010, uh, are supporting the uh, 0.7 parts per million that the uh, City of Calgary is at. So um, I think you can take comfort. For the, av for the average person with the average consumption of water. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alderman Pincott. Thank you. Um, so my, my questions, and I've, I've, I've stated this before, is, is around dosage and how you control it. And I actually would take your sort of argument about removing it as supporting, also supporting not having it in, because you, your argument around removing it was people would be getting different dosages and you can't control it, and yet with it in, we can't control how much people, how much water people drink. So, assuming, and and, and you talked about uh, osteofluorosis, and and <coughs> I think you said ten parts per million. Is that the same as ten point, uh, as ten milligrams or yes. point? Okay. Uh, do and as sort of ten parts per million being kind of that that threshold around osteofluorosis. Is that is that what you Not said? Not osteo. Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, skeletal. Skeletal fluorosis. fluorosis. Okay. Um, uh, so, if the average person is drinking two glasses of water a day, or I don't know what what point seven. What's what's the dosage then? The ideal dosage so at, at point seven milligrams per liter. What's the ideal dosage? In number, so that's two liters. So the, uh, uh, so I'm sorry. Could you repeat so your what, question? So, so again, if point, you're saying that point seven is based on the average person drinking the average amount of water, okay. how what, how many glasses of water is that? Is is are we is the sweet spot for that dosage? Okay. So within the um, systematic reviews. Uh, that have been done is one of the things that they do, all of them do, is they uh, uh, look at the um, uh, amount of uh, fluoride that is consumed by different population age groups. And so they look in terms of the different sources. So uh, what is the normal range uh, that an individual would be uh, drinking, uh, normally seen in terms of child as, as far as the amount of fluids they would uh, be drinking, what are the type of foods that they would be eating, and coming out with a total dose, uh, expected dose of fluoride that they would be exposed to. Mm. And within those um, uh, systematic, so that's, that's how those systematic reviews have looked at, taken the literature, looked at the dosages that people are being exposed to, looking at the various effectiveness, looking at the risks, and that's where they've landed in terms of on the 0.7 parts per million uh, as a level uh, for water fluoridation, uh, which will provide a protective effect against dental caries with minimal risk of dental fluorosis and uh, no risk in terms of uh, uh, systemic disease, including skeletal fluorosis. Okay, so you're saying then that there's no risk. So for the person who's drinking two glasses of water or 20 glasses of water, there's no risk. Of skeletal fluorosis? Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's... So, uh, so I, then, I so then where does the 10... I just cannot conceive of uh, uh, 
any way in which somebody drinking fluoridated, the city of Calgary fluoridated <coughs> water could develop skeletal fluorosis uh, uh, there because it just, it's not possible for them to be able to consume the amount of water that would give rise to those problems. All right, it's, it's not much of a leap for me to, to go from seven parts per million to 10 parts per million. No, 0.7, you're, you're actually so. Sorry, I, well I asked you if that was the same measurement and you, were, you said well, it was the same. We're talking about uh, water fluoridation is 0.7 parts per million. Okay. Okay. Uh, the okay, level in terms of for um, uh, skeletal fluorosis is, 10. is uh, over 10 parts per okay. million, uh, and that. And again, the communities in India where this has been noted and reported, uh, mm -hmm. what would be found there as far as the concentration in the water is 40 parts per million. Okay. And that. So it's uh, substantially uh, higher, and so there's a. Um, no, I just, I, I just yeah. don't think it's feasible okay. for no, somebody I, to drink. I that got it. Sorry, I, I, I miss. I was getting the the switching between milligrams and parts per million. Uh, one one last question: Is there any other medication that you would prescribe where you would say to the patient, "Take as much as you want"? Um, I'm not saying that uh, for fluoride and that. Uh, what I'm saying in terms of for fluoride is that uh, 0.7 parts per million uh, in uh, drinking water uh, is safe and effective. Uh, what you, I, I would also be saying, and what we have been saying to, to parents, uh, uh, is you need to be monitoring the amount of uh, uh, dentifrice uh, uh, that is being used uh, in that. Uh, to minimize, further minimize the risk of uh, 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 dental fluorosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. But I, right. you know, no, again, around the safety of uh, uh, 0.7 parts per million uh, uh, in the water, uh, I have no concerns with regards to the safety at that level. Thank you. Dr. Friesen, I just have one question for you. A number of years ago, <coughs> my father, was told that he couldn't drink the water because of the fluoride. He had kidney and uh, he had kidney problems, and he had uh, diabetes as well. What do you tell those people? Um, I think Dr. Musto touched on this um, uh, uh, previously. Uh, I'm not aware, like, um, uh, of a, a recommendation for people with renal disease to not drink uh, fluoridated water. Now there's certainly recommendations that go to uh, people with renal disease around their dietary restrictions and that to uh, uh, related to the overall kidney function. But I'm not aware of uh, that being identified as a concern and, and certainly for uh, dialysis uh, uh, machines, dialysis um, uh, equipment, uh, there's specialized uh, uh, water systems that are uh, put in place for those and uh, that's because of uh, uh, concerns uh, for uh, uh, a number of different uh, uh, to, to want to ensure a, a, a very uh, safe source of uh, water that is being used for uh, dialysis. So how many, how many people say in the city of Calgary would you say would fall under that category? Do you, do you have any ballpark ideas? Um, no, I can't give you that information. I can follow up on, on that as far as the number of people on uh, dialysis uh, and that. Um, uh, but coming back to your original uh, <coughs> question about um, uh, people with uh, kidney disease, uh, 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 you know, being advised not to drink or being a recommendation uh, not to drink uh, fluoridated water, uh, that's, that's not been an issue and I think Dr. Musto had followed up with the uh, uh, um, uh, director of the, uh, internal medicine or Department of Internal Medicine, and that was not identified as an issue. Or, and Dr. Musto is indicating uh, affirmative that uh, again they did not identify it as a health concern within the uh, uh, internal medicine uh, nephrologists that look after people with kidney disease. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no more questions, my next speaker is Elke Babiak. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I do have a question. I'm, 
late. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Friesen, we, we talked a little bit, Dr. Friesen, we talked a little bit during the break. Why do you think this continues to be such a controversial issue? And are you privy to the discussions that occurred in Europe when they made some alternate decisions to North America? Um, I'm not privy to those discussions that occurred um, uh, in Europe, uh, and that's so I can't comment on those. Um, as to why does this um, continue to be a controversial issue um, in, in Calgary um, and, and uh, some other communities. Um, it's not, not clear to me. I think uh, Dr. Musto touched on uh, some of the issues. Uh, it is, I do find it interesting that uh, water fluoridation has existed in Edmonton uh, since the early 60s. Uh, and uh, uh, there has not been uh, uh, the same degree of discussion uh, occurring in that community as, uh, as occurred in Calgary. Um, I, I think, you know, again, um, um, having this discussion take place, um, uh, you know, does provide an opportunity to review and present the scientific evidence uh, in support of water fluoridation. Uh, reassure people around the safety and effectiveness uh, of it. Um, uh, but I can't give any insight in terms of as to why it's um, persisted or recurred as an issue here. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with Waterloo with their decision. Very small majority, I think it was 0.3 of a percent to remove it after many, many years of having it in. So even in places that have had it for decades, it remains con controversial and the population is split. It, I, it's, an, it's a fascinating discussion and it may be the, the method of delivery. Well, um, I think another factor is, is around risk communication uh, and that. Um, and it's relatively easy for allegations to be made uh, in terms of uh, particular uh, adverse uh, effects or impacts uh, related to water fluoridation. Um, and um, it's much more difficult to refute those allegations in terms of um, somebody can say something negative and it's out there very quickly. Uh, but then to go in and provide the scientific detail and, and reason why that is not an accurate statement uh, or uh, that uh, it's important to understand the context in which that particular study or research <coughs> was carried out uh, takes a much longer period of time. And um, uh, that uh, people, um, uh, you know, in the 30-second uh, uh, bit, really doesn't lend to that type of uh, uh, informed discussion uh, 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 for people. Um, so I, I think that's one of the other factors that exists when we talk about water fluoridation. Is that it, Alderman Farr? Thank you, Dr. Friesen. Thank you. Our next presenter is Elke Babiak. Hi there, it's been a long day. I'm sorry. Um, ah, thank you. Um, I was involved in the fluoridation issue a long time ago. I have been the victim of uh, dentistry's follies not once, but twice. I have run through the fires of hell when I got mercury amalgam poisoning, and the experts told me there was nothing wrong. There was there was nothing wrong with mercury in my mouth. I was invited by Health Canada to participate in stakeholder meetings for mercury amalgam. We didn't get them banned, but we did get major concessions. So I have been involved with dentistry for well over 25 years. I work with dentists who are opposed to fluoridation and who do not use fluoride in their practice. They are harassed. They cannot come forward because they are in trouble when they do. 
by their dental associations. That's why you didn't get a dissenter. The dissenters are not at those meetings. Um, I want to tell you that I have pulled back a little bit, and the reason I did is because I went out and got a job. I am now working for CIR Realty. Um, it's really interesting because as a realtor now for CIR and I'm a buyer specialist. So as a buyer specialist, I take a lot of first time home buyers out and I have shown hundreds of homes in the city, all over the city, in affluent areas and less affluent areas. And what I have found in the affluent areas is that most people drink either filtered water or bottled water. And even in the less affluent areas, there are a lot of people who are drinking bottled water. And bottled water has become very popular lately simply because it tastes better than tap water and it's seen as being healthier than tap water. To give you a perspective on dose, this is my fourth. So this is about two and a half liters of water. I've had four cups of coffee. Before I go to bed tonight, I will have another two liters of water. So dose is very important when you're talking about weight. So myself, I would get much more fluoride if I was drinking fluoridated water than my friend over there who is 50 pounds heavier than I am. And that is what dose is all about. And that is why kids get very much fluoride for how much they weigh, especially the ones that are very slight in weight. And it's very simple. Every time somebody has asked about dose here and what is the safe dose, somebody talks about concentration or level. Dose is very simple. Somebody like myself is going to get much more because I don't weigh as much than a fully grown man does. So every person, depending on water intake, is going to get a different amount of fluoride. And because I drink a lot of water, and I don't drink fluoridated water, I'm OK. But what about the runners? What about those? And we're not talking about two glasses of water a day. We're, we're talking about um, four to six liters, at least, when you're training. My trainer recommends at least three to four liters of water a day. One of the things that I wanted to mention as I am, um, have noticed how many people drink bottled water is basically I want to ask some questions. And those questions are who has measured the decline in dental caries in Calgary since Calgary started fluoridating? Can we truly claim there is a benefit to fluoridating our citizens if no one has bothered to do a follow-up study? In the 1980s, they found no, no significant differences between unfluoridated Calgary and fluoridated Edmonton, and yet we still fluoridated our water supply. Who has looked for possible evidence of harm in Calgary? How can we possibly say there is no evidence of harm whatsoever if nobody here has looked for it? And I don't look at reviews stacked by fluoridation proponents. Calgary already went there in 1998. And every single one of those panelists was in favor of fluoridation except for one. So how can you get an unbiased review when you've got a panel full of fluoridation proponents? The other thing, um, as far as fluoridation costs that have never been discussed, is because this is a byproduct of phosphate fertilizer manufacturing, Calgary's cost to fluoridate is always going to go up. The use of phosphate is declining worldwide, and they, they think there is going to be a significant decline in the tw next 20 years. Your cost, because there will be less phosphate byproduct and less fluoride byproduct produced will keep going up. Ms. Babiak, your five minutes is up. Can you give me a concluding comment? My most important thing when I first got started in the fluoridation issue was freedom of choice. You cannot control the dose here. And it is absolutely unethical to force some people to drink fluoride and other people not. Okay. Alderman DeMong, questions? No. Oh, 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 yes, definitely. I'm just trying to figure out where to start. Um, you've you've been through this before. You've were here through '98 through the last discussion. Since um, pardon? Since '88. Okay. 
Um, can you? We've we've been. It's it's been suggested that we send this to a prof, a panel of professional medical experts to to come up with something that we can look for. Can you give us your opinion on what what your opinion of that idea might be? How are you going to determine that those medical experts are unbiased? You've heard a number of proponents here for fluoridation. Um, who you don't hear from is the dentists that are opposed to fluoridation um, because they are afraid and also a lot of doctors will not speak out. There is no way to guarantee whether that panel is going to be unbiased or not. The City of, Cal uh, the city of Calgary tried to have a panel in 1998. It turned out to be very heavily biased in favor of fluoridation. And yet despite that, despite that, we led North America as a city in saying we were getting too much fluoride. We were 12 years ahead of the Americans when we reduced to 0.7 and now the Americans are saying 0.7. We were right all along. Let's be ahead of them again. Let's take it out of our water supply. We are getting way too much. Um, geez, so many. I can't even begin to start. Um, you, you were commenting about the cost of, of the fluoride to the city of Calgary and that that's going to be going up. Where, where exactly were you going with that? What were your comments? The use of phosphate fertilizer has gone down significantly in the last number of years and the decline predicted um, in the next 20 is that it won't be used that much anymore. As far as strip mines go, for example, there's less and less strip mines that are getting permits to mine phosphate rock because it is environmentally disastrous. So you're going to have a shortage of chemicals as a result. You're not using phosphate in detergents anymore. So the use of phosphates are going way down. When the use of phosphates go down, your industrial waste byproduct will also go down. The reason we had a shortage the last time and Calgary experienced that is because the mines were out of production when Katrina hit. And so what's going to happen in the future? Those mines are going to be less and less. Where is the cost of the chemical going? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Keating. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Again, this is another question I should have asked a long time ago to really understand it because we were talking dose and I think um, all of the other stuff set aside, coming down to making a decision on the because I think we're all in agreement fluoride is great for teeth. Uh, where the disagreement comes is, is how much and how, and we go from there. Um, am I correct in saying that 0.7 parts per million is the same as seven milligrams? No. No? Okay. 0.7 uh, parts per million means you're getting 0.7 of a milligram in one liter of water. 0.7 of one milligram. Yes, exactly. 0.7 parts per million is 0.7 milligrams in one liter of water. And so how much you're going to be getting is how much you're drinking. So I'm going to be drinking four liters of water per day. Somebody else is going to be drinking none at all or one liter of water a day. So each one of us gets a different dose of fluoride if we drink fluoridated tap water. That's not an effective delivery method. So if we looked on average, because it, they keep saying you should drink eight glasses of, of water a day, which uh, unfortunately I think many people do not do, and they should. Right. Um, if I break that down, that would be roughly two liters of water. Approximately, yes. So I would be getting 1.4 milligrams of fluoride out of that, yeah. not counting any of the other ways I would be getting fluoride on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I would go with the 1.4, which is... Uh, probably fairly fairly common and maybe even less than that because like I say we don't drink um, the water but then on top of that I would add all of my uh, my toothpaste and, and and all of these other things and every so now and then the dentist does put those things in my mouth but not as much uh, lately as before and maybe that's because I'm getting older he's saying the heck with you I'm not sure but anyway um, we'll go from there uh, what I would like to know is again to what is the recognized harmful amount in milligrams? 
that will vary from person to person depending yeah. on whether you are sensitive to fluoride or not. And again, we're looking for, for kind of an average and where we're, uh, if I'm correct, I think I've heard somewhere around four milligrams, but I don't know if that's right because there's been a lot of information and I've tried to take as many notes as I'm not. It's the harmful effects for children are obvious, right? And I mean, some children are going to be drinking more water, some children not. Uh, dental fluorosis is a given in fluoridated communities. It's, it's like 41%. So that tells us that we're, they're getting way too much fluoride. As far as the absolute milligram dose that is harmful, if you are sensitive to fluoride, a half a milligram is enough. A half a milligram is enough if you are sensitive to fluoride. That is a, that's not very much. That's not very much. And if anyone else has very specific information along that, I would appreciate that at a later time. Thank okay. you. Alderman Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Would you Alka? Like to Alka. An yes. okay. That's what I had written down, but I wasn't sure if it was correct. First, declaring an interest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for um, your presentation and uh, your diligence of, on this particular issue uh, over many years, obviously. Um, and uh, I, I don't have any specific questions for you. I, I certainly uh, did hear what you had to say and uh, ha have been taping the proceedings today, so I'll have an opportunity to review that um, at my leisure. Um, I know there's been a lot of good arguments on, on both sides, and uh, um, I think there's from my perspective anyways, the main issue is uh, the ethical one. And uh, so uh, anyways, I, I appreciate your, your presence and your presentation here today. Thank and you. if I may, um, not to you as a question, but to, Mr. to the chairman, there's been a lot of submissions that have been made today. And uh, I was just wondering if I could put in a request that all of the submis submissions that have been provided here to this committee be forwarded on to council um, when this report goes to council. Well, we haven't had a lot of submissions given to us. They were all verbal. Okay. Well, I've seen a few, but um, any written submissions, if you could make sure that they're added to the council agenda. May I ask a question? Uh, my printer broke down. I didn't have one, so I was not able to do a real full submission. May I submit after? Is Ab that absolutely. Yeah. If you have some information that you can provide to us, whether you send it to me directly or to other members of council, I'd appreciate I'd that. I'd love to do that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is Helen Mullet. And for those that are counting, that's the end of page one. We'll start on page two next. Number what? Number 30 out of 50. Probably. Debbie. Thank you. I'm Helen Mowat. I'm a mother and a professional educator and a concerned Calgarian. I have lived in Calgary for close to four decades. I was brought up and encouraged to be a discerning and caring and caring person. I learned as a child to follow the golden rule of doing unto others as you would do, have them do unto you. I am a generalist and have a master's degree in education. I expect accountable, open, fair government. I also feel that unelected bureaucrats should not force decisions on the public based on questionable science. In the 1970s, slide two, 
I was brainwashed mum and did not question authority, the officials or experts. Calgary Regional Health Authority, CRHA, recommended children be given fluoride drops to help with tooth decay. In 1989, CRHA conducted an improper plebiscite without giving citizens all the facts. And likewise, in 1998, CRHA spent 250,000 of taxpayers' money promoting this unethical practice of poisoning and or medicating every Calgarian. Reading history, I found out that fluoride was given to the masses in Germany during the Holocaust to keep the prisoners passive. It is also known that fluoride is a component in drugs like Prozac. Since the 1950s, many knowledgeable and ethical Calgarians fought not to have this poison put in our drinking water. Because they understood history, they valued the rich resources of pure, clean mountain water. Fluoride was kept out of Calgary's drinking water in the 50s, 60s, 70s, along with six, ple with six plebiscites. Finally, the politicians made the banal decision to put the poison into our drinking water without legitimate science nor proper public consent in 1989. After a slim majority plebiscite where only 17% of Calgarians voted. This was a scam and a racket right from the beginning. One has to ask who is, promo uh, who is promoting and profiting from it. I would suggest that you look at some of these websites. The, there are many books and studies which have presented fluoride history and concerns. So, oh, sorry. So, um, those are good websites. Next is uh, some books. And by our uh, Dr. James Beck is a concerned Calgarian is here, and he wrote the case against fluoride, how hazardous waste ended up in our drinking water, and how bad science and powerful politics that kept it had kept it there. Finally, then there came a slide about the chronological order of um, uh, about fluoride, and it even started the debate since 1901. And I'll let you just read uh, that. It goes to uh, uh, Dr. McKay, a dentist, noticed it on his, uh, on his uh, patient's tooth and uh, stains on his teeth and went to the Colorado State Dental Association and nothing too much was done. Then Dr. Hill, a city councillor, uh, said to ask that uh, the councillors move uh, cautiously because he said the advantages and disadvantages have been, haven't been fully determined. Next, the 1953, the American Dental Association declared that water fluoridation was the greatest step in prevention of dentistry that has occurred during the century. Finally, in 1966, the Alberta government amended the Public Health Act to permit a simple majority vote on fluoridation instead of the two-thirds majority previously required. Today, there are no legitimate scientific proof that fluoride even helps topically with tooth decay. Many cred credible studies show that it has effects on the skeletal system as it causes hip fractures and brittle bones. Other peer review studies show it lowers IQ, causes dental fluorosis, neurological problems and many other diseases, thyroid problems and even cancer. There's a Dr. Um, Arvid Carlson, won a Nobel Prize in medicine in 2000 for his work on the, on, on the brain, neurology, he played a very important prominent role in banning fluoride in Sweden. Um, finally, Oppenheimer of Germany, who played the key role in the invention of the atomic bomb, quotes these words from a spiritual ancient text. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Did you know that fluoride is one of the most toxic chemicals still in North America? It was one of the most, it was one of the toxic components evaluated for use in the production of the atomic bomb in World War II. Dr. Mercola states, water fluoridation is based in an absurd and unethical because studies show that this chemical can damage your brain, your immune, your gastrointestinal system, and your skeletal system. Fluoride is so dangerous that a family-sized tube of fluoride toothpaste is toxic enough to kill the 25-pound child. As a mom, when I saw this picture of my son Craig, I was worried and concerned. I arranged an appointment at the children's hospital to see a neurologist. Sadly, he didn't make any connections, and nor did he give me any answers to the problem. Take note of my son's right leg and right hand in these two pictures. To me, this does not seem normal. However, with whole mind thinking and a mum's intuition, I put the puzzle pieces together and feel it was because of the fluoride drops I gave him when he was a little boy. Today, I have learned to question the officials, the experts, uh, and what the experts say because of my many lived experiences. 
Many historical atrocities have been conducted in the name of science. Today, I know that self-interest is more important to politicians, bureaucrats, and corporations. My passion was teaching. Today, as someone told me, you just have a larger audience. This is a picture of the water pipes at the Bears Paw Water Treatment Center showing caustic corrosive toxin, toxic waste eating through the pipes. It's not a pretty sight. Madam, Madam, Why are Calgarians, you, I just want to sum it up. Please. Okay. Why are Calgarians being deceived? I'm not opposed to honest science nor the use of scientific methods. However, common sense must always rule. It is my opinion the policies of fluoridation is based on scientific fraud, and that is the implement, implement and this and that its in implementation is criminal. It's not effective, not safe, and unethical for unelected and elected officials to foist the hazardous waste upon Calgarians. Fluoride is available in toothpaste. I will trust that City Council will make use uh, will use common sense and stop fluoridation now. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker and committee, we're at bare quorum, so we'll, um, all members of committee will need to keep their seats until we um, have Thank two you. members. The next speaker is James Beck. Well, I, what I've heard thus far today has presented me with a dilemma. <clears throat> you have been presented with uh, a lot of testimony, and I think that testimony comes from individuals who, with personal experiences uh, and effects on their own lives, has to be listened to and respected. You've also heard a lot of testimony from f officials from Alberta Health Services, and quite a lot of that testimony has omitted much evidence counter to their conclusions and has misrepresented some of the evidence that is indications of harm of fluoridation. So I have about three pages here of notes of things that ought to be straightened out, but I, I guess I w mustn't do that. Five minutes isn't much time. Uh, here, uh, by the way, I have copies of what I'm about to say. If uh, you want those, and I'll do, I, I time myself, I can read this in three minutes, so I'll give it a good shot. Now, some of you on the committee have heard me before on fluoridation. Now, I have in the past focused on questions of effectiveness in preventing cavities and on the adverse effects of fluoride <clears throat> and of hexafluorosilicic acid. By the way, there are critical differences in how you uh, put fluoride ion into the city's water, whether you use hexafluorosilicic acid or some other method. That was dismissed by, by some of the uh, medical officer of health or so on, and it, ought, it has to be considered. Um, I have given reasons based on peer-reviewed research pa papers published in credible journals for concluding that fluoridation is at best minimally effective and definitely harmful to subgroups of the population and quite possibly harmful to all of us. So in these few minutes, I'll comment only on the ethical issues. In 1957, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that fluoridation is, compul quote, compulsory preventive medication, unquote. The court's ruling is significant because it legitimizes the common sense conclusion that we are being medicated, and it puts the matter clearly in the realm of medical ethics. And medical ethics, in turn, is embedded in human rights. Now, here is how fluoridation violates the code of medical ethics. It is administration of a, of a drug without control of dosage, Controlling concentration has been discussed exceptionally. It's not control of the dose or the dosage. It is administration of drug without informed consent of the recipient. It does not provide monitoring of the effects of the drug on the, on the uh, recipient. It is not possible for the recipient to stop receiving the drug because many cannot get non-fluoridated water, and none of us can avoid exposure from foods and drinks processed where tap water is fluoridated. The drug has not been shown to be safe for human consumption. All of those points disqualify 
fluoridation of public water supplies as a medically ethical pro procedure. But fluoridation of a public water supply is not only an ethical offense against us all, it is clearly a more serious offense against those subgroups of our population which are partic particularly at risk of harm from fluoride. These groups include infants being fed with formula reconstituted with tap water, diabetics, persons deficient in iodine intake, persons with kidney disease, boys doing the eight-year-old growth spurt, and others. It is an obligation of city councils and of Alberta Health Services to protect not all, to protect all, not just the average and not just the majority. Several counselors have rightly been concerned about the dental health of children of low-income families. It is said that fluoridation is a particular benefit to poor children. Well, that question has been investigated with studies that were designed to answer that question. It is found that the fluoridated poor groups have no better cavity experience than do the non-fluoridated poor groups. Furthermore, it is found that the prevalence of cavities increases as family income decreases. It's not fluoride that would benefit poor children. It's a higher standard of living and probably a better diet and better oral hygiene. Now, what kind of ethical consciousness allows one to continue to apply a possibly harmful process to unwilling people until there is absolute proof that it is harmful? I have seen this, uh, this backward approach to safety in government reports on fluoridation. It goes like this. This study that shows association of fluoridation with this harmful effect is not a perfect study. There are weaknesses. Therefore, we will continue the process until it is shown with certainty that it is harmful. And at the same time in these reports, no further research is recommended. No responsibility to support a better study is accepted. In the presence of a small and dubious benefit, such a conclusion, Dr. more than being in irresponsible, is outlandish. So I, I'll end just by saying you don't have the moral right to do this to us, to one million people. You should stop it now. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. We have um, some questions. Alderman Devong. You say that it has not been proven safe for human consumption. Could you, could you elaborate uh, that, on that for me, please? Well, the, there, there have... So, no, listen, the principal governments now involved in, in, uh, um, in, in the whole world in terms of fluoridation are the United States and Canada. In the United States, uh, it has been said by the, fle uh, the Federal uh, uh, Drug Agency that it's not uh, been examined for safety for human consumption. And it's not an approved drug. It's, an, it's what's called, classified as, a, as an unapproved drug. In the case of uh, Health Canada, uh, the, the, the Health Canada approves of it, but um, it's very difficult to find out why. Uh, I and a number of other people have submitted petitions to Health Canada through the, the uh, federal uh, auditor's office which in the law requires that Health Canada answer those questions within a certain period of time and so on. And uh, we get answers back. We ask for the evidence that they have for safety and the evidence they have for efficacy, and they, sell, they just don't answer. They don't give us any citations. Uh, and so uh, I personally gave up that pursuit. I didn't continue because I don't expect it to... Um, to pay off, with, with, uh, I fr frankly expect you to stop fluoridating Calgary anyway, long before I could get an answer out of Health Canada. And the, the uh, uh, Peter Cooney, the, the federal officer of dental health, ha has uh, he has no no way to support fluoridation. He uh, doesn't seem to respond 
a very, very uh, in a knowledgeable way, and he has contributed the, uh, in one meeting, international meeting about fluoridation, that he says he walked down your high street and I haven't seen people with horns. And that's how seriously he takes the problem. It's just been impossible to get satisfactory responses from that kind of leadership. So you're suggesting, you're, you're telling us that there's been no FDA, t FDA testing on That's fluoride right. as a drug or fluoride in general? Right. And, and, and also their, their unapproved drug doesn't, I don't think that includes hexafluorosilicic acid in particular. And as I mentioned, and there were some misleading comments made here earlier today uh, about the chemistry involved, it does matter where that fluoride comes from, that is what's ha added to the water. It could matter very much. For one thing, it's true that it's al almost all the fluoride is dissociated from the hexafluorosilic acid in, in very dilute solution in water. Um, but the silicates enter the your, enter your body when you drink the water, as does the fluoride ion. In a very acidic environment, such as is in the, in the stomach, a pH of 1.2 or so, that's a very acidic, the uh, fluoride reassociates with silicates. And this, uh, though this isn't certain, but we do know that, that uh, ingestion of fluorosilicic acid has been associated with lesions in the, in, in the mucosa of the intestines. And um, it may be because of, of this recombination of, fluor uh, of, of fluorosilicates. And the, um, the other point is uh, of interest on a citywide scale because it, fluor, the fluoridation is associated also with higher lead levels in the blood of children. And the, the probable explanation of that is that lead is leached out of the, the joints in the plumbing system. Now, I know we don't use lead pipes anymore, but we solder joints with a flux that has lead in it. And, and this has been definitely demonstrated and quantified that that uh, association, we know that with very recent research that, that's, uh, that is, came a after some of the, uh, the very good studies, for example, the National Research Council 2006 report, which I'm, uh, I'm interested to see our colleagues from the Alberta Health Service didn't mention among their system, system, systematic uh, reviews. But this, um, uh, has shown that there is in, in, in laboratory animals, you get higher levels in the tooth enamel of lead and higher levels of, the, of lead in bone. And in, in humans and ch children, you do observe higher levels in their blood when in fluoridated areas, higher levels of lead now. And there's no dispute here, I'm sure my colleagues would agree with me, that lead is, is, is a well-known neurotoxin. And uh, we, that's not something we want our children to be exposed to. Okay. Um, speaking of the, the sy systemic, systematic reviews, systematic reviews yep. um, that, that we have heard about today, you're referencing several things, they're referencing other things. How is the layman supposed to know that, that their reviews are different than the studies that you're putting forward and to say which are the ones that we should be relying on? Yep. <clears throat> well, I've mentioned only one systematic review, and that's the National Research Council review from 2006. But this was done by a panel of 12 scientists, some of whom, before they started this study, were in favor of fluoridation, some of whom were against fluoridation, and some of whom had no, no uh, an, a position on the matter. They studied the problem for two, three years, they looked at 1,100 primary research papers. I'll make a distinction in a moment. And they, and, and they based their conclusions and their analysis on primary research. Now, primary research is the research where, where data is gathered and analyzed and evaluated in a, in a, in a proper manner, whereas systematic reviews or non-systematic reviews are just reviews of, of hopefully of primary research. 
But in many cases, in the fluoridation case, we have sort of an inverted pyramid where all these panels, like this dental association and that medical association and so on, say fluoride is wonderful because this review said it was. And this review said it was because some other review said it was. And sometimes when you go deep enough, you come down to the point of this upside down pyramid, and it's a group of government appointed pro fluoridation people. And, and you can't really, credit that kind of review. It has to be done better than that. The, the, another review, aside from the NRC 2006 review, there was a York, what's called the York Review, which was, came out in, in the year 2000 uh, from Great Britain. And the chair of that review panel has since then been complaining that proponents are using the York Review to support their their conclusion that, that fluoridation is wonderful. And that's not what the report says. This report, I think this is the one where they started out and looked at a, a 214 or 220 or something. Um, maybe Luke Schwartz knows something about that because he's talked about it once to a subcommittee of this committee. And um, the, they looked at these uh, 200 and some odd uh, studies and they classified the studies in three levels, grade A, B, and C, as to the, the, uh, the competence uh, of, the, of the study. They found no grade A, and among the B and C, they managed to get 12. And the conclusion of the report is we have no way to say whether this is good or bad. So how you can say that that makes fluoridation good is beyond me. So I think you have to be very careful about systematic reviews and, uh, and you have to ask the question, what is the evidence you're citing? I've, when I've talked to you members of council in the past, I've tried to emphasize this point. From both proponents and op opponents, you must ask what that is the basis of their conclusions. Now, I think when you've asked Dr. Dixon or me uh, about that over the last years, uh, we have given you uh, primary, mentioned anyway, we haven't read them to you obviously, but we've given you citations to primary research, not to just reviews. Uh, a, lot have been dis a lot has been discussed about a uh, possible medical review uh, through the Faculty of Medicine, United, University of Calgary, uh, and that would be a wonderful way for people to come and tell us whether we should continue to fluoridate or discontinue fluoridating. Can I get, can you give me your views on what that may, would look like, whether you would encourage that or discourage that? What would your viewpoint on that well, be? My, my first reaction is, uh, I think all, you should just stop fluoridation <laughs> and, and and that, that'll, that'll settle the problem because we've had a lots of, uh, of, of uh, reviews and discussions and so on. I'm not against the Faculty of Medicine hosting or, or even organizing such a review, but I would caution you again, just because there's somebody wearing a white coat doesn't mean she or he is right or even knows what she or he's talking about. I'll give you the example of the Dean of Medicine of, at the University of Calgary was saying how the dose is controlled, how there's no evidence of harm. Not only he, but the, the head of the Department of Community Health Sciences, they jointly wrote an op-ed in the Herald saying these things. Well, I cannot believe that the hundreds of articles I have studied don't exist, but that's what they say. And now I since have had a friendly talk with the Dean of Medicine and he no longer uh, feels that controlling concentration is controlling dose and he no longer denies the existence of evidence of harm. So if the faculty of medicine wants to do that, fine. Uh, whoever wants to discuss it, as far as I'm concerned, is welcome as long as they do it responsibly. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for coming out here tonight. Thank you. Um, there are some more questions, Dr. Beck, but I'm not sure I should have mentioned this or, or the chair should have mentioned. I, I'm for having any... trouble hearing you. Okay. 
Um, can you hear me now? I'll speak yeah, a little uh, louder. It's, it's um, my for ears. any of for any of the presenters who don't want to stand through long questioning, there is a stool, and we can lower the podium if oh. it's more comfortable. So that's um, there is an option open to, for everyone who's presenting. Alderman Kara. Uh, thank you. Um, asked and answered. Thank you. I I didn't realize I still had my light on, but thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Alderman McLeod. Sorry, I eventually get that. Um, I've, I have several questions for you. Um, what, uh, what, I guess I'd like to start in, on what your, because um, you didn't really touch on this, what your credentials are for this. You've got a, a pretty strong background as a researcher and a professor at the university. Can you just tell me a little bit about your research background and how you came to the issue of fluoride? Oh, my, excuse me, my, my research background? Yes. Well, my research background has had nothing to do with fluoride or fluoridation. I see my objection now, I should make this clear, my objection is to, florida, is to fluoridation of, of public water supplies. To say I'm against fluoride is kind of silly. I mean, it's there, it's in the periodic table, it's in our water naturally. But uh, what happened, what brought me to this, this position, which I don't particularly enjoy doing this, see, uh, uh, is, about 10 or 11 years ago, I was invited to, to join a committee of five dentists and one family practitioner uh, who were opposed to fluoride to see whether we could advance that effort. And uh, I hadn't really thought about fluoridation before that. And, uh, but when I first looked at the issue, the thing that appalled me was the ethics of it or the lack of ethics of it. But in any case, it, it made me think that, yes, somebody ought to do something to stop this. And then I began to, to study the science on it. The science involves the question of efficacy. You know, does it really prevent cavities? And the, the other aspect of the science is, does it do harm? Is it toxic? And so I've spent the last 10 years looking into that. And... Um, I've come to the conclusion that all those three questions on efficacy and toxicity and ethicality all have to be answered no. And in addition, I should comment that a lot of the evidence we see is uncertain. That's something I suppose we could agree on with some of my colleagues. But some of it is not so uncertain. There are some very strong results that indicate particular toxicities. But aside from that, if there's even doubt, and if the possible benefit is minimal, then we should stop doing it until we know it's okay. Instead of this backward position I described that I read about in government reports that, well, we don't know, so we'll keep doing it. Some years ago, the, uh, there, there are several unions of, of, uh, within the uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, uh, unions of the scientists, that somewhere between 7,000 and 11,000 people. They petitioned the Congress of the United States to declare a moratorium on, for, on uh, fluoridation until it's shown to be safe and effective. And uh, the, the, what's, what's interesting here is that the scientific staff of the Environmental Protection Agency in general thinks st that fluoridation should be stopped and not restarted. But the, the Environmental Protection Agency as an agency is a strong promoter of fluoridation. The designers of that promotion of fluoridation are the political appointees at the top. Thank you. Did I answer your question? I get lost um, sometimes. Yeah, I, I, yes, you did, actually. You, I, I was wondering how you came to this issue, although I was unaware oh, that your yeah. research background was um, oh, completely I, I should tell unrelated. You my, uh, I, I am a physician, 
And uh, I don't have a lot of uh, clinical experience. Uh, after graduating from medical school, I had one year of internship, and then I took a postdoctoral fellowship to do research in, in, uh, at the uni University of California in Berkeley. And uh, there I, I ended up taking a PhD in biophysics. And so my research experience has been varied. Initially, it was in radiobiology, but I've done work on biophysics of uh, red blood cells, and I've uh, uh, done some collaborations, theoretical work for people in other experimental fields, and ended up mainly involved with pharmacokinetics. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, my next question is about, um, you mentioned lead levels. Um, mentioned what? Le levels of lead. Oh yeah, and um, when you you're relating that to fluoride, you're suggesting that fluoride causes high levels of lead. Um, is there research to support that, or is that an opinion? Well, uh, yes. I, I hope I haven't said anything that isn't supported by research. But yeah, but I, I should point out now that uh, uh, there's a difference. I was. I should have finished this when I was talking about the importance of the source of the fluoride we get by adding whatever it is to water, to our city water, because uh, the, the uh, natural fluoride is in generally, I, perhaps in all cases, that we get, say, from wells or from rivers, such as the Bow River and Elbow River, comes from the Earth's crust, from minerals in the Earth's crust. It is usually or almost all calcium fluoride. So when we, and, and there's a difference in the absorption of calcium fluoride than there is the, the, uh, from the, the absorption into the body of, of um, other fluorides, like sodium fluoride. The sodium fluoride will dissociate into sodium ions and fluoride ions almost completely. Calcium fluoride, not so completely. So if you get your fluoride from most sources of natural fluoride, you will excrete some of it in the feces. So you won't absorb as much into the body. And once it's absorbed into the body, uh, generally we sequester 50% of it in a normal person, a healthy person, and about 50% of it is secreted through the kidneys. That, for that other 50% mostly is sequestered in the bone. But wherever it goes, it builds up throughout your life. And that, that's something that, that we mustn't forget. You know, we're not talking about, oh, will I get sick tomorrow? Um, okay, I, I guess my question was around the lead. I'm not sure how, um, if we're talking local fluoride, uh, we have old homes that have lead old pipes, we've got aging infrastructure, we have kids' toys, I'm not sure, um, paint, uh, uh, all kinds of things that we've discovered there's lead in. And I'm, I guess my question was, you, you were making the point about um, the relationship between fluoride and lead, and I just, I, I wasn't clear on that. Um, my next question relates to um, some of your comments with respect to um, government employees and Alberta Health Services being pro-fluoride. Um, how do you distinguish between having um, a position that you would frame as being pro-fluoride, which sounds in some ways unreasoned, as opposed to having weighed the evidence and saying, on balance, I support fluoride, or I, for these reasons, as a, a scientific thing. Because I, and the reason I ask is because the term pro-fluoride seems to be a little bit loaded, and I'm, I'm wondering how you're coming at that. You also um, took some aim at government employees in, in public health, and I, I, I'd just like to know where you're coming from on that, yeah. because I know you've done an awful lot of work around this, so I'm, I'm curious to know. Well, uh, um, uh, how you've tried to resolve that and how you've come to that conclusion. Okay, uh, <clears throat> among people who are against fluoridation, pro-fluoride pro may well be a loaded term. But among who are in favor of fluoridation, anti-fluoride is an even more loaded term. We are defamed every day. But 
the let's see, I don't want to get too far off your question specifically is how how do I what now? Well, my question is how how have you come to that conclusion? Oh. Um, because because if yeah. if somebody's weighed evidence and they come with a respected opinion. How is it you differentiate that and have you tried to resolve the differences? Okay. I mean, you're making accusations that they're not reading the research. Uh, they're saying that they've read tons of research and they've done systemic studies yeah. about the research all out there and on balance have come to this conclusion. Oh, okay, I come to this conclusion as follows. I have talked to three medical officers of health in Alberta over the years. And the overwhelming impression I have is they don't know what the literature is on this, either pro or against. And that's okay, except that it, 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 at some point it's their responsibility to know. But what's not okay is for officials with, whether they're government officials in the Alberta Health Service or, or whether they're deans of medicine and heads of community health sciences departments, when people start talking publicly from positions of authority that the general public has respect for, then they have a responsibility to have a good reason for saying what they say. Mm -hmm. And they haven't been able to tell me those reasons. So that, that, that's uh, one uh, problem. The, the other problem, which, and the stories here that, that sort of support this are more from the United States than from, from Canada, but somebody mentioned earlier today the pressure on empl employees of agencies that are promoting fluoride to come up with the right answers. And we, we, have, we have a number of, of uh, cases of scientists who did legitimate, competent research that turned out to show the uh, uh, evidence of harm, and they were told not to publish their papers, but they did publish their papers and got fired. Uh, there seems to be also a tendency of scientists, at least in the United States, in this area, to feel that they can't get support for their research unless they say fluoride is a good thing. It, it's really a kind of bizarre sometimes. I've read a number of papers where in, in the abstract it says, you know, this is, uh, you find this evidence of harm and this evidence of harm and this evidence of harm, and their conclusion is that it's wonderful. Or there's an there's a introduction to a paper that says the purpose of this investigation was to show that fluoride is safe and effective. Well, that's not an investigation. That's the answer. And it's an answer that, that's unsubstantiated. So if I'm understanding your answer correctly, you're saying that, that um, they're uninformed and um, the that at, at least stateside there's there's um, a conspiracy to or whatever and uh, some kind of pressure not to publish the research or to there's some some external push not yeah, to have the research are, I'm not saying that they're uninformed I'm just saying that in our discussions they haven't shown me to be informed and I would like to be informed on the, the, the studies they say show Albert, that uh, fluoridation, for example, is effective. Because I know what many proponents rely on there. And those studies that they rely on don't show eff efficacy. So we have to discuss that and see who's, who's reading the papers mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I'm misunderstanding, I want them to straighten me out. So. Uh, that, that's what led me to, the, to, to these remarks, and uh, because the, these officials of Alberta Health Services have made statements here today that are patently wrong, like the comments on dose and the things like that, the comments that there's no evidence of medical harm. There is evidence. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been talking a little bit about um, research in Alberta Health Services. It would seem to me that um, some of this um, 
debate should be happening at a provincial level if they're permitting it to be put in the water. I realize there's a level at the municipality here, but it would seem to me that uh, Alberta Health Services um, and the provincial government are in a better position to um, have the resources to deal with this. That's just an observation based on, on the information you just gave me, which I, I appreciate. Um, I guess the other thing that uh, you mentioned uh, to uh, Alderman DeMong's question that I appreciated was uh, a willingness to um, think about this committee and, and how we might structure it. You emphasized some of my own concerns about making sure that the committee was, the, the results were not predetermined, that the committee was working with an open mind, and I think that is a challenge. I concur with you on that. Yes, um, that would be hard to do. Yes, yes. Um, it's hard to do what I'm trying to do right now, too, <laughs> so, uh, which is try to figure out on balance um, where, where um, I see it. So I appreciate the, the input and thank you for the information. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Beck, right? Correct? Dr. Beck? Oh, uh, yes. Um, Bravo. I'm sorry, uh, there's something that I, I didn't fully uh, understand in regards to a question that was asked by uh, by Alderman McLeod, specifically in, in reference to the to the lead issue. Are you suggesting somehow that fluoride impacts the lead in the pipes on the joints? Well, Maybe well, increases the, its increases <coughs> the, the the level or something. I'm trying to understand it. The the facts that I can back up with the studies that I can quote I can send you. Uh, are a relationship between fluor fluoridation and the level of lead in uh, children's blood. Okay. Okay, now the question, of course, the, uh, one of the first things you ask, well, where is that lead coming from? And why is it more so, uh, why is the level higher in supposedly comparable groups of children where there is fluoridation than it is where there is no fluoridation? And when People have looked at this, and this, I, I can't give you the, the research on this, but, but I think, uh, you know, your city officials can tell you whether, uh, how your, your pipes are, are, uh, are soldered together and so on. But the explanation for this, this demonstrated uh, relationship that I've heard is that it comes from pipes, even that are not lead pipes, because the joints in, are, constructed with substances involving lead, mm -hmm. which is leached out with fluoridated water. I'm sorry, so you're saying even the PVC has a lead component in it? Well, well no, the PVC wouldn't be soldered, would it? No. So that, uh, but your, the, the main infrastructure of a city like Calgary is with what, iron pipes? Mm. So those would be soldered, and and I I was I'm been told that uh, that solder contains lead. Interesting. I guess that's a question that we may have to further clarify with administration. Yeah, and and by the way, in studies just just published last year with in animal studies, it's shown that in the presence of fluoride, the lead is incorporated into bone and tooth enamel. That was done in rats. Uh, it hasn't been done, to my knowledge, in children. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're a lot like rats. <laughs> so, I'm, so I'm told. <laughs> okay, no, I, I, I just didn't fully understand um, what you had uh, referenced in regards to the lead and the association with fluoride, specifically as uh, Alderman uh, McLeod had had asked, but so you do have some studies that you can provide to me, and if you could do that, I'm sure other members of the committee would also be interested in seeing those okay. results. So thank you for that. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Alan Farrell. Thank you. Um, I have several questions. The um, I'm surprised we haven't heard from anybody in the environmentalist um, profession. I know that there was someone from nat nat Natural Step who was wanting to speak but left early. Do you have any comments on 
the fluoride that as it goes into the water system? Does it turn into just a, a nat what looks like a natural occurring fluoride? No, there's concern in, uh, in the east, around the Great Lakes area, about the amount of fluoride that's going into the water system because it's not being cleaned from the, uh, from, yeah. uh, the sewage treatment. And a lot of it's coming from toothpaste as well. Surprise, surprise, I don't know anything about that. Okay, no, I, I'd like to know more about it. Um, do you know anything about what it takes to approve a substance by Health Canada and what it takes to remove a substance by Health Canada? If something's approved years ago, 50s for example, when we thought about science very differently, and the no. sci scientific intervention and, and, and modern. Where is the burden of proof? Um, I really, I don't know if about, enough about the process to answer that. Okay. I, I, you know, it, it's a legal question. Uh, I have read a lot, uh, quite a bit of the regulations during the course of making those, you know, that petition for information from Health Canada and and there's a, there are many sections, subsections, and so on, and some of them include fluoride and uh, as as a toxin that has to be controlled, and so on. And then some, down in some sub subsection, I came to one that say fluoride's okay. None of that stuff applies. I, I didn't want to put you on the spot. I, just let me know when you're not uh, familiar with a particular topic. Now, the experience in Europe, we heard from one presenter who talked quite a bit about her personal experience in Europe and how they were mo removing fluoride from the water supply but providing it through other mechanisms. But it was, am I speaking too softly? I'll, sp I'll speak up. Um, there was a presenter who spoke about her personal experience from Europe mm -hmm. and how in, in Europe they were removing fluoride from the water supply but putting in in other substances like salt. So a couple of questions. The, um, what do you think of the idea of obtaining fluoride through other mechanisms, ingesting fluoride through other mechanisms? Let me let you answer that one first. Well, <clears throat> I would not do it to myself and I would not recommend anyone else do it because I don't think uh, fluoride ingested has any beneficial effects or no sub, at no substantial level. Okay, so then my second question is, Europe compared to North America, um, Ontario compared to Quebec, Calgary compared to Vancouver, can we show, can we demonstrate that fluoride has been beneficial? Well, well <clears throat> no. In the case of Europe, the um, most countries stopped fluoridating, that were fluoridating during the 70s. And the reasons that were given for that by their officials um, were, were actually the th those three, re three reasons I've given why we should not have it. They, some of them just said, well, it's ethically unacceptable. It's forcing medication on people. And that was enough. They stopped. And others said, well, it doesn't seem to be beneficial. And uh, some of them, uh, not, uh, not all of them, but some of them mentioned the possibility of toxicity. So in the case of Europe. In the case of, um, well, let's see, in, in Canada, by the way, I should tell, tell you, this may, may spur your spirits as, as uh, politicians voting on an issue like this, but over the last several months, uh, dozens of communities of jurisdictions in Canada and the United States have stopped fluoridation or refused Florida to start fluoridation and uh, I think that's because they're uh, learning things that they didn't know before mm -hmm. Quebec City stopped uh, to fluoridating yeah, yeah. Um, the issue of poverty it's something that I care particularly about and yet we're hearing from well, we've heard from some poverty groups suggesting that there's better ways to use that money. Um, and other poverty groups <coughs> who are, well, no, 
not maybe poverty groups, but others, or people advocating for those in poverty, that it's necessary to, to level a playing field yeah. for children in low, of low-income families? Well, for me, the, the uh, you know, it, it's clear that, that, uh, floor, that the incidence of prevalence, I should say, of uh, dental caries, of cavities, has decreased in the industrialized world remarkably over the last four or five decades. Uh, the interesting point about that is that's happened whether there's fluoridation or not. Mm -hmm. And it was mentioned uh, earlier that, well, we we'd, um, stopped, so let's see, how did it go? It stopped fluoridation uh, and in one place and in another, and the, the decay rate continued to decrease or something. Well, it's decreasing for reasons other than fluoridation. Uh, that seems to me fairly strong conclusion. And um, so what is doing it? Well, uh, you know, dentistry is not my thing. I, I don't pretend to know a lot about dem dentistry, but uh, I, the arguments that the reason this has happened is for in, improvement in, in diet, improvement in oral care, dental care, that could be at home, you know, brushing your teeth and not drinking uh, sh sugared drinks and so on, and, uh, and also better professional dental care. And uh, in the case of Canada, those things are probably pretty uniform across the nation. And um, we don't have data or a lot good data about the incidence of cavities in, across Canada. But I'm told by people, including dentists, that the, the oral health in British Columbia, which is 10% or less fluoridated, is uh, no worse than it is, perhaps a little better than it is in Alberta. So uh, I think we should look at those other factors. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's what you ha probably have in mind with their amendment to the, to the motion, and I think that's the way to go. Okay, thank you. Um, now, we heard from some medical professionals today that uh, those with kidney disease should not worry about, and um, n not including those on dialysis, I imagine that's a fairly special case, but those with kidney disease shouldn't worry about consuming fluoride in the drinking water. Um, I have a very dear friend who has pretty significant kidney disease who's been advised by his doctor otherwise, and I'm, I'm, I find that confusing. Yeah, well, I was very surprised to, to hear that from a physician. Uh, the, uh, the, and the American Kidney Society, I think that's the name of it, uh, until a year or so ago was a strong promoter of fluoridation. And they reversed that position. They no longer do it. And because the reason they didn't is because uh, persons with kidney disease are more susceptible to harm from fluoridation. Okay, thank you. Now my final question then is um, the idea of a plebiscite. We had six plebiscites with fluoride. Four of them voted negatively to introduce it to the water. Two of them have voted for it. Now, one of the questions I'm getting is, if we brought something in with a plebiscite, should we not take it out with a plebiscite? Um, we have experience in the same vote that brought in fluoride. We also voted not to introduce water meters and yet council because of, of um, water use being so high, reversed that decision without a plebiscite. Our um, policy for, for local improvement, for example, if you, want, if you want to redo your sidewalk on your street, you need 66% of the landowners on that street to sign a petition in favour. It, that doesn't include somebody opting out of that vote. It would need to be 66% of those landowners. So a plebiscite at a simple majority doesn't really make sense to me. 
when you're talking about uh, public health issues. But I, the question then is, should a, is a plebiscite the appropriate way to discuss topics of this nature? <clears throat> no, of course not. Uh, it's an absurd way to, to settle such a question. You know, it's bad enough that you city council members can sit around and decide what I have to take into my body. And, uh, but you have an opportunity to be better informed, to get access to resources, to advisors, to all kinds of people to sit around and really think about it. But the general voter doesn't have the time, perhaps not the energy or background to do that. And in some of you, not, not many anymore, I think, want to, to turn this decision over to those voters who will inevitably be less informed and perhaps feel less responsible to decide whether a million people have to have this unavoidable stuff in their water. That doesn't make any sense to me. If 99.9% .9 of the voters in Calgary decided on what medicine I should take, that wouldn't make any difference whether the, between 50% or 2%. Or it's the same thing. I don't gather my neighbors together to tell me what my medical care should be. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Beck. Seeing no further questions. Um, we have time for one more speaker. Um, Bruce McKenzie. Thank you very much. Uh, I made a few comments or notes here and hopefully I'll take less than five minutes. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to allow me to discuss the fluoridation. I intend to keep my remarks within the rear of the science and environmental impact. Joel Griffiths and Chris Byerson wrote in their 1998 report, Fluoride Teeth and the Atomic Bomb, the science of fluoridating public drinking water systems has been from day one shoddy at best. The basis of that science was rooted in protecting the U.S. atomic bomb program from litigation. Fluoride was the key chemical in atomic bomb production. Millions of tons were essential for the manufacture of bomb-grade uranium and plutonium. One of the most toxic chemicals known, fluoride rapidly emerged as the leading chemical hazard of the U.S. atomic program for both the workers and the nearby communities. The original secret version of the classified Operation Program F was written by Program <coughs> F scientists and published in the Journal of the American Dental Association in 1948. The Program F scientists show that evidence of adverse health effects from fluoride was censored by the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Um, just as an aside with today's uh, presentations, we talked about 50 years. There's, I think there's a correlation between 1948 and 1998 in that a lot of documentation of fluoridation the United States has classified the military. The first lawsuits against USA bomb program were not over radiation, but over fluoride damage. Human exposure to fluoride has mushroomed since World War II due to not only fluoridated water and toothpaste, but to environmental pollution by major industries from aluminum to pesticides. Fluoride is a critical industrial chemical. Spencer Wells writes in his book, Pandora Sea, 2010, most of our diet, whether it is based on wheat, rice, cattle, potatoes, or any other non-aquatic animal and plant products humans consume comes from domesticated species. Western civilization in particular not only applies topical fluoride to teeth, but ingests significant amounts of fluoride in our food supply. Wells writes in Pandora Sea, page 181, it takes 1,000 gallons of water to produce a pound of beef and more than 500 gallons to produce a pound of rice. George Glaser writes in his paper, Fluoride and Phosphate Connection, in the late 1960s, EPA chemist Evan Bellick worked out the ideal solution to a monumental pollution problem. Because recovered phosphate fertilizer manufacturing waste gains 19% fluorine, Bella concluded that the concentrated scrubber liquor 
could be a perfect water fluoration agent. It was liquid and easily soluble in water and also inexpensive. For the, fluorate, for the phosphate industry, the shortage of sodium fluoride was a key to turning red ink into black and an environmental liability, sorry, an environmental liability into a perceived asset. With the help, with the help of the EPA, fluorocyclic acid was transferred from a concentrated toxic waste and liability <coughs> into a proven cavity fighter. One would assume that the pros, as, we, as your questions with Dr. Beck, the statement that some type of natural fluoride is added. This is not the case. Only calcium fluoride occurs naturally in water and is never being used for fluoridation. The chemicals used to fluoridate, sorry, the chemicals used to fluoridate 90% of our public drinking water are industrial grade hazardous wastes captured in the air pollution control scrubber systems of the phosphate fertilizer industry. These wastes contain a number of toxic contaminants, including lead, arsenic, cadmium, and even some radioactive isotopes. Michael Connett, in May 2003, writes in his paper, the phosphate industry, the phosphate fertilizer industry, and environmental overview. And this is a, perhaps, a, hopefully I'm backing Dr. Beck up into a question. It is quite remarkable from the EPA that despite 50 years of water fluoridization, the EPA has no chronic health studies on cyclical fluorides. All safety studies on fluoride to date have been conducting using pharmaceutical grade sodium fluoride, not industrial grade silical fluorides. Griffins and Bryson state, we learned about dirty politics included in the science and selling of fluoridation to a trusting public. I might add, the dirty business. Thank you. Since you're right on time, Mr. McKenzie. Uh, questions, Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Thank you for being here today, Mr. McKenzie. Uh, what, you've obviously read a lot about this topic. What generated the interest? Um, my background is uh, management, and I specialize in environmental health and safety uh, for the commercial real estate industry. I've had to really look at the root uh, of, of um, the science of study so I could make intelligent decisions. Um, I find uh, a lot of information, and I, I apologize for this comment, but with all due respect to all the medical expertise, I'm quite discouraged in what I've heard today. Um, I can find probably, if, if you want to pay me my consulting fee, I can find as many negative comments to, to, to discredit what they're saying as, as, as Dr. Beck has pointed out. But my real personal interest is um, I was given the study that I, that I quoted uh, regarding atomic energy in the early 2000s. Um, and from a very credible uh, PhD, I've done a bit of work on that. And to the date, um, I don't use fluoride water, which is a lie right now because I'm going to have a hernia operation. I can't carry the bottles of water, so I have to use city water until my surgery marks first. Then I'll go back and carry the bottles of water. Um, the other thing, too, is I discussed my dentist. And I don't use topical fluoride for my dentist. And my biggest problem is arguing with health professionals, being the, you know, the people that clean and fix and do my teeth prior to him looking at it. So to me, it's uh, medicated. It's all the things we've heard about that are negative about fluoride, and that's my interest. I don't want someone telling me what to do. And I think the, the, safety, the, 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 the most emotional thing that I can say is that um, having been a healthcare administrator and having been terminated in healthcare and fought a wrongful dismissal suit in which the administrator that terminated me was charged by the RCMP for 13 counts of fraud doesn't mean, as Dr. Beck says, you got a white coat, you're, you're an expert. I think you need to really look at, as I've tried to indicate here, the root of the science. Where did the science come from? Was it transparent? Who paid for it? And there's, there's lots of stuff out there that are not paid for by big industry or, pardon me, big government that dispute the claims that are being made uh, that are, quote, pro-fluoride. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. Uh, members of committee, um, is everybody here following supper? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. About 12 more, which will take us to about 9.30, based on what we've done today. 
Okay. We have... That's fine. We are recessed till 7.05.
We'll call the meeting back to order, and we're going to go through the speakers list. Uh, maybe, okay, there's more people coming in. That's good. I'm going to try and do this so that everybody gets to speak, but I don't know how many of these people are going to come back. Is Aaron Holmes here? Aaron Holmes? Oscar Feck? Nope. Patricia Glashan. I think she left earlier today. But. Uh, Faye Ash. She's embedding a thousand so far. Adele Sonoy. <laughs> Somebody's here. A lot quieter in here than it was before. Yes, and maybe I'll be less nervous with a more. <laughs> Still on TV though. Proud. <laughs> I'm usually so nervous I vibrate. So if I do that, just TV. bear with me. Um, I my name is Adele Sonoy, and I am not a professional at all in this area. I just love to do research and. For me, my health, because of my past and my own health problems, um, is number one. And I'm always worried about what I'm taking into my body and what I can avoid and, and um, <clears throat> actually spend, spend money for filtered water. So this, the benefit for me, hopefully, if you choose to eliminate fluoride, is I won't have to spend that money and I can actually save some for some of my other things that I do for my health. Um, I'm going to turn this on. Thank you. Okay, this is this is not meant to um, to be uh, disrespectful to the medical industry, but we were talking about it earlier, and I just thought it was cute. This 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 is a very old magazine ad, and it just highlights the whole concept that yesterday's medical dogma is tomorrow's medical fallacy in some ways as more research comes to light. And in this case, I guess it's last century's medical dogma will hopefully be tomorrow's medical fallacy. Because we know, for an example, mercury was a prescription drug at one point, and now we know that uh, it's very toxic and we don't use it anymore. I think it was for headaches and a number of other things. There was previously mentioned uh, reports by the WHO, the World Health Organization, and one of them was pro-fluoride and one of them was against. So that just highlights the schizophrenic nature of some of these huge organizations. And I suppose as time gets on, goes on, when they come to new information, sometimes we're still referencing their old opinion and we don't necessarily refer to the most current thing that they've... Um, I had one, in fact, but I don't have it with me. I, I just decided I'd speak at the last minute late last night, so I didn't bring one, but it had to do with, it was from the WHO, and it was a huge document, and it had to do with fluorosis in, in water and how it affected children around the world, and they studied uh, um, countries around the world. This one is very recent. I don't know if you can read that. I'll read the highlighted parts here. It is... Uh, from December 21st, 2001, this was PR Newswire, there was a study in, uh, I actually found it on PubMed, um, called Fluoride in Water Linked to Lower IQ in Children. This was uh, presented by the Environmental Health Perspectives and publication of the National Institute of the Environmental Health Sciences online December 17th originally of just this past December. And among other things, there, that it says here, I'll just quote, um, there were 23 other IQ studies on, online in addition to this one, and there have been, so a couple of dozen other, other studies relating t to the lowering of IQ of people consuming fluoridated water, or children rather, and over 100 animal studies linking fluoride to brain damage all the IQ and animal brain studies listed in Appendix 1 of this, of this uh, <coughs> article. One of the earliest animal studies of fluoride's impact on the brain was published just in 1995, and it led to the firing of the lead author by the Forsyth Dental Century. 
Center, sorry. This sent a clear message to other researchers in the United States that it was not good for their careers to look into the health effects of fluoride, particularly on the brain. So, so whenever there's, they've kind of just steered away from this. The, the other studies referenced in this article and on PubMed are actually from other countries around the world. In North America, we've kind of stayed away from researching the effects of fluoride on the brain. There was, just to highlight the point of potentially conflict of interest, is there only 25 minutes, seconds left on here for me? Oh, okay, well, let me get to something more interesting then. Um, this is another study just asking if uh, fluoride really fights cavities on the, by the skin of the teeth, and it's from Science Daily, December 18th, from Langmer, and I'll just read here. The research found that the fluoride layer formed by topical application of fluoride was only six nanometers thick. It would take almost 10,000 such layers to span the width of a human hair. That's at least 10 times thinner than previous studies indicated. The scientists question whether a layer so thin, which is quickly worn away by ordinary chewing, can shield teeth from decay. So they, they are acknowledging here that more studies need to be done, but topical application of fluoride is so insignificant in what it actually does to create a layer to protect on our teeth, that normal brush and eating wears it away. I also have here the, um, and obviously no time to get to it, but the uh, material safety data sheets of, of fluorosilic acid, which is what we use in our city water, and sodium fluoride, which is what we use in, in toothpaste. Um, Do you have a concluding comment? So I guess... That's my time. That's your time. Uh, I would, can I just address quickly, the second part of your motion that you want is, is to, w whether or not money should go to an education thing. Is, can I just take a moment to address that? No, nobody's asking the questions, so. Okay. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, Alderman Stevenson. I'll ask you to address Okay, thank you. <laughs> well. You there's a number of studies that you can find on PubMed also about xylitol, and um, xylitol, there's no toxicity concerns about it. It's a natural substance that has been indicated for dental health benefits in, with respect to prevention and the remineralization of teeth. And xylitol, as a sweetener, has benefits of protection for diabetes, diabetics. They don't have the same uh, insulin issues with that. And also osteoporosis, which is potentially a, a problem that, that fluoride might contribute to, and, and among other things that are benefits. So if we as a Calgary community were, were, or dentists would promote the use of toothpaste sweetened with xylitol instead of, you know, the fluoride, then that would actually have some benefits and we could absolve ourselves of the guilt of poisoning the public. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Art Matsui. Yes, hello. <clears throat> My name is Art Matsui. I'm here to speak as a citizen and taxpayer of Calgary. I am an expert on my own dental health and I have studied the subject for 54 years. My own studies show that the only time I have gotten dental caries is when I have been part of a fluoride treatment system, but I'll leave that go for now. That said, I'm here to talk about freedom of choice and economics. My personal choice is to limit my intake of fluoride, but by mass medicating our, medical, our water supply, the city limits my choice and costs me out of pocket. It costs me five times as much as the average person to buy non-fluoridated toothpaste. And even though I pay for water, I have to buy bottled water in order to keep my fluoride intake down. So the economics are, by limiting my freedom of choice, I must pay more money and for the city to supply um, fluoride to those who don't want it. They've, they flush 99% of it down the toilet, which costs us $750,000 a year and requires, I heard this morning, four to $6 million in capital upgrades that are coming soon. 
This is not an effective use of my money as a taxpayer. But for those of those for those people who still want fluoride, I'm going to refer to my notes from this morning from Dr. Schwartz, the dental expert from AHS who spoke uh, this earlier today, and I'll put this up if we could zoom in a, a little bit. This is a um, Colgate toothpaste label from the United States, and it's kind of hard to read, I suppose. But if you look here, um, in the average toothpaste, it contains 0.76% fluoride, sodium fluoride in this case, which works out to be, seven point, by my calculation, 7.6 milligrams per gram of toothpaste. And they do recommend that to use a pea-sized amount of toothpaste for children two to six years old. Now, Dr. Schwartz said that uh, they think that a, a rice grain size um, amount of toothpaste would be more than adequate for children of that age. So my point is that if indeed there is 7.6 milligrams in the average serving of toothpaste, and as the uh, doctor said, the leading cause of fluorosis is toothpaste, and that they only need, a child only needs about 1.6 milligrams of fluoride in their diet to protect their teeth if you subscribe to the fluoride theory. That means that the average child and adult, for that matter, gets more than enough fluoride in two pea-sized um, servings of toothpaste to more than so there's no need for us to put f extra fluoride in the water. I mean, by their own admissions that this is the leading cause of overfluoridation is the use of toothpaste, which means that if you look at the curve, most people, or the majority of people, get more than enough fluoride in their to daily toothpaste to uh, satisfy what the expert is saying is the amount of fluoride that they'll need. And if you also note here, it says if you swallow more, and this is a United States label, it, it actually says if you, if more than used for brushing is accidentally swallowed, get medical help or contact the poison control center right away. So that means if you were to eat, if a child two to six years old were to eat um, more than one pea-sized um, serving of toothpaste that would be in the united states that's considered grounds to call poison control now i find it hard to believe that you know so in two servings of toothpaste there's by my calculations 15.2 gram milligrams of fluoride so it's hard to imagine that they absorb less than 10 percent of, of that and that would be more than adequate and I don't think it's possible for a child to put a rice-sized um, toothpaste on their brush. And I, I know my time's up, so I'm just going to ask that I agree with Alderman Farrell. We should take the fluoride out of our water immediately. And, you know, there is more than adequate means for people to get fluoride if it's necessary. Just don't give it to us that um, don't feel it's necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matsui. Is there any questions? No. Seeing none, thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Marina Hines. Um. The uh, problem I see here is that there are too many different uh, experts who are all uh, saying different things, and we don't really know what the truth is. But we can tell uh, that um, we can tell certain things about what they say. If, you, uh, for instance, we know, for instance, if you fell into a vat of 
fluoride, you would disintegrate. We know that fluoride kills human enzymes. Science has proven that. We, uh, when um, there are scientists who say that heavy metals and chemicals cause 90% of the disease in the human body. And uh, I've spoken to medical doctors who, who told me that they learned nothing about uh, heavy metal poisoning or chemical poisoning in medical school. I don't know if that's still true. That was years ago. So uh, uh, I know that 50% of dentists in Canada have stopped using mercury. Now, mercury contains a kind tobacco, which was isolated from mercury ore by former Soviet scientists. Uh, a kind tobacco has been exposed to what, maybe 20,000 degrees. I don't know what it's like in the middle, in the, in the center of the Earth, how hot it is, but it's still alive in mercury. And so, if you, uh, if uh, the dentists have, 50% uh, of them have stopped using mercury. Perhaps that's why the decay in in in, uh, in uh, the human mouth has gone down because they're not using so much mer mercury, and. Um, and then there's uh, injecting uh, mercury into this with this uh, bacteria into the human body. Uh, I've been poisoned with 20 heavy metals, uh, mainly mercury, but a great uh, deal of arsenic. And someone mentioned uh, uh, something about arsenic today, and I wanted to say that arsenic weakens the skin, so <clears throat> we're very uh, vulnerable to fluoride. Those of us who have uh, arsenic poisoning. Uh, the arsenic, if you scratch, if you have arsenic poisoning and you scratch your skin, you draw blood and it's very hard to heal. So that weakens the skin. The fluoride can get in when you're taking a shower or a bath. Uh, you, need, um, you need to understand how many poisons that people have been poisoned with in order to um, understand that we are inundated and that what we should be doing is cutting back on the chemicals and heavy metals and not increasing our intake because we can't handle it, okay? Um, <clears throat> we're inundated with thousands of chemicals uh, every day and we see the results in lower IQs, cancer, madness, uh, weakened immunity, schizophrenia. If you exp expose people to all these poisons over generations, this is what you're going to have. Uh, People, uh, um, governments have made mistakes. Uh, uh, we we, uh, uh, we have to look at uh, what we've done to ourselves. I mean, 150 years ago, North America was a pristine country. Now, every piece of land in uh, in North America is poisoned and uh, with heavy metals because of what we're putting on our food. And according to Chef Chopra, who wrote. Um, a, a, corrupt the core, he said that we have now the most toxic food in the world. So if we have toxic food, we don't have the, we don't have the nutrients necessary to get us well, and we, are, uh, and we need, and in order to have high IQs, we have to have proper nourishment. So there are many things you have to take into consideration. And uh, uh, I mean, there, uh, if rich people uh, want to fluoride their water, they can get the drops. I mean, you can put a, I don't, I'm sure that they can figure out how many drops to put in their water. And uh, and, and a lot of the people I know are uh, uh, using filtered water anyway. They should, um, and they probably could buy a better uh, source of uh, fluoride uh, than what's being used, the industrial stuff that's being used by the city. And, uh, uh, and we, we can make up our mo own minds then. Everybody can make up, up their own minds about how, whether or not we, can, uh, we want to use fluoride. And some of us just can't use all these chemicals anymore because we've been uh, poisoned to such a great, de uh, great uh, degree. And um, I wanted to say that I think that, I think that uh, politicians should start listening to mothers because we know, we know what's going on with our children and ourselves. And thank you very much. Thank you. Your timing was bang on within two seconds. Our next speaker is Warren Anstey. Warren Anstey. My next speak speaker is Dr. L. Smith. Dr. L. Smith. And next speaker is Brendan Valentine. Hi, 
councillors. Thanks for giving me the chance to speak today, and uh, thanks very much for sticking around and showing commitment to this issue. Uh, I appreciate that you feel it's important, and uh, I just would really, first of all, like to clear up a lot of misconceptions here about fluoride products. Um, first, importantly, is that what we put in our water supply is not sodium fluoride. Sir, you, it's not. Can you give your name first? Uh, the name on my social insurance card is Brendan Valentine. And. Uh, Basically, this is not calcium fluoride, this is not sodium fluoride, uh, this is hexafluorosilicate. And uh, the thing about hexafluorosilicates is they are produced almost explicitly from uh, phosphate fertilizer plant smokestacks. Uh, this is a report prepared for the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in the United States uh, stating that fluorosilic acid is mainly produced as a byproduct of the manufacture of phosphate fertilizers where phosphate rock containing fluorides or silica and silicates is treated with sulfuric acid. The gases released hydrogen fluoride and silicone tetrafluoride are sprayed with water in condensing towers or drawn into a series of scrubbers and dissolved in water, forming an aqueous solution of fluorosilic acid. So it's literally being scrubbed out of smokestacks. Uh, in the United States, as Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, both sodium hexafluorosilicate and fluorosilic acid are listed in Section 8B as being toxic substances. So I don't know where this uh, debate over the toxicity of these substances is coming from. They've been knownly uh, listed as being toxic. Um, further, uh, I, I have to speak out against the media propaganda and the propaganda coming from the health services uh, stating that fluoride uh, has no negative health effects on human populations. There's no credible research citing that. I have credible research citing that, including a National Research Council report from Washington, D.C. stating that, um, oh, pardon me. Uh, the difference between the levels of fluoride causing toxic effects and the levels added to water to prevent tooth, tooth decay is vanishingly small and deeply troubling. Uh, in, even in areas with low fluoride of one part per million, uh, they've found collaborations with um, suppressed thyroid function, uh, depressed nervous and endocrine system functions, and including functions with the pineal gland. And uh, to quote Dr. Paul Conant, this is coming from the highest scientific authority in the United States, and they've determined that low levels of fluoride in drinking water may have serious adverse health effects. Um, it's a very, very sensitive dosing range. A one-size-all system does not work. Uh, we get it in when we bathe, when we shower, in our food, in processed drinks and food. Uh, so there's no way to account for all those other sources of fluoride. Uh, the Chinese have released studies correlating fluoride to decreased intelligence and in populations. And um, fluorosis, I'd like to also add, is a serious incurable illness once it reaches advanced stages. And before you'll ever see dental fluorosis, you will also see non-skeletal fluorosis effects in all of your major vital organs. Um, and I just don't see how we can justify spending uh, millions, even billions of dollars on uh, something like this uh, to put a partially contaminated toxic waste industrial byproduct containing radio uh, radioactive isotopes into our water. Um, and it's not proven to, you know, um, there's no solid claims that support that it helps your teeth in any way. I would like to see that research presented before it's claimed to exist, uh, as they claim that the research I have right in front of me does not exist. Uh, it very much does. And uh, let me see where, what was I going to end on? Uh, there actually haven't been any studies uh, done on hexafluorosilicates. There were studies done on animals with sodium fluoride compounds, but never with hexafluorosilicates. Uh, German studies have shown that it inhibits cholinesterase, an enzyme that plays an important role in regulating neurotransmitters, and that would link them to effects uh, with chemical agents like uh, linked to Gulf War syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, and other uh, conditions that we may not necessarily have explanations for at this point in time. And... Uh, I guess on that note, I'd just like to say that, you know, as a policy studies student, I appreciate the role that uh, the people in our government have to do, and it's not easy to make these sorts of decisions, but uh, I definitely do not give my consent as a taxpayer um, and as a citizen for this to go on. It's unethical, it's not giving us freedom of choice, and it's poisoning our children. So please stop. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Valentine. Alderman Farrell, you have a question? Thank you. Thanks for being here today. If we put iodine in, the, in salt for, for the prevention of, uh, my understanding, goiter and or blindness, um, why is it decided that it should go into the salt as opposed to the water system 
in the way that fluoride has been put into the water system as opposed to the salt that the Europeans have done. And I was wondering if there's a technical I, I don't know. I, 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 I can't answer that. I mean, we put fluoride in because... You know, I, <laughs> I know why. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. I apologize for asking you a question you didn't know the answer to. Seeing no other questions, it's time for Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Mr. Pritchard, this panel that's been suggested, um, what's your opinion on the panel? Is that how we engaged with the previous discussion with the Alberta Health Services? Um, then, of course, the recommendation would have to come back to members of council um, for a decision. The, the, I can't remember the full details of the uh, previous panel, and, uh, and it's quite possible that Dr. Musto would uh, recall, or uh, Dr. Friesen would have recalled more than I can, but um, the process for doing it, as I recall it, administration was directed to, to put together um, a panel, and we, we, we sought out experts um, with different skill sets, um, uh, and um, assembled that panel, and they, <clears throat> they went away and did, did, a, did a, a significant amount of work. As my, I recall, it, was, it took a lot longer than is being suggested by the, uh, the letter that was sent to us um, from the university. I think my sense is that the, the proposal by the, uh, uh, the university that came into the mayor recently is a much um, quicker um, uh, review. It'll, it'll assemble. Um, systematic reviews that have been done and, and try and, you know, summarize or give a synopsis of, of, of what's out there, a current sort of literature review, if you will. My recollection of the panel that we, um, that was put together was sort of a, a much longer process and it, it uh, with more, um, I, I, as I recall, when they submitted their document, I mean, there was pages and pages and pages of reference material that they'd looked into. So they had, they had looked into individual um, pieces of research as opposed to reviewing systematic reviews, I think. Um, so my sense is that this, is, it, it, this proposal is a, is a quicker, um, much uh, less time-consuming proposal. Not. And, and so... Maybe not as thorough. The, uh, the concern we heard about systematic reviews is that they're often reviews of reviews. I, 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 um, I don't know. That's of interest. What about the European? It, it seems to be um, cir circulated more around an ethical question in Europe. And um, it would be interesting to hear from, from uh, some of the European scientists that, and even politicians who have made these types of decisions. Um, I mean, something? well, I mean, just to be clear, when uh, when the issue came up the last time, um, it was very clearly uh, a review that was done by the um, by the medical and dental community and the scientific community. It wasn't anything that was done by um, the water works department or the water industry. It's not something that we um, profess to have any. Um, any expertise in at all from the health-related uh, aspects of fluoridation. Um, I mean, we're very well versed in, in how to um, uh, apply um, the process and design it and, and run it and operate it. But in, in terms of the actual um, benefits or, or, the, or the medical benefits or dental benefits or otherwise, that's not something that, that we um, are able to comment on. So um, again, I, I don't know whether going to um, Europe or anywhere else, Australia or New Zealand, from a point of view of a health mm -hmm. um, benefits <coughs> review um, would be a good thing or not. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, we, could, we could tell you operationally what they're doing and what the plants are doing and what they're not doing and so on, but uh, uh, I, I can't really comment on the, on the health side of it. Okay, then maybe we should get an opinion from Mr. Inlow about the legalities of... Mr. Inlow? ...the council's decision. Mr. Inlow, you've been here all day. We thought we might ask you a 
at least one question <laughs> to justify the, the time commitment. You don't, you don't need to do that, but... <laughs> no. So, Mr. Inlow, um, the question of if the motion that's before us passes by council, then what would be the next steps as far as the city is concerned and the legal obligations? Well, uh, there are several steps and certainly uh, Mr. Pritchard can speak to some of them because they involve uh, having to amend. If council simply makes the decision and says we're no longer going to add fluoride, um, then there are some procedures that have to happen with uh, the operating license from Alberta Environment. I'm not sure if that's the kind of legal issue you're talking about or whether you're referring to something else. No, that would be the question. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a, it, it, it is to some res, in, in some respects a public health issue, but oddly, council isn't really the public health authority. Uh, it, it really comes to council because we're the operator of the water system. Mm -hmm. And this debate has been going on for decades and decades as to whether overall there's a benefit of carrying this to the public through the water system. And uh, water system clearly has limitations in the sense that uh, in today's technology, we can really only deliver one kind of water. It's not as if we've got six pipes coming into every household saying, well, you can, you can pick these options. And so it, it, it's really a public interest issue for council to say, having listened to the science or uh, in some respects, maybe the quasi science of, 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 what's, of what's being said, uh, what, what's in the public interest? And uh, in terms of whether it should be in or out, and I want to be careful about that because we're not defluorinating the water. We're simply talking about no longer adding additional fluoride to the water, which is, a, which is not the same thing. And so I think it's just a matter of council making a decision based on, on their understanding of the, the evidence and the science and, uh, and uh, you know, what's the benefit here versus what's the perception of a detriment there. And overall, in the balance of things, uh, what's, what's overall in the, in the best public interest? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, committee, I think um, I'll put forward the motion that was brought to council. And uh, any number of things could happen at council. We could make a decision to... Uh, refer this motion to a body of, of experts for their opinion, um, or we could pass it, or it could fail and we could continue with the status quo, or we could make a decision to go with a plebiscite. It's been, I think it's been a very healthy discussion, and I don't think I'm surprised by any of it. Um, we have people who are passionate on both sides of the discussion, and care deeply about um, their point of view. And the health professionals that spoke um, feel very passionately that they are providing um, a public health benefit. Well, as there are many, many people, um, many Calgarians who are very concerned about their water supply and have a fear, whether it's based in, uh, in reality or not, um, the cons it, it concerns me deeply that we have so many people who are worried about the safety of their water supply. That in itself, I think, is something we cannot ignore, especially when there's possibility of alternatives. And I don't think we've looked at them as enough as a society. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to put this motion forward and then we'll see what committee does. And I want to urge committee to vote for the second portion of the motion because um, I do think we have a responsibility as a municipality, although some may argue that's not the case, to look after the health of our citizens. Um, the most compelling argument to me, of course, is the issue of children in 
poverty situations. But I believe that um, some of the responses toward poverty and the arguments for fluoride are very simplistic, that we think we're done, and we're not. Of course we're not. Um, so I think perhaps this would be a way to uh, address that moral concern. So I would urge members of committee to support that. Thank you. Alderman McLeod. Light. It's getting late, I think. Mm -hmm. That's my new excuse anyway. <laughs> um, I would like to make a motion to refer this to the um, expert panel that's suggested in the letter from the University of uh, Calgary Faculty of Medicine. And I'd like to do this for a couple of reasons. Um, they've got a new research center that they've talked about in this letter and um, they want to critically review the most up-to-date scientific research, scientific literature, and provide clear evidence-based answers to questions about risks and benefits. And it's that clear evidence-based um, answers that I'm looking for. We've had a lot of information presented to us. Um, and, and a lot of research referred to, but how do we know what is substantive research that's been presented to us and what is less rigorous on either side of the argument because we're not public health experts. Uh, and I worry about that because I, I, I don't know how to read, I have not read the research myself and I'm relying on others to inform me about the outcomes but um, at the same time I think that there doesn't seem to be any agreement and so in my opinion, I think we need to look at referring it to the experts. <coughs> I am concerned about the um, composition of this panel. Um, I think it, we, we need uh, public health experts on it, medical and dental. Perhaps um, some people with, uh, um, I think Alderman Farrell has talked about the European experience. Perhaps there's some different perspectives, different ways of seeing the world. And um, perhaps some of the things that Dr. Beck has referred to need to be examined so that we can get the evidence when there's claims made about this or claims made about that, that we actually can see who's saying this and what are they basing it on, how substantive is it, how big is the risk. And that, that's really the question that we're being asked um, to make. So. I also um, add that, that the last panel, the last time we referred this to a panel, um, that panel made recommendations for change and I don't think that it's um, a foregone conclusion that there wouldn't be recommendations for change. I think if we select the panel carefully, that we get credible people, that we will in fact be able to um, create a create a group of people or bring together a group of people that uh, can independently look at all the research out there and help give us some information to make an informed decision. Alderman uh, McLeod, <clears throat> I have a problem with your motion. The city clerk just informed me that we can't refer it to a panel because we don't have a panel to refer it to. So what we would probably have to do is refer to the mayor's letter and ask the mayor to get a hold of uh, the proponents to form the committee rather than the way you said it. It, it, it. Because we can't refer to a panel that doesn't exist. So it would be in reference to the mayor's letter and let the mayor that, do that and report back to council rather than committee. I think that's all good. Um, I would like the committee or the council to have input on the panel members. So it would go straight to council? Well. Is that? It's it's got to go to council anyway for the referral support. So okay. Okay. Um, Alderman Stevenson. Well, <clears throat> I'm ready to debate the main motion, but I'll I'll speak to. Is this a referral motion we're dealing with then? Um, yeah, it is, but it, not the way it was originally. Set. Okay. Well, I won't support support the referral motion. I think that that uh, decision has to be done, or should be done by council. So I think we should be leaving that um, until we get to council. We, 
We'll send this to council, and at that point, they want to refer it. They can, but I won't support it at this point. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none on the referral to council to appoint a panel, are, are you agreed? Then I'm agreed. Opposed? Call the roll. It'll be quick. <laughs> On the referral, um, Alderman DeMong? No. Alderman Farrell? No. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? No. Uh, Chair Jones? Yes. And that's lost. That's lost. On the main motion, Alderman Stevenson. Well, thank you. Um, I will, of course, not support the uh, movement to a committee when it goes to council either. Uh, the reason is because I believe we have uh, all the the research that we need and have had for some time. Uh, I got to say that I've been um, opposed to uh, uh, to fluoride for 30 years, but I keep listening, thinking someone's going to come up with something that's going to cause me to reconsider my position on it. And I've listened all day today and heard nothing uh, that would change my mind on it to this point. I will listen to the debate uh, here and in council, and then I'll make my final decision on how I vote. But uh, I will not support a plebiscite either, because uh, I think that uh, the plebiscite is not the way to go when you're dealing with something like this. Now, I'm getting a lot of uh, emails, and I'm sure all of you are, letters and and so on, and they're coming in uh, four to one uh, against fluoridation. In other words, four to one in favor of us removing it. Um, in the last um, number of years that I have uh, opposed fluoridation, I have been uh, expo uh, had a lot of ridicule, and of course I can't imagine the amount of ridicule that some of the, um, the people that have been fighting this uh, uh, that are in positions of medical doctors or dentists uh, and the amount of peer pressure they're getting. But one of the things that really surprises, well, it doesn't surprise me, but it surprises me that isn't recognized more is the number of people that have changed their position, the number of people that were in favor of it, were advocates of it that are now against it. And I have not, to this point, come across anyone that's gone the other way. It seems when people do enough uh, study on it, they realize that it's the wrong thing to do. And the reason why I wouldn't support a plebiscite is because I don't think, even if it's 53%, and that's, I think, what the last vote was, 53% of 30% who actually come out to vote make a decision on medicating 100%. And I, I strongly disagree with that. Even if it was 50, 60% of the total population, I don't agree that they have the right to medicate the rest. Even in the case, as uh, Alderman Farrell pointed out, in the case of our local improvement bylaws, um, we have 66% is the requirement for paving an alley. And that's 66% of the people who own property, not the ones that have the interest to come out and vote. It's 66% of everybody who owns who has to say yes to that, sign their name, or else we can't go ahead and do it. And here we go and say we can do something as significant as this with such a small percentage of the people making the decision for the rest of us. Now, I, I know that there's uh, a lot of people dismiss claims of harm, and we've heard here today that um, uh, professionals, people who I respect a great deal, have said that there's no evidence of harm. But how can we dismiss all of the claims uh, about harm when we have seen positions change. Like, for instance, the change now in the last number of years is that uh, they say that infants cannot be uh, given um, fluoride in their water. Uh, children, they're now saying, younger children, even, even if it's not an infant, they shouldn't be having it because there's a p possibility of harm. We've seen them reduce the levels of the um, amount of uh, fluoride in the water. The reason they're doing those is because of evidence of harm or potential harm. 
So, and even the, the doctors that we hear, they don't dispute that the, the dosage can't be controlled. Nobody, nobody dis disputes that. There's food, there's uh, fluoride in food and beverages and toothpaste and in our water. And I, you know, I heard it said that, um, <clears throat> that there's a danger, less uh, danger of people not being able to control it if we, if we leave it in there. I don't agree with that. It just means that more people have to be careful not to get too much uh, when we're putting that much in the water. So there is a concern. And if we're going to err, it needs to be on the side of caution. Uh, nobody has come up with anything of proof that there's a benefit to Calgarians. I've not seen this, and we keep asking for it, but it's not there. And uh, there's no question in my mind that some Calgarians are being harmed by it. Uh, we have no right... Um, and I ask members of council to support this because we have no right to force it on all Calgarians as a body of legislators like we are. So I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Alderman McLeod. Thank you. I, um, I'm, I guess I'm disappointed it's not going to a committee because I, I I do want more information and perhaps I'll never have enough information to be feel, feel totally comfortable on this situation. I do have some sympathy for the argument of personal choice, but on balance, the benefits, the public health benefits, appear to be well documented. Um, taking fluoride out of the water still doesn't uh, control the dosage. Um, as Alderman Stevenson noted, that uh, we still get it in many other ways, and so you s it's just the difference between what's naturally occurring in the water and what we're adding that, that is being removed. Um, <laughs> as for the plebiscite, <laughs> I, I couldn't help but think that most of us sitting here were elected here with much smaller percentages than those that supported fluoride. <laughs> so it just struck me as amusing. Um, I don't subscribe to the notion that the Alberta Health Services or the um, researchers are uninformed. Um, they drink the same water as they do. I don't think they're looking to harm anybody. They have uh, dedicated their professional lives to providing public health, and I, I am going to put my trust in that, and I will not support this motion to, re to remove the fluoride from the water. Alderman DeMont. There has been no decision that this will not go to a medical group. This is simply saying that it's up to council to choose and decide whether it goes to a medical group or not. I, I am very much looking forward to a, as one of our councillors would say, a very toothsome discussion on this topic. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, and, and on that note, I, I will support this being moved forward to Council to further debate. Alderman Farrell to close. It's closed. On the vote. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, motion to adjourn, are you agreed? Opposed? Thank you for coming.